Chapter 801 Rivers Verdict SMG Security Surveillance Footage Over Last Three Months Amelia provided Ridra with a clip of SMG's behavior over the last three months, and the contents of this clip were absolutely shocking. Ridra was made aware that SMG was abusing drugs however he was never told that the man was morally weak and such a pervert, as it came as a huge shock to Ridra when he saw his movements in the clip. On May 23rd, when the Hell War was not yet started, and the elites were overswamped with work one could see a drug-abused SMG gaining re-entry into the upside, as he seemed to not have perfect physical balance. Falling on his back several times, as he tried to climb steps that were not there at all in open streets, it was clear that his condition was not the best. However, when a resident of upside, a young woman came to help SMG to his feet, he grabbed both the woman's breasts and molested her in the middle of the street. The woman shrieked and slapped SMG as she ran away, and while this incident was never reported by the women and SMG never chased her, there could be seen a lewd smile on the man's face when he looked at his own hands afterwards. If one could let this issue slide because it was when he was heavily intoxicated, they would be wrong as the incidences only grew bolder after this day. On June 16th, the very first day of the war in hell, when everyone was extremely busy, SMG visited Neatwood's home after Yua had requested to him in hell that she was not feeling at the best of her health. At the time even Yua did not know that she was pregnant and SMG's visit seemed to be out of concern. However, when after checking on Yua on his way out of the house, he sneakily stole and walked out with a bunch of Yua's underwears and handed absolutely disgusted Ridra. Later clips of that night showed how SMG sniffed those inner garments time and time again, and Ridra felt like throwing up watching those clips. His anger had already crossed the threshold of his tolerance, however apparently this was only the start. It was September currently, and over the course of June, July and August SMG had committed one lewd crime after another, as although he was respectful enough not to break any major laws in the upside, he was absolutely indulgent and lawless in the real world, where he not only indulged in whoremongering, but also rape of unwilling women. The limit came when a report confirmed that he had raped a 14-year-old teenage girl, and that girl had given in to his demands after understanding that he was an elite elder. This incident was the straw that broke Camel's back for Rudra, as after this moment his tier 5 aura exploded, and Amelia started to sweat profusely in his presence. Rudra said in a lethal tone, Amelia! Amelia had never felt threatened by any male in her life, but at this moment from the very fabric of her every cell, she was scared for her life to face Rudra. Mustering courage all she could produce was a weak, hmm. Amelia! Tell that man sitting outside that he is stripped of his position, as an elder of the guild, and that he has precisely two minutes to run for his life, as if by chance I see him again. He dies. Dot. Rudra reigned in his pressure, and Amelia gasped for air. She looked extremely pale, and was scared for her life. However, she managed to nod her herd twice, to signal that she understood. Actually, the clips that she had showed Rudra were not even the worst, as the worst two clips were ones created on September 1st against her, and on August 14th against Naomi. On August 14th, SNG broke into the elite medical hospital in the upside, and asked for all surveillance records for the past one year. It was supposed to be for security purposes, as an elder of elite, who was responsible for managing the strike force. It was a part of his job which was why the records were granted to him as well. However, when Amelia seized the assets in his room and duplicated them and inspected it, she found that out of those surveillance clips, only one clip had been isolated and saved, which was a clip of Naomi going to a female doctor for her gynecology checkup. SMG had actually dared to dig up a video where Naomi's privates were exposed, and he had saved it like an absolute pervert. Initially, Amelia did plan to show this clip to Ridra. However, utterly afraid of his wrath, she did not do it now. Naomi was not the only victim either as after Amelia had confronted SMG. Two days later he visited her home in the upside and tried a lot of techniques to coerce Amelia into not reporting him to Rudra. He knew everything about Amelia from her favorite perfume brand to her logistic purchases as he even whispered in her ears about the vibrator she had bought for herself a few months ago and said that if she married him by would always keep her satisfied without the need of machines. He wanted to marry Amelia and he was a stalker who knew everything about her. It was a psychologically terrifying experience for the secretary of the elites and the reason why she looked sleep-deprived in front of Ridra. SMG had shook her up from the very core of her being. She knew for sure that if it was anyone else but her, a normal member or someone with a lesser spine, she would have been forced to marry SMG one way or the other. However, not Amelia. The reason why Amelia was so cold was not because she was not interested in men, but because of her childhood trauma. At age five, her uncle repeatedly raped her until her father murdered him when he caught him in the act. Jailed for manslaughter his father died in prison on year 6 of his sentence. Never seeing his daughter since. In her high school she did have a boyfriend but when they tried to do the deed her trauma would not let her. 
which was when the boy lost his patience and dumped her after humiliating her in front of the school. It was after that day that she became immune to the flattery of boys and not interested in dating as a whole, as she was not confident of her own willingness to enter the physical aspect and not dumb enough to trust a guy with the emotional one. However, with her past long buried, all the elite guild members now saw was an ice queen. And the ice queen she was when she finally walked out of Ruder's office looked at SMG and told him, run. As the other party needed no more words to understand the situation and immediately ran for his life. A myriad of emotions flooded his heart at the moment however he had no time to put forward his side of the case to the guild master any longer. It seemed like Amelia had made sure that such a scenario never occurred. Leaving the upside in disgrace. SMG felt a pinch in his heart as he could not believe that, after going through so much with the guild, he would one day be cast out like this. Although a part of him did know that it was his own fault and wanted his brain to make a resolve that such incidences never repeated itself and that he would take this exile as a chance to better himself. However, at the same time, the other part of himself felt free and unchained as if he could finally start being himself in the world which followed no rules but the law of the jungle. In a world where strength ruled supreme, he was confident of making the most of his talents as except Rudra, there was not a single warrior in Country J that he was scared of. A shocking statement was published by the elite's guild the next day, which condemned one of its elders and demonstrated the cut-off ties with the harshest of words as the entire guild felt the effects of losing one of its pillars. The elites that Rudra had created were a pure organization where such incidents were not what people expected to happen. However, Rudra knew that SMG was a cancer that needed to be cut off early even if the guild suffered a bit in the initial stages, as should the man have been allowed to stay and given a chance to change. Rudra had no doubt in his mind that he would have hollowed the guild from the inside out. A man with no control over his actions and no moral compass was not fit to wear the elite name. Chapter 802 Traitor The Cuber Corporation Alarms Blaring it's an emergency. Someone just ascended to tier 5 through divine intervention, and now his pod is melting from the power. A Cuber official shouted against the blaring alarms. Damn it. Why was a tier 4 player using a normal pod in the first place? Whose oversight is this? Another official was angry, and wanted to point fingers at whoever was responsible for this situation however found none. How did someone ascend to tier 5 out of nowhere? As long as I remember except Shakuni nobody else was even close to the threshold. The Cuber chief asked as he waited for further reports. The Cuber headquarters was thrown into chaos as the life of a potential pillar of humanity was currently under threat. Someone was using a normal VR pod and was ascending to tier 5. If the neural circuits broke down then the damage to his physical body would be irreversible and Gaia was alerting that the circuits were into meltdown. Gaia! Status report? Start from the start. Which player is undergoing the tier 5 ascension and what has caused this situation? The Cuber chief asked as Gaia projected a report. Gaia said, Reporting to the chief, The player undergoing tier 5 ascension is called Sir Molyneux Gestatio, or his gaming name SMG. He is an ex-true elite elder who was ousted from the guild only two days ago due to his drug addiction and inhumane behavior. He has supposedly struck a deal with the devil to sell the elite's war plans in exchange for true power, and as a result, he has been blessed by Lucifer's divine power, which is helping him bridge the level gap and forcefully ascend without comprehending the laws. Dot. The Cuber chief's face darkened at this information. The entire Cuber corp was silently rooting for Rudra to win this war, and put an end to Lucifer. However now apparently someone from their own guild had colluded with the devil in exchange for power, and this was bad news for the elites. The chief said, Show me the whole report. Gaia obliged and started playing a clip of SMG from two days ago. SMG SPOV. SMG walked out of the upside to feel a myriad of emotions. However, the strongest one of them was Freedom. His first few hours out, and he already murdered 51 Tier 3 individuals and 4 Tier 4 powerhouses in the outside world to establish his power as the top dog. Having to abandon his VR pod back at the upside, he was without means to enter Omega, for which he had to order a new VR pod from the Cuber Corp website. Not understanding the importance of the Tier 4 pod that Cuber Corp had custom built for him when he ascended a few months ago. He logged into Omega with a normal pod and started to play the game normally. He had logged into the game still inside the army of death camp within hell, and had to sneakily get out before someone caught wind of the fact that he was there. As he expected, he had been ousted from the elite's guild and his robes no longer had the gray wolf insignia or the guild colors, as they changed to a bland gray from the deep black they used to be. SMG with his tier 4 powers and assassin abilities easily sneaked out of the elite camp, and headed at full speed towards the capital of hell to have an audience with Lucifer. Before he was ousted, he was still privy to the elite guild's top channels and knew about the plan Ridra was formulating to cross the River Thames. 
He was initially hesitant to betray the guild however he understood that currently the only man who could oppose him was Rudra, and with the information, he had he could potentially trade it to the devil for strength to take on Rudra. He had made a bold decision to take over the upside, and the elite's guild from Rudra through sheer power alone, as he wanted to come back, and lay claim to everything he wanted unobstructed. Yua, Naomi, Amelia, Skyla, he wanted them all, and he was in a headspace, where he did not mind killing their spouses for them. He thought nothing much of Johnny or Karna or anyone else as although they were all great gamers, he felt that his real-life assassination experience made him the apex predator over them. The only one who scared him was Rudra. The leader of the elites was just too strong, and the gap between himself and Rudra too wide to be bridged the conventional ways. There was a golden chance that he had right now, which would see him sell critical guild information to the enemy in return for exponential rewards, and it was an opportunity he was never going to have again after being ousted since the guild had so coldly turned their backs on him. He too did not think much about double-crossing them, as he waltzed into the capital city, and surrendered himself to the palace guards saying, that he needed an audience with the devil. Knocked out, and imprisoned his fate remained uncertain for the moment. However the devil, who was informed that there was a human who claimed to have critical battle plans of the army of death was there to parley. The devil was interested, granting him audience. The devil arranged a meeting with the defector, forward slash forward slash forward slash thank you for helping me end the week with top 15 in GT ranks. I am most grateful. There will be a bonus chapter today for the same. If you have not already joined my Patreon, please consider joining it today as I will be uploading many exclusive content such as character images, storyline polls, and host reader interactive sessions there. There is also a surprise for first 25 joining people and those slots are filling fast. Also there will be bonus chapters when we hit members goals. So it's a win-win-win. HTTPS colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash Raj Shah 7152. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 803A Deal with the Devil Gone Wrong. Lucifer stared at the chained SMG from his majestic throne as he spoke. So human, what do you offer me? SMG felt Lucifer's gaze land on him, and he tried to meet it. However, when he raised his eyes up to Lucifer's neck, he felt himself to be sweating immensely, and his body did not have the strength nor the courage to look the devil in the eye as he lowered his gaze and spoke. I offer you destruction of your greatest nemesis. SMG spoke lightly. Lucifer laughed. It was an evil and sinister laugh that sent shivers down SMG's spine as he began second-guessing this whole venture. Lucifer said, Trust me, mortal. You are not strong enough to even lay a gaze on Archangel Michael. Dot. Co. MSMG choked on his words. He had forgotten that Lucifer was a god who had godly enemies, and foolishly assumed that he would even consider Rudra to be a threat. He was a god. A tier 6 being overlooking entire realms. The devil himself. Did he even need the help of a puny mortal like him? He began to doubt it. After struggling a lot SMG said, I can reveal the plans of the army of death in the near future. Giving your forces the edge to beat their plans. Lucifer grinned as he said, Very well. Am hearing. SMG felt a little bit of hope in his heart as he said, I have something to ask for in return for the plans. Lucifer stroked his chin and then said, No, you don't. You will obey. Or you will be obliterated to nothing after a lifetime of torture within my dungeons. I actually find it ridiculous that a human dares to waltz into my capital and tries to strike a deal with me on equal terms. It seems the world has forgotten the true might of the devil. Dot. SMG could not believe his ears. He knew for a fact that Dronacharya had struck a deal with the devil to take down Rudra and the devil had indulged him which was the source of his confidence to come parley in the first place. However, things did not go as he wanted them to go. What SMG did not know was that Dronacharya approached Lucifer the right way, performing a sacrificial ritual and offering the blood of a lot of innocents for the very chance to talk to the devil where he bound him by a system oath which would see him be rewarded only when he completed his service to the devil first. It was very different to what SMG tried to do. However, in his arrogance and haste to make the most of his opportunity, Trying to soar to the heavens in one leap, he had made a grave miscalculation. SMG trembled, as he could not muster words out of his mouth. Lucifer walked up from his throne, and walked down the steps towards SMG. As he placed one of his legs over SMG's bowed head, and flattened it to the floor such that SMG's skull cracked, but he did not kill him then and there. Maintaining a painful amount of pressure, that would keep him at the edge of his consciousness. Lucifer said, I will not repeat myself. Speak. SMG felt every cell in his body urging to comply as he spit out the entire plan the army of death had to the devil word for word, and even Lucifer was stunned silent by Rudra's unconventional thinking and genius. 
The other tier 5 demons present in the room too were speechless, as the plan was recited as even the first demon commander praised Rudra, as a genius by the end of it. This was important information indeed, and as a reward Lucifer lifted his feet from over SMG's head, as he said, You came here from your own free will, but you will leave here as a slave of mine. Starting today your flesh, your bones, and your very soul belongs to me the devil, and in exchange for the power you desired I shall take it. Flicking his fingers Lucifer poured his divinity into SMG's body as the assassin writhed and screamed in pain. His level was forcefully raised and his free will simultaneously eroded as he was turned into a puppet of Lucifer's while by the time his power reached the tier 5 realm. His skin burnt and his appearance turned from a middle-aged man to a semi-fiend as with his charred black skin. Blood-red eyes and half-broken teeth, he looked nothing like the elder of the elites he was a few days ago. The alert at the Cuber Corporation subsequently subsided as SMG was killed alongside a pot explosion in real life. His only remnant being an Omega, as the slave of the devil Lucifer. With a new puppet slave and a read on the enemy's upcoming plans, the demon started to prepare a counter. And with the elites being none the wiser, it was decided that the first commander himself was going to lead the raid to kill Rudra for once and for all on the shores of River Thames. What was supposed to be an easy fight was going to turn into a bloodbath for the army of death as the first commander planned to turn River Thames red with human blood when the attack finally started. Meanwhile at Cuber Corp, Gaia was currently being inspected by the Queen as it reported an anomaly to the higher power. Gods weren't supposed to exercise their will into reality in Omega. The game was designed to incorporate their personalities as close to the original as possible however they were supposed to still work within the constructs of the game and function as a sort of NPC in the large picture. However Lucifer's actions today violated those guidelines and Gaia was forced to report. Lucifer seemed to have been agitated to the extreme and the devil's in-game character was no longer working along the lines of the game's constructs, breaking free of the laws and pressing his will against the universal AI. After examination, the queen tightened the game's security code and added an extra layer of protection to the game's neural link to players to avoid the incident from repeating. However, for this particular instance, the anomaly was allowed to pass. Chapter 804 March into Jaws of Death The Day of the March The First 4th and 5th legions were mobilized together from their respective positions sharp at the crack of dawn at 5 a.m. Nearly 60% of the army of death mobilized for Rudra's plan. Brimming with confidence as they expected to be able to slay a lot of demons and gain a lot of glory. Many humans had their recordings on. As the feed was being broadcasted on the forums with millions watching worldwide. The fastest to move were the tier 4 generals. All of whom could cross the raging river Thames unimpeded as while most of them could cross the 100 meters wide river in one single leap. Those who could not were also strong enough to swim to the other shore without the raging water sweeping them away. Nearly 60 tier 4 generals alongside Rudra himself crossed the river quickly, and up till this moment, their intrusion was not detected. As they waited for the perfect moment for the patrol to pass by for them to take them out. The rest of the forces were at standby 2 kilometers away from the river, waiting for the march orders. It took 4 minutes for the first patrol unit to come near the generals, and it consisted of 25 tier 3 soldiers. Unfortunately for them, they were killed from multiple angles at once before their eyes could even register the attacks coming. The countdown was on now, and the generals needed to rush into positions, as with the patrol unit killed an alarm will be raised in approximately 15-20 minutes, when the patrol unit does not report back at the next check post. Co. And the generals naturally sprung into action, quickly hammering sonic noise machines, and smell altering potions into the ground alongside some ground mines. Rudra on the other hand used gravity manipulation to alter the gravity on the riverbed making a portion of the river arch leaving dry ground below for the soldiers to cross. Rudra had tried to completely stop the flow of river once using gravity manipulation by making a sort of gravity wall. But he quickly realized that within 40 seconds the pressure on the wall by the river was too much for him to bear as his technique broke. Making the arch was much easier on him as he was not opposing the flow of water but only diverting it. The window of opportunity was hence created and the soldiers quickly got to work. They had 15-20 minutes to cross the river onto the other shore before the patrol arrived and the fight started. For 15 minutes, soldiers ran like crazy as nearly 30 million troops crossed the river in that brief span of time however unfortunately for the elites, the enemy responded very quickly as by minute 16 their response team was on the location and the alarms were raised. The moment the alarms were raised the soldiers on the other side of the shore no longer entered the river waters and those already in it quickly rushed to the other side, as Rudra lowered the river back into place, and drank a max mana potion, and a max stamina potion to replenish energy. More and more demons arrived to engage with the attackers, and an intense fight began at the open riverbed. 
When about 10-15 million demon reinforcements reached the spot Rudra finally gave the green signal to start the explosions, as the army put on the noise cancellation devices and let the explosions begin. Boom! 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 Chying! The potion bottles and the sonic effect creating devices burst into action as deafening noise covered the battlefield. Rudra instantly activated his gravity field over the area so that the vibrations in the air would be confined and could not disperse any more making the sonic noise confined to the region with an extended lifetime of at least six more minutes. While most of the soldiers engaged in active battle, about a million started to dig along the pre-decided line as to maximize the digging speed Rudra had assigned a group of ten men an area of about one meter to dig while a group of another ten men another one meter, all connecting in a chain to form the tunnel. Both the digging work and the fight seemed to go as planned. As the digging workers dug as if their lives depended on it, while the sonic and smell attacks made the demons disoriented and dazed and completely incapable of engaging in proper combat. It was an easy slaughter for the elite army so much so that Rudra started to get a gut feeling that something was wrong about the situation. Somehow the response troops were 90% composed of only tier 2 troops and hardly a few tier 3 troops between them. It was too easy of an slaughter to be called a proper fight and it just did not feel right. Rudra used his heaven's eye to take a look around trying to understand what was going on, but he was a step too late this time. The trap was already set, and the elites had already taken the bait, and were now sitting ducks for the demon counterattack. Looking through his heaven's eyes, he could see close to 1,000 ships sailing down the river with archers on the ready to shoot from both sides, and cannons prodding out in the middle. Close to 2 million tier 3 troops alongside at least 50 tier 4 commanders marching out from the flood village. And one hideous looking creature, and one extremely powerful tier 5 commander heading towards them, from the fort of Mirzapur in a flying chariot. It was an ambush. Forward slash forward slash forward slash a very special shout out to Savanthi for the 15. 000 coin gash upon. I am beyond humble to receive this gift and feel extremely motivated as a result. Let me try give you more bonuses rather than a single one for a super gift. The next montage of bonuses will be for the same reason. Thank you for your patronage forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 805 Things Going South. Rudra assessed the threat and realized that the most pressing issue right now was the damn chariot heading their way with two very powerful tier 5 creatures on board. What baffled him, though, was the enemy's response to their attack. Having ships at the ready, an unreasonably strong unit stationed at a small village, and the number one commander of the enemy forces at the ready for such a trivial march, it did not seem right at all. Although it could have been pre-planned preventive measure. However, Rudra had surveyed the area just six hours before the attack and these forces were not present at these locations then. Which meant that they were mobilized under the cover of the night, just the dawn, before the attack was launched. Which meant that they had accurate information about the timing of the attack, and the exact spot where the attack was going to happen to mount such an impressive defense. The number one demon commander was called Darius. He was rumored to be at the peak of tier 5, and an unstoppable force of nature second only to Lucifer himself amongst the demon army. Darius looked at Rudra's force field locking in the sonic boom and said, how cute! Unsheathing his sword, he unleashed an overhead slash and destroyed the field of gravity in half. Rudra's eyes widened in shock as he had not expected a physical attack to be able to alter an intangible law such as gravity, but it did. The sword attack unleashed by Darius was laced with the laws of space and was able to disrupt even a gravity field as a result. Hence, the sonic noise contained within the field started to leak and the result was that within 10 seconds the deafening noise ended and the demon soldiers were able to hear normally again. The eyes of the tier 2 soldiers grew sharper, and although they were still cannon fodder to Rudra's army, they lasted a bit longer now, and managed to land a few scratches here and there before they died, as opposed to the sloppy fighting style they had before. Rudra assessed the situation quickly and understood in a fraction of a second that they needed to retreat now, before it was too late as if the enemies were allowed to get their way, then it would result in a complete route for the elite army. The problem now, was that he wanted to shout the retreat orders right at this moment however more than 80% of his troops still did not realize that the force field outside was broken and that they did not need the noise cancellation earphones anymore. It was like Rudra's own scheme turned into a death trap for his forces, as while he kept shouting at the top of his lungs, All men retreat! 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 Only a few of them listened, and the rest kept pressing on. Rudra looked to his left, and saw that the ships had almost reached the area where the troops were stationed, and he realized that if those 1,000 ships were allowed to have their way, then it would be a blow of 3-7 million troops easy for the army of death, and they needed to be stopped anyhow. Looking at Karna, Rudra said, You need to stop those ships anyhow! Karna, please! Karna saw the panic in Rudra's eyes, which was a first for him. Usually Rudra was always in control of any situation, 
and even with the odds stacked against him, he was always able to find a way out. However, this time around he looked worried, as if he did not have an answer to all these problems. Don't worry, Guildmaster. Even over my dead body, not a single ship shall pass. Karna reassured Rudra, and without a second question, he jumped into the raging river Thames, as he summoned his pet kraken, and towered over the water body, with a massive giant under his feet. Swords drawn ready to fight the flood of ships coming his way. Rudra looked at Neetwit and said, Spread the message. Take them damn earphones off and start to fall back. Fall back. Now. Now. Rudra did not realize it but he had started to stay stuffed double times because of the panic he was having. While the others were blind to his reason of panic as they did not have his vision. He himself could see the bigger picture. As it stood, Rudra was facing the root of 60 million troops under his wing. A blow so devastating that it would cripple the entire army of death and cost the lives of 100 tier 4 generals. The only hope was retreat, and the only way to retreat was for Rudra to gather the troops before the enemy pressed in and open up the river to run back. It was a taxing job even without Rudra having to focus on anything else. However at this moment two tier 5 demons landed in front of him and Rudra immediately realized that the two of them had no intention to afford him any of the time that he wanted. Darius smiled as he said, My my! Look at the face of the greatest mastermind. The brilliant strategist Shikuni of the elites? What happened? Where is that egoistic smirk and the legendary confidence I have heard so much about? Why is it so pale today? Is it because you know you are facing me? Or is it because of my friend here? The half-demon half-human abomination that you used to call Elder S.M.G. SMG glared at Rudra with his bloodshot eyes and let his half-torn tongue hang out as drool dripped from his face. He looked nothing like the man Rudra remembered him to be a few days ago, and had transformed into an utterly hideous creature. However, Rudra felt alarmed looking at the creature as while its appearance was hideous his eyes painted a more clear picture, which was that the man was higher leveled and more powerful than he was at the moment, which effectively meant that he was facing two tier 5 opponents who were stronger than him at the same time. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Savanthi. Please thank her in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 806 Retreat The reinforcements from the Flood Village poured entered the battlefield and bolstered the ranks of the Tier 2 troops being slaughtered, and the tide of the war started to change. It was only now that people were grabbing each other by the shoulder and informing each other to take the damn noise cancellation devices off as Neatwit screamed and scrambled to spread the order of retreat. The advanced troops panicked. They had not realized there was a retreating order in place. They had not anticipated it at all. Especially the elite members, who were never used to retreating from a fight were the most baffled as they had never been given an order to fall back except for a strategic retreat ever in their decade-long career in the guild. However orders were orders and the army of death slowly started to fall back towards the river. Unaware that their leader, who was supposed to open a path for them, was currently unable to do so because of two strong opponents outnumbering him two to one. They retreated slowly while facing the reinforcements, confident that when they reached the river banks they would be given a way out. Rudra had no way to have the time to take a survey as to what was going on around him. As the at the moment, he was being constantly bashed by two tier 5 warriors at an insane speed. Darius was a longsword wielder whereas SMG fought with 15 inch long daggers in both his hands, and the two of them together were fast enough to land one scratch for every 10 blows traded with Rudra. Rudra was wasting enormous amounts of stamina sustaining the high speed defense, as he had no other option, but to keep his guard up, until there was an opening because one slip up from him and Darius was going to chip away 15-30% of his HP in a single shot. Guildmaster lift the river. Dot. Rudra heard a shout in the background, and he cursed loudly in his mind. There was absolutely no way he was going to be able to light the river at this moment. He was helpless. The enemy troops pressed onto the elites, who now due to having to retreat had no more area to maneuver and hence started a bloody struggle where the troops had to chose between jumping into the raging river and saving their lives, but effectively taking themselves out of the battle or to stand their ground and fight. Many fled while many were killed, and only a few stayed back. It was a tactical disaster of epic proportions, and now the army of death was on the back foot. Meanwhile Karna. Karna stood on top of the Kraken. Although he had no idea as to why he was facing down a legion of ships alone. At this moment none of that mattered, as his guildmaster had given him the order to stand guard on this place. And he was going to do so even if it costed him his life. Karna said, this is it, buddy. Let's go. The Kraken let out a bone-chilling shriek as its tentacles punched right through the first wooden ship, punching a massive hole inside it and effectively setting it up to a drone. However, a volley of cannons were launched towards the Kraken at this moment. As the ships behind had taken aim at the giant monster 
and were open firing. Karna closed his eyes, as he used his mind's vision to accurately see the projectiles heading his way, as he unsheathed his sword, and in a blighting speed of sword motion, sliced nearly 300 cannonballs in half, before they could harm his pet. Karna would have smiled if nearly 100. 000 arrows would not have been showering on him at the moment, as while he could cut down 300 cannonballs, there was absolutely no way that he could block all the arrows from the sky. Swoosh! 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 Karna protected the eyes of the Kraken, but that was all he could protect beside himself, as a whole barrage of arrows landed on the skin of his friend. The Kraken had thick skin and hence most of them bounced right off however he still got nearly 30. 000 in damage from this barrage as blood could be seen trickling in small amounts, from a few spots. Letting out another roar the duo of the man, and the beast once again, went on to the offensive, as they engaged in a fight with the other ships once more. Meanwhile the digging crew. The digging crew were outside the active fight area, and did not need to wear the noise cancellation devices. Hence, they were the first ones to hear Rudra's panic retreat calls, and could look at the situation from a distance. The entire digging crew was made up of tier 1 and 2 soldiers from the 4th and 5th legion, as this was the safest work for them on the battlefield. The demons were too strong and it was not possible for them to contribute significantly in important battles, as they were only as good as cannon fodders. Which meant that works like these maximized their potential. Max being a tier 2 soldier was a part of this same digging crew, and observing the situation in front, he understood that something had horrifically gone wrong. In his mind his brother had the perfect image. He was the ultimate hero. Which was why Max never thought he would see Rudra make a tactical mistake ever. Which is why even though he and the crew were not engaged in direct combat themselves, they felt scared and wanted to abandon their posts and make a run for it. Every passing second, the overall situation kept worsening for the elites, and the worst was actually yet to come. An army of lava hounds. Thousands in number had taken it to the skies of the battlefield. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Savanthi. Please thank her in the comments for this one. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 807 from bad to worse. When the hellhounds took to the sky the army of death started to feel the real heat, as not only were those massive hounds near invisible, with their thick and hard skin which was impenetrable. But they dripped of over 2000 degrees Celsius hot lava, that instantly burnt a hole in the land that one was standing on much less one's armor. The demons riding these hounds were also sinister dropping javelins from the air, piercing their targets one at a time as they picked their killings in leisure. No arrows were able to threaten the life of the lava hounds much as the thick skin gave them immunity from any and all attacks under tier 3 strength. The worst part was that the lava riders picked off men engaged in active combat against a demon legion, creating tactical holes in the defenses of the army of death which lead to more and more troops dying because of the defensive formations breaking. More and more people were forced to jump down into the river to save their lives, and were at the mercy of the currents to take them where the waters rooked them, while the army on the other side of the river started to pull back and retreat back into the army of death's camp. With the retreat of the troops on the other side, it was clear that today's operation was a complete failure, and that no matter what Rudra did now, it was not enough for him to take down Savanthi's city with the troops he had at his disposal. On the forums, on the forums. Millions were posting about the current situation as they called it the fall of the invincible. Many thought this day would never come. Many waited more than a decade for this day to come and today was that day. The day when Shakuni of the elites lost a battle. His guild was forced to retreat in humiliation and his strategy was flipped on its belly. Never thought I would ever see the day when Shakuni would make a tactical error and lead his army to doom. Alas, the invincible titan has finally fallen. So Shakuni's strategies are not the best in the world anymore. Hmm. He was trying to play God, but finally he is just a mortal. Ha ha ha. Die elites die. Ha ha ha. Shakuni no longer has his edge anymore. He is old and his days at the top of the food chain are numbered. Soon, he will become a relic of the past. Today marks the beginning of the end for the elites. The man holding the sky for them is on his knees. Ha ha look at their vice guild master. Struggling intensely however sure to die. Karna's POV. Karna fought bravely with his Kraken, single-handedly holding off nearly 1,000 ships as the rest of the army on one side of the shore retreated, while buying time for those on the other side. One after another he bravely sunk a total of 72 ships before having to face ship captains, who were tier 4 and above, and could land peak tier 4 attacks on him and his pet. Bruised and battered. He tried his best to match those moves however the Kraken under him reached its limit. Karna wanted to retrieve it before it died however he was a fraction of a second late as one peak tier 4 blast later. His pet Kraken died a permanent death in combat. Karna felt emotions akin to losing a child, as he was inconsolable.
He had raised the Kraken for nearly eight years ever since he found it, as a pet in one of the guild's expeditions. He had gone through thick and thin with that beast, and its permanent death snapped a switch inside Karna, as he became the incarnation of death after it. Karna went on to slaughter 142 ship crews completely, as he killed 14 tier 4 captains, and only died, when was blasted by another ship's cannon shot. Sinking to the depths of the river as his HP reached zero. He apologized to the guild master during his fall, because he could only buy him this much time alone. However, he had done enough. As the destroyed mess of nearly 220 ships that he left behind completely blocked the path for the ships behind, and even though they wanted to march ahead, it was physically impossible anymore for them to do so. Karna died valiantly. But even in death, he was a soldier who had accomplished his mission. Meanwhile, Rudra, Rudra had lost 23% of his total HP, as he could only take off 9% of SMGS HP and 7% of Darius S HP in return. Bleeding from several minor cuts all over his body Rudra was on the back foot of an intense battle, as his stamina reserves had plummeted to under 30% levels. It meant a serious red flag for Rudra, and should he continue to fight at the same pace that he was fighting he would run out of stamina before he ran out of HP which meant that certain death stared in his way. While the normal soldiers could jump into the river and run. The same was not possible for Rudra. He was the commander of this legion, and he would be damned if he ran from the enemy while a single one of his soldiers remained. Not that he could run away either. His pursuers were faster than him, and outnumbered him, which made any ideas of turning his back to them a fast way to a permanent death. Having been killed by Omar once, Rudra had no more chances inside hell. His next death was going to be his last one. And there was a real chance that the day might be today. Forward slash forward slash forward slash congratulations on reaching the GT target. We crossed 2000 GT which is a landmark on its own for which I thank you all. As with hitting any target a bonus shall follow today itself. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 808 Rock Bottom. Darius looked at Rudra and had to admit that he was the most fundamentally stable and unpredictable opponent he had faced in his entire life. Rudra was able to go toe to toe with two stronger tier 5 warriors, with one of them being the strongest demon general in the entire kingdom of hell, and he was not going easy on him at all. If it were a fair one versus one fight. He was not sure if he had the confidence of killing the enemy, which was saying a lot as in the past 200 years the only opponent to have given him any real pressure was the devil Lucifer himself. He himself was at the peak of tier 5, and on the cusp of breaking through too, but the tier 6 promotion test was not something that he could handle, which was why he was stuck at the tier 5 realm since such a long time. To be called the strongest mortal was not an overstatement when describing Darius. Yet he still feared facing Rudra alone. He praised the foresight of Lucifer to corner this enemy alone with the two of them, instead of him going at it alone. As if in his arrogance, he had faced Shikumi alone then, the other party would not currently be panting and bleeding. And it might be him who would be panting and bleeding instead. Rudra was at 40% HP. His stamina reserves were at 10%, and he was at the cusp of losing this fight and his life. He was forced to use the future sight so early into the battle, as he gambled with his strongest moves to grasp a chance at survival. Rudra had hit the rock bottom in this fight. No matter how he tried to outmaneuver the enemies, the both of them were opponents of high caliber, and could counter any move that he produced perfectly to turn the tides of the battle back at him. Rudra had 21 normal sword moves in his arsenal, such as wind slash, overhead slash, twin blade cross slash, twin blade hurricane, death slash, etc etc. He had expended all 21 of them, and yet, SMG was only at 55% HP, while Darius was at a solid 75%. He had been thoroughly overwhelmed in today's battle, and it was now up to the big tier 5 moves to be able to decide the outcome of this battle. Continuation point 1. Rudra activated Future Sight, and started to compute the best path of attack. Currently SMG was charging at him with both his daggers exposed, as he tried to jab him while Darius was sidestepping to create and flank at the perfect angle that Rudra was supposed to dodge towards to stab him if he did. It was a pincer attack and one that Rudra needed to deal with first before mounting any counter of his own. Rudra let SMG get in point-blank range to his chest before he used the last charge of his solar beam and blasted SMG away with the force of the sun. Boom! SMG lost a hefty 17% chunk of his remaining HP pool as he was sent flying back for 200 meters as Darius looked dazed as to where that attack came from. Rudra instantly started preparing the Nirvana Flame, igniting the Aura of Fire in one hand and the Aura of Death in another as he raised their power to desired levels while dodging the attacks of a charging Darius. Rudra used Time Dilation to grant him the edge he needed to dodge Darius's attacks. However, something unexpected happened at this moment as his Time Dilation was instantly neutralized by an unknown attack 
and he was stabbed into the heart by Darius as sword. Altering the flow of time. I can do it too, Darius said as he looked into the shocked eyes of Rudra, and in that way Rudra died. In his second attempt, Rudra used the same blast once more to send away SMG and started gathering Nirvana flame essence however this time around he tried to dodge Darius without the use of the time dilation as although he was stabbed multiple times and he still died. His muscle memory remembered the direction and sequence of the attacks used as the three minutes of his future sight ended and he came back to reality. Back to reality. SMG charged at Rudra just as the future vision had shown him and Rudra unleashed a terrific solar beam from point blank range to blast SMG away. This time however it was a critical hit somehow and triggered 25% damage instead of the 17. Blasting SMG away by an extra 50 meters. Darius looked shocked and charged at Rudra instantly as Rudra dropped his swords and started to manifest the Nirvana flame. It was a gamble that he had no idea would pay off or not. As if the attack pattern of his enemy changed after he dodged the first move it would mean the end of his gaming career. However it was a gamble that Rudra was ready to make to win. Rudra dodged the first sword thrust to the left by spinning to the right and then instantly laid down flat on his back to dodge the follow-up horizontal slash by the narrowest of margins as he kicked Darius S sword from his flat position tossing it up into the air. This was as far as the future sight took him and from here on out everything depended on him. And although Darius looked irritated he sat down on Rudra's chest and started to pummel Rudra's face with his bare fists. The first punch rattled Rudra's skull as his nose broke and blood streamed all over it. Rudra's mind blanked out and his control over his fire almost broke down. But he managed to hang on by the smallest of margins. The second punch broke two of his teeth as he spat a mouthful of blood and wondered if this was how his gaming career was going to end. While the third punch blackened one of his eyes out as he started to fade in and out of consciousness forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Savanthi. Please thank her in the comments for this one. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 809 The Man, The Myth, The Legend. A few days ago. Johnny's POV. Johnny was having a usual day at the camp. He and Yum stalked cough. Educated women and demonesses together. Graded their assets and giggled at inside jokes while maintaining a straight face. It was at this moment that SMG respawned into the camp with his gray robes after his disgraceful ousting by the guild. SMG thought he was smarter than everyone. The instant that he logged back and he used his shadow pool to submerge into the darkness of his own shadow as he moved out undetected from the camp. Or so he thought as while he could fool everyone else. There was one man whose eyes he could not escape and that man was the greatest mercenary to have ever graced planet Earth. Johnny English himself. Johnny sighed as he looked him in the eyes and said, You know, me and you are a generation above these gaming kids and while the kids rule this gaming world as they rightfully should, there are not many 50-year-olds who stand at the pinnacle of the gaming world like me and you do. They are either casual players or lifestyle players with little to no hunger and ambition. Why don't they have ambition? I have no idea. However, I can still respect those people as they have struggled a lot in their youth and just want an easy life now. Not me and you though, because we have much more to give. However, what I cannot forgive is overambition from old men that leads to treason. The SMG kid thinks he is sneaky and can merge into a pool of darkness and slither out like a venomous snake. Well, he thinks wrong. That's not going to happen on my watch. Yum looked confused as Johnny activated his phaselessness to go below the surface too as he quietly followed SMG on his tail. From the army of death camp all the way to the capital city. Johnny trailed SMG. Returning only when he heard SMG declare that he had information for the devil at the gates of that insidious palace. Johnny knew his limits and while his formlessness gave him means to enter and exit even the most dangerous places at will. He did not dare enter Lucifer's palace, as he could only return with information on SMG's treason back to Rudra. When Rudra was informed about SMG's treason, he banged the table in anger, as finally the last bit of compassion he had for the man was killed completely. Up till this moment, Rudra felt a bit remorseful for kicking out such a valuable member of the guild, who had contributed so much over the years. However now his heart bled no more. The man had no morals, and the guild was a place that was 100 times better without that snake than with him. With his plan leaked, Rudra had to come up with a new one. However, no matter how he thought about it, the first plan he had came up with was a masterpiece. A perfection that was hard to modify and top up. However, if there was a better strategist in the world than Shakuni of the Elites, it was Shakuni of the Elites himself. Thinking heavily about it, Rudra came up with an absolutely insane plan that could only work if the enemy did not suspect a thing about Rudra already knowing that his initial plans were exposed 
and the only way for him to do so was to not inform even a single soul about his plan except for Johnny English and Fatty Kalash. If things went well, he would be able to take down Savanthi's city with a fraction of the manpower needed in his first plan. However, if things failed and his plan was exposed, he would lose much more than just 30-40 million troops. Present day, Johnny English. Johnny grinned as he admired the genius of Rudra's plan. Due to the blueprints of the city of Savanthi obtained by some kid, Rudra was able to spot the precise location of the Grand Sewage Tunnel, which dumped the city's sewage into the river. Co. am working with Fatty Kalash. Rudra had made a huge net to catch all the troops that were going to be washed down in his part of the battle to be collected by Johnny English on the sewage entrance to be led for a charge straight into the heart of Savanthi's city without a single guard ever noticing what was going on. If Darius or a single should doubt it that there was another play in Rudra's mind then, they would never have let Johnny calmly catch one soldier at a time and regroup four kilometers downstream from where Rudra was fighting. However, everything from the soldiers jumping into the water helplessly to their helpless struggles was actually true, and none of the soldiers were aware that it was all part of Rudra's grand plan. The only way this would have failed was if Karna was not able to block the path of the ships, and if sooner or later a ship would have sailed downstream and saw the massive netting in the middle of the river. However, even at the cost of his own life, the reliable vice guild master of the elites made sure that such an outcome never came to pass. When Yum led a clueless group of 40 million men who had retreated from Rudra's battlefront to the real crossing site, they were dumbfounded to realize that the real plan started right now. Crossing the river using the netting and the high tensile wires created by the Lifestyle Guild, Johnny slowly amassed his army needed to raid and conquer Savanthi's city. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the GT target. Hope you all enjoyed this one. Do comment below if you noticed the absence of Johnny English in the battle the past few chapters and anticipated such a turn of events in the comments down below forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 810 Turn of Events A day's Neathwit was borderline crying when Johnny caught him in the net and offered him a max HP potion for his red health. Neathwit said, As Sir Johnny? Johnny said, It's alright lad. All part of Shakuni Boy's plan. Heal up the real battle is yet to start. Dot. Neatwit was a little shocked to see the army around him, as an unprecedented determined look replaced his sullen expression. Johnny asked, How many are left on that side? Neatwit looked down and spoke with anger. I, I was the last one. It's only the guild master now. My HP was at 3%. I had to jump or I would have died. I saw Vice Guild Master die and Guild Master is being clobbered by their demon general, and what looks like a burnt SMG that traitor. I did not want to run Sir Johnny, but it was flea or death for me. I'm ashamed. Dot. Johnny raised an eyebrow. Karna and Rudra were two of the most talented boys he knew. If they were being beat up, then the enemy must have been very strong. Neatwood asked. Let's go back and help the guildmaster. He can't beat the both of them alone. The other tier four generals, who had to flee in disgrace, felt powered up too as they looked at Johnny and pleaded. Yes. Let's go help the guildmaster. We will show the demons what we have really got when we are serious. All eyes were on Johnny. The final decision rested on him. Johnny looked to the skies and said, You know kids, if a single one amongst you here think that even with ten of the best warriors in the guild to help you, you can take on the guild master in a fight. Raise your hands for me. Dot. Johnny looked around and scanned the crowd and just as he had expected not a single hand was raised. Johnny smiled and continued. Since when have we started to doubt the guild master? I know to you all it seemed like you had to flee in shame. However it was his foresight and his plan all along. Even when you don't understand his plans. In the end, everything follows his plan. Dot. Johnny paused for a solid 20 seconds before continuing. The sky shall fall before your guild master dies in a battle. Even if the entire demon army charges at him alone, he shall walk right by their corpses. So stop worrying about the guild master and start worrying about the task he assigned to you. If you really want to help him, then conquer the city he assigned you to conquer. Show me your spirits. Show me your shame in retreating. If you really want to prove a point, then come conquer Savanthi's city before sundown. Onward march. Dot. Johnny reassured the entire army as he fired them up to conquer Savanthi's city. As millions after millions of troops entered the sewers with a high morale and a steeled resolve to prove their worths. Entering last, Johnny looked towards Rudra's side of the battle one last time and murmured, Don't you die on this old man boy. As he walked into the sewer, the mining crew, Max's POV, 800, 000 miners ran away after it became apparent that the army of death walked into a hopeless ambush and the project was no longer viable for completion. However, Max and a few 200 000 miners remained at the spot debating as to what to do next. 
Guys, we need to fight. Only cowards run away from battlefields. And I am not a coward. Dot. Look at that Legion man, it's all tier 3 and 4. We are absolutely no match. It's suicidal. Dot. Then we die trying. We have dug these trenches. We can hold from here and shoot arrows at the enemy or something. All of us must have a pack of bow and arrow in the bag. Dot. Yes, of course, every gamer keeps one until they reach tier 3. I think it's a good idea. Dot. What? I don't have a bow and arrow. I'm a swordsman. That's retarded. Dot. I'm a knight. And I have now an arrows. M. Then you are not a knight. You are a joke. Hey! Take that back. Max watched all the chaos unfold as he started to think along the lines of what could be done. Or more like what would his brother do in this situation, and then it hit him. Max shouted. Hey guys! Shut up! I have a plan! Dot. Everyone calmed down as they looked at Max. Suddenly Max had the attention of thousands of troops. Max continued. The logistics gave us one bomb each. We were supposed to detonate them when we wanted to connect one panel to another in the end to complete the water channel. So here is what we can do. Let's make mines. Quickly dig small holes in the earth and put the bombs inside. Those of us who have the bows and arrows can fight from the trenches. Those of us that do not can lead the enemy into the minefield as we blow them up. When they are disoriented and weaken the swordsmen kill them and the archers cover. We will most likely still die. But we will damn well take a hell lot of demon by asterisk 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 with us. Dot. Max did not realize it. But he naturally copied Rudra's accent and way of speaking in this speech. It was not a conscious copy, but a subconscious one, and it totally worked. Everyone seemed to weigh Max's plan and were beyond impressed as they said. Yeah man, let's do it. Let's go. I know you. You brought the map to the city. The Loki kid. Nice one Loki kid. Max blushed a little from all the appreciation. However, now was not the time to blush as he said. All right. Let's go. 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 Dot. The digging crew sprang into action as they quickly started to create the minefield and fortifying their trenches. Forward slash forward slash forward slash hope you liked the chapter today. Please leave a comment down below if you did forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 811 not that easy to beat him down. Darius raised his fists and tightened his muscles preparing for one last punch of his full strength to knock Ridra out and then finish him for good. In the far background, SMG was slowly stirring to his feet after Ridra's solar beam blast as he dusted himself off and looked towards the two men fighting and eagerly waiting for Ridra's demise. In the air above, Lucifer's eye was watching the place through his heavenly vision. The devil had been waiting for this moment for a long time and currently he was on the verge of euphoria. Finish him, the devil said with passion, and although Darius could not hear the devil, he coincidentally brought his fist down at that exact moment, as the sound of the solid ground splitting could be heard. Dust rose all around Darius. However, the demon commander was not smiling at all. If anything, he looked extremely vigilant. When the dust settled and Lucifer was finally able to take a peek at the body beneath Darius, it was shockingly not that of Shikuni. But instead of a small girl with two ponytails, a human transformation of a nine-tailed beast. H, how dare you hit my furball! A primal voice sent shivers down Darius's spine. As he turned to look at a battered and bruised Rudra, whose usual gray eyes were bloodshot for some reason. When Darius had started to clobber Rudra. At the very first punch Rudra had summoned Furball to help. He had hoped that she could blast Darius with a flamethrower and buy him time to launch his attack. However for some reason Furball chose to use the replace skill. Taking two of Darius's direct hits on her face instead of Rudra. Rudra's insides boiled with uncontrollable rage as he saw his fur ball being so brutally hit that her tooth broke down as his rage pushed the intensity of the Nirvana flame from tier 5 strength to the pseudo realm of the gods. Between his two hands was energy far beyond what a tier 5 existence should be capable of producing and facing this attack. Darius feared for his very life. Drawing his sword, Darius charged towards Rudra. However, there was nothing he could do to avoid Rudra's blast anymore. The distance between him and Rudra was too large to be bridged through sprinting. Now you pay! Rudra said, completely disgusted, as he launched a devastating Nirvana flame towards Darius. A beam of power left Rudra's body, and the energy it let out was so strong that it created an earthquake on both sides of the river felt for kilometers at once. The attack beam was 30 meters wide, and dragged Darius through one side of the river for 3 kilometers before crossing the river and planting him on the other side for a full 15 kilometers. Initially when the attack had hit him, he was able to put up his swords in a cross-defensive pose however. Soon his swords melted, and the heat of the Nirvana flame started to gnaw away at his skin and his armor. 
By the time he was blasted across the river his HP dropped from a healthy green to a dangerous dark yellow. And by the time he was halfway across the other side the Nirvana flame had started to burn away at his very soul. The great demon commander still had many cards to play. Many attacks that he could have used on Rudra to neutralize him in a fight. But the problem with any and all tier 5 and 6 attacks was that it needed time to be activated and usually the opponent does not give to the leisure of activating an attack. Rudra had gained an incredible advantage when Furball replaced him in the manner that he got a few extra seconds to activate his best attack. And now Darius was being consumed inside it. The demon commander tried to resist the attack with every fiber of his being. However by the time the attack's power ran out, not even his ashes remained on the other side of the shore. The path which Rudra's attack had followed could be clearly seen as a smoldering lava pit as for the full stretch of 19 kilometers, or so there was only pure lava in a 15 meters deep pit and nothing else. Rudra huffed and puffed as not one moment after killing Darius his eyes turned to SMG. As the former elder of the elites, Guild felt a primordial fear when looking at this apex predator. SMG was familiar with this gaze of Rudra. He had seen it time and time again in the guild. It was only used by Rudra when he was about to absolutely destroy an opponent. Ko. And usually he was on the other side of the gaze and would appreciate how fierce and cool it looked from a distance. However, for the first time ever as he faced the gaze he knew at that very moment that this was not the gaze of a man. But that of the Grim Reaper himself. SMG could do nothing but stare from 200 meters away as Rudra downed a max HP potion. A max stamina potion and a max mana potion back to back and his physical condition visibly improved as a result. The black aura erupted around his body as he unsheathed both of his swords and calmly walked towards SMG while staring him down. With an unbelievably powerful attack Rudra had slain the number one demon commander of the enemy forces. And now he was walking towards SMG to take the head of the traitor. And there was nowhere to run for the former elder. The reaper was here for his soul. Lucifer SPOV. The devil absolutely lost his mind when he saw Darius die. As Rudra's final attack set a shudder down his own spine. Why? 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 Why must a mortal bug defy me time and time again? Lucifer kicked a minister seat in his throne room, and the poor structure dislocated from its base, and embedded itself on the wall in the distance. Lucifer proceeded to pick another one with his bare hands, as he pulled it away from its base, and smashed it on the floor, in anger, as it shattered to pieces. Darius was the spine of his army, the supreme commander of his forces, and the man who had helped him claim the throne of hell. Lucifer had seen that man fight, and he knew that other than himself, he was undoubtedly the best warrior in all of hell no question about it. And with him slain, Lucifer's army single-handedly lost its most capable fighter, which was a big blow to the devil. Why can that mortal, barely 30 years of age, kill Darius? Darius was over a millennium old and had fought uncountable battles. On a good day, the mortal would be lucky to land one him. However, today he killed him. Why do the one in a hundred thousand odds keep repeating themselves when this man is involved? Why can he not die like the bug human that he is? Why must I suffer this indignation? The devil's red eyes were glowing with madness. He was about to break the rules of the bindings of Omega once more trying to directly kill Rudra, using divine power however the queen suppressed Lucifer's actions. I see. He can use the Nirvana flame. So that ancient BA asterisk 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 must be his backer. But that's impossible. The ancient gods are not to meddle in this world. Then why? Lucifer banged his fists on the ground and howled in frustration. Fine. Since the old boss to asterisk asterisk protects him, then I will march down personally to reap his head. I have suffered enough indignation at the hands of that mortal. Today he must die. Lucifer said looking towards the heavens. As he clapped his hands and asked his servants to bring his armor. Lucifer had snapped after the death of his first commander and had decided that every breath Ridra took here on out was an insult to his honor. Hence even if it was dangerous to do so. He was going to fly down to the battlefield and reap Rudra's head today. No matter the cost. Meanwhile Omar. Omar was within the army of death camp when he felt the familiar power of a blazing nirvana flame erupting from a nearby location. Closing his eyes, he felt the heat of the flames and the power within them only to raise an eyebrow when he felt that the power within the flames had already breached into tier 6 realm. Standing up, he had a wide smile plastered on his face as he whispered under his breath. What an amazing human! Initially, he was not supposed to show up in today's battle as the only assistance Hades had requested from him was in the final fight against Lucifer. However, seeing how Rudra mastered a move of the Phoenix lineage, Omar felt extremely proud and happy and decided to grace the mortal by lending him a hand in today's battle. Little did Omar know that his meeting a millennium later 
with the devil was unexpectedly going to be scheduled today itself. Chapter 812 Max Shines Max's POV As the earth trembled and the clouds parted, River's attack was so terrifying and so magnificent that it not only killed Darius, but also left the entirety of the army of death re-energized. The primal roar of cheers they Max heard from his colleagues, as Ridra unleashed that attack was something he would never forget in his life as it sent goosebumps down his spine. His brother was something else. And it seemed as if he had once more made an unlikely comeback. One which no one expected him to make. Clutching his fist, Max smiled. As taking charge, he said, Mining Division! It's our turn now! Charge! Arghai! The warriors in the Mining Division shouted as they charged towards the enemy Tier 3 Division engaging in a battle with their superior counterparts without fear of losing their lives. The morale and the adrenaline rush gave them the courage to take the risks that they usually would never take and that helped them to stand their footing against the stronger enemy. Even if it was for just a few seconds, Max clutched two daggers in both his arms as he used his agility to backstab a tier 3 soldier busy fighting another warrior from his crew. The backstab made him wince and as he turned to face Max, he was stabbed in the gut by the swordsman, killing him effectively. Max threw a dagger, and it pierced the neck of another soldier clean, and he and the swordsman quickly closed in on him to finish the job. The EXP Max gained from just these two kills was insane. However, he had no time to relish his gains, as the initial adrenaline boost started to wear off, and the tier 2 troops were starting to be forced back. Retreat! Fall back! Now! Max gave the order, and the crew started to disengage. Those at the backlands turned and started to run while those at the front lines took on a steady retreat. While planting the mines, they had left out three single lines of ground patches that were safe to fall back from. However, otherwise it was a hell hole. Those who could retreat, finally retreated and just as the final few lines had to retreat backwards, the flurry of arrows started to fall on the demon army, giving them the opportunity to break and fall back. From the trenches, the archers took aim and fired repeated flat shots towards the enemy troops, making their chase of the retreating tier two players very hard. For next four minutes, the army of death detonated no bombs as they let more and more attacking demons cover the minefield. And only when the demons reached the full span of the minefield did Max give the order. Detonate! Boom! 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 The earth shivered and mud flew everywhere. When within the trenches, it was like a constant mud shower however despite the mud. The cheers only grew louder and louder as the troops were absolutely delighted at the thought of the dying demons. Nearly 100. Zero, zero, 000 demons were killed by the minefight's explosion, and about 400. Zero, zero, 000 were injured. As the warriors attacked once more, and the archers took aim. It was a completely different battle than the one before as the demons were the ones running away now, and the humans were the aggressors. 1 million tier 2 humans in a fight against 2 million tier 3 humans was an odds that was sure to result in an ugly route for the humans. However, thanks to Max's cunning war strategy, the demons were forced on their knees, as when the dust settled, and the very last human died in battle, they had created a terrifying loss of 650. 000, 000 tier 3 troops total for the enemy camp. Max himself died valiantly after killing 17 tier 3 demons total, which brought him incredibly close to the peak of tier 2 in the end. However, he did die after all the fighting, which meant that his journey of adventure with his brother inside hell ended there. But he was not regretful about it. He had went out with a bang, sitting in the Church of Life in Purple Haze City. There was only a smile plastered on his face. As what he did not know was that someone had already posted a video of him making a plan and leading the troops on the forums. His days of fame were only a few hours away now. Meanwhile Rudra. Rudra looked charged at SMG who was now being covered by nearly four tier four generals around him. However Rudra did not give one solitary F asterisk 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 anymore as he was just in the killing zone now. No longer needing to think what was the best course of battle he just let his instincts take over. One of the tier 4 generals attacked him with a fire blast from the left. One closed in on him with his sword draw from the right, while SMG himself melted into a pool of shadows and went underground to trouble Rudra. Rudra blocked the fire attack with a single finger as his mastery of fire element now allowed him to take charge of such lesser fires with no issues at all, while blocking the swordsman with a siege breaker. SMG popped up behind him and tried to stab him into the kidneys. However, Rudra lifted his leg in a backward motion and nut SMG right in the balls as the pain made his upper torso buckle over. Using raw strength to overpower the tier 4 general Rudra slashed his sword in an upward motion to knock him off balance, as he himself turned with incredible velocity, and landed a roundhouse kick straight at SMG's jaw, as he sent him flying. At this instant the other two tier 4 generals arrived, 
and together the four of them tried to suppress Rudra. But it was to no avail. Rudra weaved through their attacks as if dodging a child, and slit the throats of two generals while stabbing the other two with his two swords. At this moment SMG used darkness blast attack on Rudra, and that attack landed straight on Rudra's back and exploded. SMG smiled for dealing damage however, when the dust settled Rudra's HP bar had not even moved by 2%, shaking the basic attack off as if it was nothing. Rudra continued to kill the four generals completely as he ignored SMG. Although Rudra's back was exposed to SMG the man did not dare and recklessly attack Rudra as it was decades of fear and respect that prevented him from underestimating Rudra. And in reality, it was a good choice. Rudra's vision left no gaps in his defense, and although to SNG it looked like Rudra had exposed his back towards him. In reality, that was not the case at all, and the moment he charged at Rudra, the other would spin and take his head off. At this moment war conches were blown and horse riders came into the view as SNG finally smiled. Nearly 5 million tier 3 soldiers. About 50 tier 4 generals had shown up as reinforcements from the fort of Mirzapur, and their presence gave SMG the confidence to kill Rudra. Rudra killed the squirming tier 4 general under his feet by simply stomping on his throat and crushing his windpipe as he raised his head and looked at the approaching army head on. SMG said in a fiendish voice, It's over, Guildmaster. You fall here. Dot. Rudra looked at him. His attitude stone cold, as if he was not at all impressed by the approaching army. Maintaining eye contact with SMG, Rudra raised both his arms in the air and said, Rise! My legion. Rudra used the move, Death Legion, and subsequently the earth rumbled as the green grass started to wither away as million and millions of undead broke through the ground and formed a massive army around Rudra. Undead mages. Undead archers. Undead golems. Undead horsemen. Undead Durahal. All powerful elder liches and four tier four commanders all raised themselves from the ground, and while the outer undead soldiers stared at the demons, the innermost ones created a circle around SMG and gave him an undead stare. Rudra smiled as he said, By the time your army can reach me, you will be dead a 100 times over. Dot. SMG started to tremble, a trickle of piss dropping down his thighs. Even the strongest necromancer could not summon an army this large this quick. However, Rudra did it as easily as breathing. He was just breaking the laws of the game as if it was nothing. Arghai, SMG charged at Rudra with his top speed. However, Rudra toyed with him as he attacked as not only did he dodge every single one of SMG's attacks, but deliberately landed the brunt part of his sword on SMG's chest, neck and head as if to tell him that he could have killed him many times over by now, but was just choosing not do so. As the demons and the undead legion embroiled in a battle, Rudra himself started to chip down SMG's bright orange HP down to a dirty red. Chapter 813 Forgiveness SMG was on the edge of life and death, teetering at 2% of his HP as the fear of death had passed away from his body now, and what remained was the sullen reality. He knew he was going to die here by the hands of his former guild master, and that reality greatly saddened him. The drugs had messed his brain up. It was only now that the vanity was stripped away from him that he could think clearly about his fundamentals. Fundamentally he was a good guy. The time he had spent in the elite's guild as its elder was undoubtedly the high point in his life. Before that he was just a member of the nameless assassin guild and his life was a mundane routine of training and assassination missions. Having killed countless unsuspecting prey. Men. Women. Children. Elderly and sometimes even pets and unborn fetus as he was pretty much dead inside. Which was why when he looked at Rudra, Karna and the like who were the same breed of men as himself. Killers and Omega to be actually happy and cheerful when they were with their women. He felt jealous inside. He started to think that maybe, just maybe if he did get these women for himself then the loneliness he felt in his soul would fade away. However it was a very dangerous thought to harbor. He was old. And while money could buy him prostitutes to warm his bed, finding genuine true love was difficult, which was why SMG failed to find his own significant other even though he had tried multiple times. Finally when the drug started it tipped him over the edge and he entered a pervert phase of life where he committed many unforgivable crimes. However, at this moment, it was all clear in his mind. Looking at Rudra, SMG whispered, Guildmaster! Rudra, who was beating SMG rotten with the back end of his sword, stopped as he heard this. As he momentarily looked at SMG with a blank face, SMG continued, Forgive me for all the pain I have caused you, Guildmaster! The drugs had blinded me. I know my crimes are not forgivable. However, in my last moments, I want to ask for your forgiveness because I think it's the right thing to do. For me! The time I have spent as an elder in the guild has been the most beautiful time of my entire life, and for that I must thank you. It was an honor serving you. Farewell, Dot. 
SMG retrieved a dagger from his own inventory and plunged it into his throat, as he said this as his HP dropped from the 2% to 0, and he died right there below Ridra. Ridra's expression had softened considerably, as he said to SMG, I forgive you my friend. Rest comfortably, dot. At this point in time Ridra had no idea that SMG had died in real life, and he thought that with this death, it was just his career in Omega that came to an end, and that the two would someday somehow meet somewhere. However little did he know that this was the final goodbye. With SMG as death Ridra's full attention fell down on the demon army at his footsteps, as with no elite surrounding him, and no care about destroying the landscape. For the first time ever Ridra descended amongst the enemy army ranks with the single objective of obliterating them completely. He took on the Knight of the Empire form, and alongside his undead army. Ridra walked unobstructed as a giant amongst ants as with his every foot stomp, he killed roughly 200-250 soldiers under his feet. Although Rudra's undead army was significantly outnumbered compared to the demon's army. Shockingly, it was vastly superior. Rudra's army had nearly 300. 000 undead mages, who could spam AoE spells at an unbelievable pace controlling the tempo of the battle. While the cannon fodder troops, the archers and the Durahal could all combine as a tactical unit to take advantage of the openings created by the wizards to reap serious lives. The liches could keep spamming the undead skeletons, and with them taking the brunt of the damage, as the frontliners, the truly quality troops were never put in direct danger, and hence could focus solely on attacking rather than saving their lives. The result was that Rudra's army had a vastly superior hand over the demon army, and they were driving them back every passing second. It was the first time since Rudra had unleashed his full undead army, and even he was surprised to see its true potential. For 25 minutes, the duration for which Rudra could mention his giant form he and his army reaped a combined total of 1.4 million enemy lives, and his level skyrocketed to a whopping 600. Of course, during the process of the fight, Rudra had completely transformed the entire Tarian as deep craters, and ridges could be seen everywhere he soared or body weight had been placed alongside a pool of blood and a mound of dead bodies lying everywhere. It was at this moment that Rudra heard a sky piercing screech in the air, and as he looked up, a magnificent phoenix soared through the skies. The Phoenix was nearly a 30-story building long and about 15 trucks wide with its wingspan 1.5 times its body length. It was covered in golden red flames, and its wings seemed to be made of liquid flame instead of solid mass. All the demon generals stopped fighting Ridra and redirected their attention on the Phoenix. However, one swoop by Omar over the battlefield, and the demon section was covered in flames, as millions of Tier 3 demons were reduced to ashes by his very presence. 3 minutes 22 seconds was the time that it took Omar to root an entire army of millions of tier 3 demons, as by the time he landed beside Ridra, and shifted to his human form with a smile, there was nothing but burnt chars of flesh remaining on the battlefield behind. Omar said, I see you mastered the Nirvana flame! However, Ridra was too stunned looking at the destruction left on the battlefield to offer another word, as he simply stated wide-mouthed at Omar instead of giving a reply. At this moment Rudra did not know whether to laugh or to cry as he thought that if it was so easy for Omar to wipe out entire armies, then why the hell was he even fighting? The other party could have literally ended the entirety of enemy forces within a few seconds. However, before he could recover from his shock, he and Omar both felt a repulsive and downright disgusting aura wash over their bodies, as both of them instantly drew their weapons and became ready for a fight. Although no words were spoken the two of them understood what the implication of that aura was. The disgusting feeling could only mean that the devil Lucifer was nearby. Meanwhile on the forums, clips of Max S battles and leadership had gone viral on the forums, and with more than 70% of the player base being around tier 2-3, this was a battle most players actually found relatable and practical compared to Ridra S now unbelievable and out of the world fight sequences. Max's face became very popular and his calmness and leadership qualities were greatly praised by the netizens. However with great fame came great stalkers, and with his face plastered all over social media, it did not take some people long before the association was made between Max and Ridra Rajput. The comments on the forums became even more outrageous when this phenomenon was discovered. Oh my god! A bunch of tier 2 fighters giving a tier 3 demon legion a run for their money. It's so exciting! The strategy and execution was brilliant. The leader is a genius. Dot. Damn. The war in hell looks exciting. One of those who participated said that he killed two demons and gain seven whole levels. Damn, I'm so jealous. Dot. They say that the kid who lead this battle was Max Rajput, the brother of the elites, Gil Master Rudra Rajput, aka Shikuni. Max is the fastest individual to ever graduate the Elite Academy, and looking at his gaming skills, as well as leadership qualities, I'm sure his future potential is infinitely bright. Oh my god. Like brother, like brother. 
I guess great leadership qualities runs in the genes. Dot. Big Brother Max. If you want someone to warm your bed tonight, then I'm available for you. Dot. Replying to user number 2336602. Be asterisk 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 stay away from my boyfriend Max. He's mine. Oh yes he now? Prove it. Dot. A photo of Max kissing the girl is posted on the forums and instantly becomes viral. Dot. Damn. The kid is barely 17 and already has a girlfriend. Makes me want to hang myself by a rope. Dot. Big Brother Max. Why do you have such an ugly girlfriend? Come to me instead. Dot. What I want to know is why is Max not fighting with the elite division, but with randoms? Is he not a guild member? Is there divide between the two Rajput brothers? Dot. In one single day everything about Max from his school history to his childhood pictures to his current girlfriend is discovered by the netizens as he becomes the favorite child on the forums. A young star in the making. Forward slash forward slash forward slash congratulations on hitting the GT target. Bonus chapter should have been delivered today itself however apologies it will be delayed by one day due to unavoidable circumstances. Tomorrow however will be a two chapter day forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 814 Johnny leads a raid. Oh god it stinks. Skyla complained as she tippy toed her way through the sewers. Johnny was currently leading the army through the sewers into the city of Savanthi however the journey was extremely unpleasant to say the least. The demons were not exactly vegetarian. In fact the demons were not at all vegetarian which meant that their sewer waste smelled like dead animals all around. Which was unbearable to say the least. Most soldiers just started to do mouth breathing. To avoid having to take more of that stinky breath. And those who did breathe through the noses took one long breath and held it until they ran out of lung capacity and only then exhaled to take a new one. More or less everyone wanted to get to the destination as soon as possible however they also understood that it was more critical to move stealthily and without alerting the city forces above then to move quickly. Johnny being in his formless state, had just his head popping out of the ground. As he surveyed the situation at Savanthi city only to find that nearly 70% of their garrison had been called out as reinforcements to kill Rudra outside the city. Leaving the core city defenseless. Smiling at the guild master's plan. Johnny gave the troops the signal to make haste, and he himself positioned below a manhole about 1 kilometers inside the city from the wall, and summoned his pet dinosaur to punch a hole through the street as the dino broke the manhole and created a massive pit as it surfaced in the city. Roar! The dinosaur roared and the demon netizen screamed and started to scurry in panic. It was akin to living a Jurassic Park movie in real life as a large dinosaur suddenly appeared out of nowhere in the middle of a busy marketplace and started to roar. Johnny stood on top of the dinosaur's head as he looked at the scurrying citizens and the incoming police troops from a distance. However his attention was grabbed by a small demon child who was hardly a few years old who was crying, while sitting on the floor pointing at the dinosaur. Sob! 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 Boohoo! Mummy! The demon child had very small horns, and was holding onto a small doll-like action figure. If it were anyone else but Johnny, they would have felt pity for the kid. However Johnny being Johnny only said, H-E-Y! Who left behind their noise and poop-making machine? Come claim it by the shop near the massive dinosaur. Dot. A demon mother quickly came in, and picked up her child in her arms and ran away. All the time Johnny glared at her unbashingly, showing his absolute disdain for parents, who forget their child behind in panic. The elite started to pour out into the city, manhole after manhole, as the red flares were released over Savanthi's city, signaling that it was under siege. The biggest challenge that the defending forces faced was that the sewer network extended all across the city, as sewers were there within every block and every street which meant that the invading forces could literally pop up from any sector, and no blockades could be formed with the fear of backstabbing. The army of death hence swarmed every sector of the city, and a bloody battle between the stinky army of death soldiers, and the filthy Lucifer worshipping demons started in Savanthi's city. Initially the defending forces could hold their ground however with more and more troops flooding into the city, and their own majority of the contingent sent as reinforcements outside the town meant that the number of troops defending the city were thoroughly inadequate at the moment. With the city wall bypassed, and the fight coming at a location where the invaders cared little to none about civilian life however the defenders had to. It became an abundantly advantageous situation for the army of death. Johnny himself only focused on taking control of the gates of the city. As with the flares being unleashed there was a high chance that the reinforcements may quickly retreat, and hence, it was a matter of the utmost urgency to cut off their path into the city. The walls of Savanthi's city were mounted with even more defensive artifacts than that of Purple A's city, and with them being over 100 meters tall. It was nearly impossible for any invading army to break or climb over it without facing dire consequences. 
The walls of the city were the most essential part of its defenses, and with them becoming useless in a sewer invasion, there was little that the wall patrolling archers and soldiers could do when the fight was within the city. The mounted weapons could not be rotated, and the densely populated townscape was not a good area to shoot arrows into, as there were many areas to take cover for the attacking forces to hide from the rain, and there was a high chance of friendly fire. When Neatwit, Johnny and the other elders hence attacked the men on the wall. They alongside their 22 generals were killed in under 30 minutes by over 70 elite generals working together, after which the gates of the city were sealed shut and the control of the wall-mounted defenses taken over. All this meant that when the reinforcements would finally return to respond to the emergency, they would be treated by the wall defenses of their own city. Forward slash forward slash forward slash today will be a three-chapter day, this being chapter one-third. Special shout out to my dad for gifting me Magic Castle worth 5,000 coins. You all can accredit one bonus chapter to him. Also, I've finally made a sample of the elite merch I always wanted. And I will be gifting it for free to some of my patrons on Patreon. I'm thinking about also gifting them to my top 3 GT patrons every month. Do tell me if you guys will like that or no. Check the comments to look at the picture of your author Sama wearing the merch victory hand forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 815 A City Captured Although skirmishes were ongoing all across the city, with Johnny and the other generals capturing the gates of the city. The city had turned from a free space to essentially an extra large prison, as no demons could run outside the city, while no reinforcements could enter the city. The army of death archers took up the patrol position on the walls, whereas the lower tier troops took the helm of operating battle weapons. With Johnny leading a massive force of three legions total, it only took a few coordinated minutes for the legions to take control of the city from the outermost circuit of the walls, as they started to push the fight closer and closer down the center. A new force would have problem coordinating and navigating a new city without technologies such as GPS or wall-mounted maps. However, with Max having obtained the city's blueprints, the elites were able to plan in advance and understand the layout of the city thoroughly. This made coordination and attacks extremely synchronized, and every choke point that could be used to thwart the march of troops such as crossroads and narrow street crossings were stormed early on before proper defenses could be set up. A bloody war lasted six hours, as millions of demons battled millions of humans. However, at the end, the defending forces were routed, and at a loss of just 11 million soldiers total, Johnny had successfully obtained the city token from the mayor's office and claimed the city as his own. This was a major blow to Lucifer's forces, as the city of Savanthi was a major population and industrial hub, and with such a massive city falling into the human hands. The army of death now had a base of operations on the other side of River Thames with Har Har Mahadev chants being sung all across the city, and the flag of death unflurring from its walls. The army of death added to its achievements yet another flawless victory. Meanwhile on the forums, as the war of the city of Savanthi was broadcasted it was only now that majority of the netizens started to get a whiff of Rudra's real plan, as the conversations on the forums took a 180 degrees turn from before. So let me get this straight. About 18 hours ago, the entire forums was laughing and mocking Shakuni, to have lost his touch and for facing a massive defeat. However, 18 hours later, it turns out that not a single one of us was able to understand his true plans and his forces have now captured a city. Goat. That man is simply the goat. Dot. I would like to call out every single one of you who made fun of Shakuni a few hours ago. Where are you now? F asterisk 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 ing dumb bastards who have no clue about his true intentions. Yet quick to jump to conclusions. Now be quick to apologize. Or your daddy and Shakuni's number one fan will be posting memes of your IDE for eternity. Dot. Too strong. Shakuni is simply too strong. Mad respect. Dot. Another win for the army of death. What is it now? Seventh or eighth one in last four months. Damn I wish I joined them early on. There was so much EXP to be gained. I have studied the map of hell and with this enormous strategic victory. I guess there is only the fort of Mirzapur now standing between the capital city and the army of death's march. Although it sound unbelievable, we might see a regime change in hell in under four months now. Seems like Lucifer's time is up. Dot. Ha ha. The dark faction players need to start praying to Benyager quickly and beg the goddess to extend some protection to Lucifer, as Rudra is sure as hell on his way to reap the devil's life. Dot. Overall the mood had reversed and everyone criticizing Rudra were left awestruck and at a loss of words at the revelation of his masterstroke. Many content creators started to break down his war strategy into small bits. And although for now, it was just content to kill time. Many years down the line in the history of humanity this particular war would be called the War of River Thames, and it would be a mandatory read for all students in class 8. 
Meanwhile Rudra, the sky blackened. Pitch black smoke seemed to cover the entirety of the sky as within one short minute the light density of the area fell to a barely visible level with majority of the light being absorbed by small black particles, which now occupied all the air around the battlefield. Purple lighting bolts could be seen occasionally from within the pitch black particles in the sky. As an eerie coal followed by a rumbling thunder could be felt and heard by Rudra on the battlefield. Before Rudra actually saw the devil, he sensed his sinister presence as when the devil's aura washed over him, he felt as if he had eaten an utterly burnt piece of break and although his body wanted to spit it out, some magical force was making him chew on it consistently, making him feel a weird compulsion of throwing up when he could not. You are in the presence of the devil Lucifer, the ruler of demons, the progenitor of all sin, and the overlord of the underworld. All stats reduced by 25% due to aura suppression. Just like Rudra's aura suppressed those below him. Lucifer's aura suppressed everyone below tier 6. And while Omar was fine, Rudra saw a massive debuff of 25% on all stats. However Rudra's undead army fared even worse. The demons in Lucifer's service and the undead under Rudra were sprawled on the floor alike. Irrespective of their association to Lucifer, Anyone below tier 3 was instantly reduced to dust, while all troops at tier 3 were thoroughly incapacitated without even 1% of movement available. While all tier 4 generals faced a massive debuff of 75% on all stats, as they clutched their chests, and breathed heavily struggling to even mention their footing. Lucifer did not care about the demons under his service anymore, and hence did not restrain his aura to only dominate a certain section of the battlefield, but rather let it go loose, which resulted in the entire army of demons, and Rudra's undead losing millions of lives on both ends. And then at last Rudra laid eyes on the devil himself, armored and carrying a weapon in all his glory. And it was not a sight for the faint-hearted, and one that Rudra would certainly not forget for an eternity. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the GT target. Good job everyone. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 816 face to face. From amongst the pitch darkness and the purple lightning, a pair of sinister red eyes glared at Rudra, as for the first time ever Rudra saw Lucifer in his real form. He wore a black and red armor that covered every inch of his body from the tip of his toes to the bone of his jaw, with just a little opening on the back of the armor, to accommodate his black angel wings, which were currently folded. The material used in his armor was undoubtedly the same mysterious black crystal that Rudra had seen on the top of the mage tower in the ancient ruins. However, it was perfectly molded into an armor for the devil. Despite it being a brittle crystal that would bend rather than break which made it very peculiar. Carved within the armor were blood-red runes that were written in ancient language as well. However, one looked through the heaven's eyes, and it revealed that it was none other than angel blood. The runes that powered Lucifer's defenses literally ran on the blood of the other archangels as fuel as he found traces of Michael, Suriel and Raphael's blood in his armor. Currently, the devil rode a mutated red dragon, who was at a staggering tier 5 strength. The dragon was covered in hard scales, and its eyes reflected its intelligence. It was not a mindless beast but rather an extremely smart one and a threat that Rudra needed to take seriously. Plated in Mithril with a massive spike ball attached to its tail. The dragon was a war mount for sure and it seemed as if it had served Lucifer for a long long time. The most striking feature about the devil was his eyes. Blood red it looked like the manifestation of all evil which was ironically true for Lucifer. However coupled with his deviously handsome face and his flowing black hair it could easily steal the hearts of many women even though bloodthirst was plastered all over it today. Lucifer snapped his fingers, and Rudra felt the connection to the outside world being cut off, as although his immediate surroundings had not changed he felt as if he was no longer at the coast of River Thames anymore, but rather an isolated space controlled by Lucifer. Rudra was thankful that Omar was beside him now, as if the phoenix was currently beside him, then today would undoubtedly be the last day for him in Omega. However with Omar, there was a slight chance of making it out of this damned place alive. Omar whispered. He has locked space around us. Nobody can get in or out of this darkness anymore. Hades won't be able to enter. Dot. Rudra nodded. He was not one to show weakness to his hated enemy, although no reinforcements were going to arrive for him, he would fight with a straight spine until the bitter end. King Shakuni of the Elites. Alas, we meet again. Lucifer said, as he smiled his devious smile. His sharp pointy teeth like those of a vampire on full display. However, it was a mirthless smile. Hay dripped from every inch of Lucifer's face when he said those words, and he did not try to hide it. Beast King Omar. What an absolute displeasure to see you as well. I thought you were long buried, but I guess I can still harvest some of that Nirvana flame essence from your body, eh? Would fuel my palace lanterns forever. Lucifer said, as he showed blatant disregard to Omar's status as his superior in terms of levels, and talked to him, as if he was just as weak as Rudra. 
However, Omar took no offense. Calm as an ocean, he replied. Well, I had to come out someday to avenge my brothers. So yet, although my shoulder aches a bit from now fighting for a millennium, I think I can blow your mouth to ashes with one blow of air from my mouth. Dot! Lucifer's dragon roared under his feet as Lucifer surveyed the situation. He had clearly made up his mind to kill Rudra today, however, he had not expected to see Omar alongside him as well. Clapping his hands, Lucifer chanted an ancient spell as every single one of Rudra's undead, who were tier 3 and 4, and sprawled on the ground below were reduced to a pool of black goo as they died. Rudra widened his eyes in shock. Although he knew that Lucifer could kill them easily, he never expected it to be so easy. The other party had not even used a move. However, in response to this, Omar only flicked his hand, and the entire demon army was covered in a sea of flames, as they were reduced to a pile of ashes as well within 15 seconds. Lucifer seemed to ignore Rudra now, as he stared down the phoenix. And Omar did not back down from the devil's gaze at all, but instead transformed into his phoenix form, and took it to the skies, as his flames burnt like the bright sun in the dark world of Lucifer, illuminating everything under him. The devil too responded to this threat seriously, as he unfolded his black wings and matched Omar's height, as his dragon landed on the ground and roared nefariously towards Rudra. Rudra gulped as he saw the true extent of the power of the gods, while he could level a city alone if given a chance and topple an entire kingdom given enough time. The true gods could kill 15 million troops with a flick of their fingers. For the first time in a long time, Rudra felt truly out of place and out of his league in a battle, and with his future sight on cooldown, he no longer had his trump move that could be used to neutralize the devil. He was in a bad, bad position for now hanging by the mercy of the gods. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by the boss's back. Thank him in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 817 Catastrophic As Lucifer faced off against Omar, the devil's pet dragon was determined on burning Rudra to ashes. However, thankfully Rudra now knew how to manipulate space and time. As every fire breath that the insolent dragon breathed towards Rudra, he simply opened a spatial hole and absorbed it only to unleash it at the dragon at a different angle. The dragon was the supreme species in terms of mana control. Mana-based attacks and defenses, however, their physical attack capabilities were quite restricted, with Rudra possessing the perfect counter to its mana-based attacks in the form of a spatial wormhole. The dragon was eventually forced to resort to tail swipes to hit Rudra as it snarled and growled. The tail swipes were also not ordinary, as every tail swipe that the dragon did created a splitting sonic boom as its tail moved with an incredible elasticity, and a whip-like motion that was able to create a kapaw sound like that of a whip cracking when it missed its intended target. Rudra started to sweat while fighting the dragon. He had never seen a tail so fast that it could make whip-like sounds. As contrary to a thin whip, the dragon's tail was two times the size of his own body, and when the heavy ball on its end landed on a rock, the rock was obliterated to dust in an instant showing the power behind that attack. However, while Rudra and the dragon were fighting the kid's fight, Lucifer was fighting the real fight against Beast King Omar in the skies. In the few glances that Rudra spared from the dragon to look at what was going on above, he saw a blur of images as his mind could not comprehend the speed at which the battle above him was taking place. It was the same as the first time Rudra had used time dilation, as only when he used that skill and the flow of time around him became ten times slower that he could see Omar charging towards him and the direction from which he was pulling his attacks. As right now, it was all a blur once more for him as the devil battled the phoenix. Rudra had to mention his senses at a hype arrive, as the shockwaves that the two gods created from their fighting were enough to create deep ridges in the ground below through sheer pressure alone, which is why he had to be extremely careful about where he placed his step, and also be on the guard to not come under an indirect attack and die. From time to time Rudra felt a searing heat burst on his back, and although he was not looking at the battle, he could conclude that it must be Omar using his attacks. However from time to time, he also felt something quite like holy power, but much more repulsive in nature on his back, which he assumed was Lucifer's power. It was this sensation that inspired Rudra to do the unthinkable. As if he were in a Pokemon game and water-type attacks would be super effective on fire-type Pokemon. As Rudra believed that since Lucifer's biggest enemy was Michael, and since his holy power felt sinister, it must mean that Lucifer would be most vulnerable to a holy power attack. Thinking this Rudra started to put distance between himself and the dragon, as he carefully lured the beast towards the edge of a large rift in the ground created by the gods fighting and once there, Rudra craftily used a sword slash to carve the section of land the two were standing on to fall into the rift, using blink to teleport above. Rudra had the upper hand over the dragon who was trying to fly out. However, there was no way Rudra was letting it happen. Using darkness blast, thunder blast, stormbringer, overhead slash, and twin blades cross slash. 
Rudra unleashed a flurry of attacks on the dragon's back, and although the beast only lost slight HP due to the attacks not being able to completely ignore his defensive scales, the sheer force of the attacks caused the dragon to fall deeper into the pit giving Rudra the moment of breathing time he needed to take out the Holy Spear. Rudra activated the move, Holy Lance, as divine power started to surround him, and he started to levitate into the air. Up until this moment, this move had never failed him. It was a gift from Archangel Michael, and he had slain countless foes with it. However, today was its ultimate test. If Lucifer sensed Rudra gathering power, he did not react to it, while Omar only casually threw a side glance. Soon the entire spear was formed and packed to the brim with power as Rudra looked towards the devil's elusive figure with utmost concentration to lock down his position. The devil moved too fast for him to get a clear shot however Omar made an opening for him by deliberately using an attack that forced Lucifer to get on the back foot and block and within that split second Rudra got his chance to throw the spear towards the devil. Swoosh! The spear moved with divine brilliance and incredible speed. And for a second Rudra smiled as he looked at the cross-armed figure of Lucifer defending against the attack of Omar completely open to be pierced by Rudra's attack. However it was all a trap. All an illusion. As what happened next Rudra saw vividly, as if every second was a lifetime worth of time. Slowly from behind his arms. Lucifer's sinister smile became visible to Rudra, and the devil finally looked at him to acknowledge his presence. The spear collided with the devil's armor. However no damage message appeared. Not even a one damage. The divine power within the spear was absorbed by the red bloodlines in Lucifer's armor, as the devil regained the little bit of HP he had lost while fighting Omar and looked refreshed. Em! Delicious, Lucifer said as he looked at Rudra and flicked his fingers. A colossal mass of darkness was headed towards Rudra and Omar seemed to panic as he saw it. However, the beast king had bigger problems than saving Rudra. As there was no room for laxing off while fighting a god-level battle and no room for saving those who could not save themselves. With twice the speed that Rudra had sent the spear, came Lucifer's attack and Rudra was defenseless against it. He felt like he was knocked back as the attack hit him, and his back slammed against the wall of the mini-world Lucifer had created with enough force to break every bone in his body as Rudra was knocked out unconscious. Chapter 818A Setback Rudra gasped as he sat up sweating. Both his fists were bald, and he was ready to strike the first thing that moved around him reflexively. Rudra's sudden movement startled the healers in the infirmary, as one priest dropped the medical tray full of potions, while another one sat on the floor with her hands covering her face, as if defending herself from Rudra's attacks. Calm down first, Commander. You are back at the camp. Omar's voice entered Rudra's ears as Rudra looked to his left to see Omar on the bed in the infirmary beside him. His left arm and abdomen soaked in blood and covered in bandages. A flashback of the seconds before he was knocked out replayed in Rudra's mind as he recalled Lucifer's dark attack and how he was utterly incapable of defending himself against it. What happened? Rudra asked. His voice hoarse, as if all the mucus inside his throat had been burned away and only sore throat muscles were left behind. Omar sipped some herbal medicine with his left hand as he said, After you were knocked out by Lucifer, he tried to kill you on seven separate occasions in between our fight. Seemingly irritated by the fact that you had survived the attack on 3% HP even though you were knocked out, his dragon would have finished you off. But I killed the dragon with a burst of Nirvana flame. The weakling was simply no match for my power. However, attacking the dragon meant exposing myself to Lucifer's attack, which meant that an attack landed on my abdomen, which is why the bandage is on there. The injury on my arm is because I brute forced my way out of Lucifer's barrier from the inside while carrying you out. The damn barrier was too powerful and crushed my arm in the attempt to pry it open. The barrier is impregnable from the outside and extremely hard to open from the inside. However, once the opening was made, Hades rushed in alongside the other tier 5 commanders and Lucifer was forced to retreat. The two of us were rushed to infirmary, and it seems I will make a full recovery in 45 days while you will need a full 60. Dot. Rudra listened to the whole story carefully, and then expressed his heartfelt gratitude to Omar. Thank you so much, noble beast king. I am indebted to you, Rudra said in all earnestly. However, Omar studied Rudra and then sighed as he said, Yes, you should be indebted to me. However, I did not save you out of the goodness of my heart. Although your combat abilities are average, at best your mind is a powerful asset. The army of death cannot afford to lose you. Dot. Rudra said nothing, but he understood the weight behind those words. He was only saved because he was an indispensable asset. If it were anyone else Omar would not have gone to such lengths to save them. Or take the risk of getting injured. At this moment Hades walked into the infirmary, and surrounding him was his usual dark aura. The moment Rudra saw that darkness, he started to feel uncomfortable, as he was reminded of the attack Lucifer had used on him earlier, 
as his pupils constricted and his heart rate started to bust through the roof. Rudra could not look at Hades as visage. He was suffering from psychological trauma and had developed an unconscious fear of darkness. How are you feeling? Hades asked Rudra in a soft tone. Not daring to look at Hades, Rudra replied, I'm fine. I will be ready to come back in action tomorrow. Dot. Hades looked at Omar, and the two had a silent conversation with their eyes. And then, the god looked at Rudra once more and said, It's not your job to kill the devil. It's mine. The beast king has grievances of his own, and so the two of us together will take Lucifer down. However, you are not ready to face the devil, my pope. The sooner you understand it, the better. The miracles you produce day in and day out blurred my vision of reality a little, as I thought maybe you can hang on with the gods while being at tier 5. But today was a humble reminder that the gap between you and the devil is too large to be bridged and only death awaits you should you confront him. Dot. Omar nodded and continued. You are a liability in a fight at that level and not an asset. Although through some miracle you were able to convince me outside the beast temple that you had what it took to fight on our level. The lack of divine power in your body is a big problem. Which makes you powerless against divinity-based attacks like the one Lucifer used on you. Dot. Rudra wanted to protest however he could not be rude to the gods hence he carefully selected his words and said. My lords. Very respectfully I need to request you to reconsider. I agree that in this fight I was an utter failure however defeating the devil is my personal vendetta too. Please do not take away from me my right to the few drops of blood I can draw with my grim reaper off his body. Dot. Hades violently shook his head as he said. Read him his medical report. Priest Sasha. Dot. The priest who was initially sprawled on the floor opened a sheet of paper and started to read. First Commander Shakuni suffered from severe mana pathways blockages when he arrived. His muscles had undergone muscle deterioration and his blood had sever infection. His body temperature was clocked at a high 107 degrees Celsius and he had violent seizures and muscle spasms. It was only after a high dose of a sense of mana was administered in his body that his tier 5 body was able to cycle mana at 40% capacity and the danger of permanently blocked mana pathways was averted. The body is currently in a weakened state and will take nearly 60 days of regular medication to clear the pathways and restore muscle strength. The amount of dose sag. That's enough, priest. Hades interrupted as he observed the change in Rudra's expression. Rudra himself opened his status bar only to find out the extent of damage on his body was beyond extensive. Player name, Shakuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title, Viscount of Hazel Groove Kingdom. Honorable Death Knight. Savior of Thal Village. Revered Medicine Master. Honorary Archbishop of the Church of Life. World-renowned. Heir of Augustus One Knight. Achiever. Dragon Slayer. King of the True Elite's Kingdom. First Cultivator. Supreme Overlord. Legendary Demon Slayer. Superior Human. Pope of the Church of Death. History Maker. Powerhouse. Class, Death Knight Mythic. Subclass, Explosion Artist. LVL, 600. Tier, 5. Stats, AGI, 71. 000, 000, 000 bit, 72. 000, 000, 000. Int, 74. 000. 000, 000. PHY, 74. 000, 000, 000 mana, 87. 000, 000, 000 plus 50. 000, 000, 000. Abnormality detected in all stats. HP, 53, 818, 000, 000, 000 slash 53, 818, 000, 000, 000, unassigned stat points, 0, hidden stats, luck, 52 to 100, charm, 99 slash 100, infamy, 0 slash 100, status, critically weakened, strength reduced by 75%, mana capacity reduced by 60%, agility, Vitality reduced by 50%. Equipment, Lich's Ring. Concealer Mask. Sun God's Bracelet, Legendary. Death Knight's Black Shield. Pope's Token. King's Helmet, Legendary. Divine Beast Armor Divine. Magma Boots, Legendary. Mana Stone Ancient. Weapons, Grim Reaper. Siege Breaker. A Eurocent Skills, Darkness Bind. Summon Knight Durahel. Wind Slash. Critical Absorb. Berserk. Darkness Blast. Death Slash. Eyes of God. Earthquake. Critical Block. Blink. Stormbringer. Swift Retreat. Illusiony Multi Sword. Suppression Art. Three Point Stab. Twin Blade Hurricane. Twin Blade Cross Slash. Claymore. Overheard Slash. Solar Restore. Solar Flare. Solar Blast. Solar Descent. Solar Beam. Shadow Doppelgangers. Knight's Courage. Holy Lance Divine. 
One leg leap, rare. Cloud feet. Circumvent. Dance of death, divine. Object manipulation. Gravity manipulation, divine. Space buster, tier 5. Future sight. Elite blast, self-created. Class specific skills. Death knight summoning. Death emperor's S aura suppression. Black ratio. Enhanced full counter. Death legion. Knight of the empire, complete. Time dilation. Undead ruler. Mount, gray wolf. Pet, Furball, Divine Nine Tails. Only after seeing the status bar did Ridra realize how close of a call it had really been in the fight against Lucifer. If he had been at the same level as the start of the day, then he would have died. If Lucifer's attack was a little bit stronger, he would have died. If Lucifer's dragon or Lucifer were able to get to him after the attack, he would be dead. If Omar was not with him, he would be dead. All in all, he was extremely lucky to be alive right now. It was only because he had killed countless tier 4 generals and two strong tier 5 opponents that he had leveled up enough to survive at a slim 3% HP against Lucifer's attack. Otherwise, it would have been a complete game over for Rudra, as his career in Omega would come to an end with his second death inside Hell. Today's matters were to be taken extremely seriously, and Rudra had a big decision to make regarding the future. Chapter 819 New Opportunities Am I fit enough to fight Lucifer? Rudra questioned himself in his mind. The past encounter with the devil had planted a seed of doubt in his mind regarding his own capabilities. He was unable to track the movements of the devil against Omar. They were too fast for his eye to catch. He was unable to unable to hurt the devil even when given an open shot. And to make matters even worse, he healed him and provided strength to replenish his tired core. He was unable to defend against the devil's attack and was knocked unconscious, becoming a burden to Omar in the fight. To be honest, Rudra knew it himself. He was not strong enough to hold his own against the gods. Nowhere near their level. However, he had no other choice but to fight. He could not just pawn off the task of killing the devil on the god of death and the ancient beast king, as while the two of them had their own vendettas, none of them was fighting for the future of humanity like he was. His success and failure was to decide the fate of the entire planet, and not just his own guild or the men with whom he marched into hell, and for that reason, he had to fight this hopeless battle even though it was akin to an ant challenging an elephant. Raising his eyes, Rudra looked into Hades' eyes and said, Two months. In these two months, I will be prepared enough to fight Lucifer. How I don't know. But I can assure you. I will claw my way through hell if I have to, but I'll be damned if I don't plunge my grim reaper into Lucifer's heart the next time I meet him. Dot. Hades maintained an expressionless face and looked into Rudra's eyes with a gauging look. He did not want his number one strategist gone for two months, however looking at the conviction in his eyes, Hades had a slight change of heart. Omar said, We are already in hell. And you have already improved a lot. But it's just not enough. Hades pinched the top on his nose as he shook his head and said, Finish up your affairs here in the next two days and be prepared to undergo the most hellish 60 days of your life after that. However, if you are serious about doing this, then I don't think hell is the right place for you to claw it. If you really want to claw at some place powerful and get a feel for fighting gods, then I think I need to send you to the realm of the angels. Heaven dot. Rudra half expected Hades to be stubborn about not allowing him to fight Hades, however little did he expect that the god would actually send him to heaven as a training opportunity. Omar smiled as he said, I told you this one won't be rattled by us. His perspicacity is unmatched. Dot. Hades said, One needs to be sure. He took an attack from a dark divinity head on. A normal mortal would have nightmares for life under such an experience, however, he is not afraid of Lucifer, but still possesses a strong desire to kill him. Truly admirable. Dot. Omar nodded. The two shared fundamental knowledge about the workings of divine power that Rudra had no idea about. And apparently when a mortal was hit by a dark divinity attack it would affect their psyche extremely negatively and most even developed an extreme fear of the caster when such an incident occurred. This is why Omar and Hades needed to probe Rudra to make sure he still had the heart to continue. As if he was going to shrug away in fear upon seeing Lucifer the next time the duo met in battle then it was better that someone else lead the army of death rather than a broken first commander. Hades said, I'm calling old favors to send you their Pope. Don't disappoint me. Dot. A determined look could be seen in Rudra's eyes as he shrugged off his fears and boldly said, I dot. Meanwhile Johnny, having taken a hold of the city, Johnny blew up the sewers and collapsed the route that the army of death had taken to enter the city hand sealing it completely from outsiders. Using the city's own defenses, the army of death then slaughtered several million of the enemy reinforcements before the generals on the ground were forced to call a retreat, and the troops had to flee back to the fort of Merzipur. It was a comprehensive victory for the army of death, 
and Johnny gained international fame and prestige as a result of it. There was actually a lot of aftermath Johnny needed to deal with even after the actual fighting was over which was controlling civil riots, preventing terrorist attacks and the like, and a hell lot of judicial work too. However Johnny being Johnny pawned all off the boring work to his juniors, while he himself went off sightseeing into some adult demon establishments. Johnny was having a field day until someone dropped a message in the group chat that Guildmaster Rudrow was knocked out unconscious in battle, and was currently in an infirmary. When he immediately stopped his sightseeing and rushed back to the base. Upon reaching, he saw all the elite elders except Karna, who was dead had gathered outside the tent, waiting for the gods to come out so that they can enter and check on their beloved guild master. Sometimes Johnny was moved by this show of love and concerned by the guild as his old heart turned to mush on such occasions. The guild was more like a family to him, and seeing them united in face of adversity always gave him a sense of pride and comfort. Although he would never show it openly, Johnny loved each and every one of the kids in the guild as if they wr his own. Chapter 820 Wrapping Up in Hell The moment Hades walked out of the infirmary the rest of the elites rushed in. Guildmaster are you okay? Guildmaster are you alive? Guildmaster are you insane? Guildmaster 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 Dot Why are you on the bed looking so pathetic boy? Johnny said as he looked at the medicine drips extending into Rudra's veins and all the disgusting black tar that covered his sweat glands. Rudra looked more like a coal mine worker who had just came out of a 12-hour work shift than a patient in the infirmary. However, even after being sponged every two hours, he excreted a lot of mana blockades from his body every hour. The elite swarmed the bed of their guild master, as the thin doctor tried to stop them to no avail. Rudra was happy to see his fellow guild master however they had literally swarmed him, and left him no breathing room at all, which was why he had to loudly say, Easy there boys! Back off dot. Everyone backed off and gave Rudra some breathing room. And Rudra carefully looked at everyone with a smile, as he started to discuss business as usual. The very first thing Ridra asked for was war reports. As he asked for a map and a paper, as he started to track and draw and summarize the epic battle of the other day. All in all it seemed that the enemy had lost the city of Savanthi and a total of 114 million demon lives. Whereas the army of death lost nearly 23 million with all of tier tier 1 and 2 cannon fodders being completely wiped out. In short it was a sweeping victory and currently work was being done to make a makeshift bridge to cross the river out of wood so that the camp may be transferred from here to the city of Savanthi. Rudra knew at this moment now that capturing the fort of Mirzapur would no longer prove to be an undoable challenge as even with his absence. Through the sheer amount of troops at the disposal of the army of death, the rest of the demon commanders should at least be able to take control of the two small villages and the fort in the coming two months. With supply chains set up and a stronghold on both sides of the river it was a highly favorable position for the army of death to expand onwards now and once the fort would be captured then nearly three battlefronts would open for the army of death to attack the capital city from. At the start of the war Ridra had not dreamed to once stand at this stage with this much success however with an overall loss of strength of only 35 million troops and with over 100 million strong left in the army. Rudra was satisfied with the progress so far as his initial estimations would mean he would be having a force of 80 million at maximum at this point in the war. This gave the other commanders a breathing room in the fight to take down Fort of Mirzapur and greatly increase the odds of an eventual victory once the actual capital fight began. For more chapters, please visit Lucifer was currently hit hard with his first and second commander dead. His army in shambles, and a majority part of his forces missing. Although the devil himself was strong on his own. He was not strong enough to control all of hell without strong underlings and Rudra as systemic elimination of his underlings meant that the throne of hell on which the devil sat had started to become shaky. Rudra was supposed to go to heaven to train with the angel soon, and he also had to meet his wife in the real world before that happened, so he wanted to end his duties, as the first commander quickly. He praised Johnny for his good work. Requested Hades to recall Karna once more and organized a meeting with the other commanders to talk about potential strategies to take down the fort of Mirzapur. Ridra was treated with the same respect as the gods were within the army of death camp now. As while the other commanders were a bit cold to his authority at the start. Now they took his suggestions as the gospel and created the whole framework upon his ideas. It was both cute and shocking for Rudra to see as just four months ago, as Modius was frowning at his very sight, and squabbling with him over the title of the first commander however now, he was fighting with others, to understand the non-existent deeper meaning behind his simple words. Rudra came to know through the forums, that Max was a part of the war effort too, and saw a video of him rallying troops, as Rudra felt incredibly proud of his little brother, and a tear of joy escaped his eye when he saw it. He could see the traces of his own accent, when Max spoke to the men and Ridra chuckled at the resemblance. One of his biggest goals in his second life 
was to be a role model for Max to follow, and now, that he could see it in implementation Ridra felt beyond proud of himself. Max was a genuine star in Ridra's mind. Unlike himself, he had no cheats to rely for his fame and success, which was why he believed Max deserved every last bit of it. Not realizing that young men were easily impressionable, and that fame at a young age was as much of a burden as a boon. Otherwise Rudra would have curbed the fame to the boot right this moment. It was a mistake that Rudra would pay for many many years down the line for. Forward slash forward slash forward slash thank you for helping me end last month at spot 14 in golden ticket rankings. I'm very happy to reach where we did, and it's only been possible because of the constant support of each and every one of you readers. Hopefully you all will continue to support me into September as well. This is a bonus chapter to celebrate that achievement. Enjoy. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 821 What Beyond Say In the real world, Rudra logged out of Omega, and it was quite early in the morning when he exited the Elite Tower. The sun was just starting to rise over the horizon, and Rudra was lucky enough to experience the first rays at daybreak as he drove home. His mind was filled with a million questions about heaven about the war, and the coming future of mankind, and even though Rudra was not inside Omega, his mind was constantly thinking about possible ways to attack the Fort of Mirzapur, as he thought about many attack plans as he drove. It had became a habit of Rudra to constantly analyze problems that he wanted solutions to as although many times he would have a moment of inspiration and think about truly out-of-the-box solutions to problems. Mostly, he would consistently make plans and keep reiterating them to make them better with every iteration. This was the difference between Rudra and most other guild masters. For Rudra, the planning was endless and not limited to just the war council room or when an important meeting or danger loomed over the corner. There was a constant process ongoing in his mind day in and day out. As he reached home, he was pleasantly surprised to see Max's girlfriend and Naomi eating breakfast together. From the very sound of Rudra S. footsteps a wide smile emerged on Naomi S. face as she immediately ditched her food stood up and ran up to Rudra to hug him. Usually Rudra would have been able to feel her soft breasts hit his body first however this time around the bulge on her belly had became so large that her belly touched him first and her breasts later. Rudra hugged her tight as all the worries of the world melted when he was in her arms, replaced by a serene calm and a warmth in his heart. However Rudra's eyes soon widened in shock as he felt the baby's kick. Rudra looked at Naomi, words not coming out of his mouth as he pointed at her belly in shock and Naomi said, Yes it's been one week since it's been doing it. Naughty little thing. Dot. Rudra hugged Naomi tightly once more and kissed her neck. He was missing too much these days, and he missed her too much too. Bending low Rudra, then kissed her belly and rubbed her tummy to say, Dad's back home buddy. Dot. The kid inside Naomi seemed to like it as it kicked once more and Rudra and Naomi chuckled. Hand in hand the couple then came at the breakfast table and sat as Rudra poured himself a glass of orange juice while Naomi continued her breakfast. So Max, I saw your clip. Rudra said as he took a sip of his juice and looked at Max with a wide grin. Max instantly blushed a deep shade of red as he said, I'm sorry big brother, I should have joined the elites, but I wanted to make my own mark and leave my impression as Max Rajput and not Rudra Rajput's younger brother. Dot. Rudra chuckled as he said, I I. If anyone asks me is Max your brother, I'll make sure to reply as no I'm his brother. Dot. Max's blush deepened as he stuttered. No no it's it's really not like that big brother. Dot. However Rudra laughed and waved it off as he said. You did a good job. Be more proud. I at least am proud of you. Max's ears perked up when he heard this as his shoulders became wider in reflex. Although he did not show it through words Naomi understood that this compliment meant the world to Max. Max is really popular now Sir Rudra. You should see all the comments on the forums. The people are calling him the next big thing already. Max's girlfriend spoke. Rudra seemed a little annoyed by her presence, as he did not look at the girl at all and rather asked Max. What's the name of your girlfriend again? Dot. Sophie, the girl replied, extending her arm to Rudra. However, one glare from Rudra later, she put it right down. Rudra would have continued his rude behavior however he felt a pinch owe his belly from under the table, and when he looked at Naomi, she was giving him the death stare. Rudra immediately panicked and said, Nice to meet you Sophie. I hope you don't shy away because I'm here and have a hearty breakfast. Dot. Sophie sighed in relief and Max was perplexed about the sudden 180 in Rudra's attitude. However it was a change that only married men could understand and noon else. The power of the one glare from the wife was more powerful than even Lucifer's divine attacks. As while one recovered from the psychological damage of the dark divine mana over time, the emotional recovery from disobeying the wife came only when one was sealed within a coffin. Sophie continued, Max is too popular these days. 
so much so that he has thousands of girls swooning over him these days. Dot. Rudra looked at Max, and the boy smiled innocently. He clearly did not want to have this conversation with Rudra, however Sophie was not going to leave it out apparently. Rudra said, Oh, go on. Dot. Sophie said, Girls are throwing their bodies at him non-stop on the forums, asking if they can warm his bed. I had to post on the forums publicly that he's mine. Mine and only mine. Several times, and now I have a hate army on my back. Sob, sob. They won't let me, and my Max will live in peace. They say you're only his girlfriend, not fiancé. So even if we steal his heart, it's all fair. If only we could get your blessings and get engaged, all this nonsense would end. Dot. Rudra spat a mouthful of orange juice when he heard the bullshit coming out of Sophie's mouth, and apparently Max did the same as he choked on his own food. The two Rajput brothers then asked together. What fiancé? Dot. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the GT target last month. Enjoy. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 822 Red Flags. Rivra and Max shared breakfast in uncomfortable silence after the fiancé comment was dropped by Sophie. Both tactically agreed to change the topic when Sophie pressed for it, and Rivra jokingly said that Max was underage for marriage, which is why this conversation was pointless for now. Although Sophie was not completely convinced she knew better than to pressure Rudra or Max too much on this issue any longer lest she annoy them about it. She knew she needed to be systematic in the carrot and stick approach to slowly break Max into marrying her. However, it was not a one-day process, and she needed to give it time. Max completely lost any appetite to eat as disturbing thoughts about engagement ceremonies clouded his mind when such things were unnecessary burden to a guy his age. After the breakfast ended, Rudra offered to drop Sophie home and Max tagged along. As the trio made uncomfortable small talk about the weather and how university was in the car. The moment she was gone, however, Rudra absolutely flipped on Max. As he said, Look, Max. I know you were always smooth with the opposite gender. Unlike your big brother, you always had a lot of she friends since you were four and chubby. What I want you to remember is, there are a lot of fish in the sea, and you are an expert fisherman. This fish you have caught is toxic. Let her off the hook before she gives you mercury poisoning. Dot. Max felt bad for Sophie. She was his first real girlfriend, and she had also given him her virginity. Max knew that she was very controlling and a bit manipulative. But he loved her nonetheless. I'm not planning on getting engaged, big brother. But I'm not going to dump her either. I, I love her. Max said. Rudra raised an eyebrow and reiterated. Max, this girl is not worth your time, and I don't approve of her moral character. I'm politely shedding light on this and asking you to break up. Dot. Max knew what Rudra said was true in his mind. However, his heart did not want to hear any bad words about his girlfriend. So he raised his volume and talked back to Rudra. Big brother. Respectfully. You don't know her. And it's petty of you to judge her moral character when you yourself have one wife in Omega and another in real world. Dot. Rudra slammed the brakes as he glared at Max. Max panicked. He had said some words. That he did not mean however he could no longer take them back. Stuttering Max said, I am sorry bye. Out. Rudra shouted, Get out of the CR and walk the F asterisk 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 back home. Rudra ordered not wanting to hear one more word coming out of Max's mouth. Max reluctantly stepped out of the car and Rudra drove off. A myriad of emotions boiled inside Max's heart at the moment. However the strongest one of them was probably anger and regret. One side of his mind told him all the wrong things such as he is not my father. He has no right to be acting like one, or this is not 1999. People don't judge others' moral characters anymore. That's just backward of him. Dot. However, the rational side of him knew that the only things Rudra said were because he cared and loved Max, and did not want to see him get hurt. Max wanted to apologize. However, he did not have the guts to face his brother's wrath. Hence not understanding what to do. He broke into tears as he walked back home. A few hours later, Naomi was six months pregnant now and wanted Rudra to be at home for the last 10 days before she was due. And Rudra promised her that no matter the circumstances in Omega, he would be home 10 days before her due date. With this promise and a resolve to end things for once and for all, Rudra restocked his gaming pod with high-end nutritional fluids and prepared himself for one last dive into the game. He had two months to train and heaven followed by 20 days to wrap up the fight in the capital to make it back home to fulfill her promise to Naomi. And he intended to fulfill it by hook or by crook. Every second, he was away from home pained his heart, and he would be damned if he was still absent when his wife needed him the most. Hence, when he re-entered the game, he was there was a purpose and a passion. He quickly wrapped up things with his guild members, giving them temporary roles, 
and putting his legion on standby if the other incompetent commanders could not capture Fort Mirzapur as intended. Since Karna was back, Rudra made sure to assign him more backline duties lest he die once more and lose all his progress in Omega forever. Which meant that the lead role of the Guild Assaulter fell in the laps of Johnny English. Rudra then convened a meeting with the commanders, gave his final inputs on war strategies, and then had a meeting with the Lifestyle Division Chief Fatty Kalash as he restocked his inventory to prepare for heaven. Only when he was ready did he seek Hades, who was expecting his arrival. So are you ready to go to the land of the angels? And gods? A land where only two other mortal men have ever been. Hades asked Rudra. Yes. Yes I am. Rudra replied in a confident smile. A portal opened by Hades as divine powers, and Rudra stepped in to go on his one last adventure in Omega. Forward slash forward slash forward slash a new month and new targets for you all to fulfill. 2000 PS equals one bonus chapter. 300 GT equals one bonus chapter. One super gift equals one bonus chapter. Every week we end within top 15 GT rankings equals one bonus chapter. Bonus chapters will now be dispensed the next day the target is completed instead of the same day. This is because sometimes to fulfill bonus criteria, I have to rush writing the chapters. But I cannot afford to rush this last part as each chapter is the culmination of the entire book's past and lore. So I need 48 hours to give them. Enjoy. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 823 Entering Heaven. System Notification. You have entered the kingdom of the angels. The heaven and in doing so you have become the first and only player in the history of Omega to have visited all three realms. You have gained the title Explorer of Realms. System Notification. The mana in your surroundings is extremely pure. Your mana recovery rate is doubled. The time needed to resolve the mana pathway blockage is reduced by 50%. Estimated time to full recovery now is 28 days. Rudra entered heaven and the first thing that he noticed was that contrary to popular belief, it was absolutely nothing like what the cartoon series and the childhood imagery he had of the place in his mind. There was no overwhelming whiteness or fluffy clouds or golden gates. There were no lush green gardens or abundance of food and water. There were no random sculptures or never-ending fountains. There were no grand buildings either. Heaven was actually extremely dark. It was like being in a Batman movie. There was a general lack of bright light, and every moving figure in the land of heaven was wearing a long cloak and had their heads covered. There was an abundance of pure mana. He could feel that his combat potential was greatly enhanced within heaven. However, what remained a mystery to him was the absence of any laws in the air around him. The mana in heaven was so pure that it did not carry a trace of any of the six laws at all, and it was a surprising phenomenon for Rudra, since any place he had visited up till this moment in life had laws of nature all around them. The beast temple had an overwhelming presence of the fire law, and usually areas near a river had presence of the water law, and even when there was nothing much going on there was always earth, wind, space and time. However, there were no laws to be manipulated in heaven. It was like the place was a dominion of absolution. Rudra felt like even though there was a lot of power coursing through his veins, he could not really channel it to destroy anything within this realm, which was an eerie and unnerving feeling. Up till this moment Rudra did not feel that anything was wrong, until he saw the same group of hooded men walking through the same corridor for the third time. It was at this moment that he figured that something was wrong and activated his godly vision. Instantly the illusion broke down, and he saw a wrinkly old man smiling at him from a measly distance of one meter. Rudra blinked, and the instant he opened his eyes again, the old man was standing nose to nose, and looking straight into his eyes, as he said, B.O. Dot. Rudra fell flat on his back, as the world around him started to spin uncomfortably. It was like someone was warping every measure of his reality. The air pressure. The gravity. The scenery. The sit. The sound. He could see the hallways around him warp over his head, as he sometimes found himself sitting upside down. While his rational brain swore, that he had not moved one inch from his initial position. In the end Rudra felt like a nasty vomit was rising up his stomach as he felt nauseous. However his sufferings were cut short when he heard a loud and resounding clap of hands. Clap clap dot. The world stopped spinning and Rudra could finally focus on his surroundings clearly. As he saw one old man with white wings on his back and a divine looking beauty stand side by side as they watched him. He's not a toy. Raphael. He's a guest. The woman said in a voice that Rudra knew from a long time ago. Rudra had heard that voice when he did a mission for the woman, and he could never forget it. Benigar. The goddess of light. The goddess of life. The healer. The mother of nature and many more. Rudra had read about her in the myths. Rudra had seen her statues in the various churches he had been to. But nothing was quite as amazing as seeing her in the flesh. She had a radiant smile. 
a perfect complexion on her skin, which made it look healthy and naturally beautiful. A near human figure except having a translucent butterfly wings extending out of her back made of rainbow colors. And a divine halo over her head with a perfectly symmetrical face. She was truly breathtaking to see. Benyager had addressed the old man beside her to be Raphael. And Rudra understood that she meant the Archangel Raphael. One of the four archangels who were responsible for banishing Lucifer to hell and one of the strongest angels to exist. He was called the master of illusions and of the six laws and his greatest achievement was the barrier spell that prevents Lucifer from entering the Middle Earth realm. It was rumored that it was his own life force that was expended to mention that barrier. Although Rudra never understood what expending lifespan for immortals meant since they could quite literally live for an eternity. When Rudra's condition improved a little more, his eyes darted beyond the two godly figures as he noticed that he was indeed standing on a fluffy white cloud with bright light and blue skies all around. To his left was a huge gold gate with a sign hanging that said, Welcome to heaven! And even from outside, he could see the countless grand buildings and tall fountains. Getting up to his feet, Rudra bowed at the gods and offered his greetings. Not thinking much of the Archangel Raphael putting him into a mental illusion upon arrival. Forward slash forward slash forward slash congratulations to us for hitting the GT target. Today the bonus chapter will be delivered today itself. Let's keep up the momentum and enter top 15 in the rankings before the week ends to get more bonuses on Monday. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 824 Misconceptions About Binyager Rudra bowed to the two godly characters in front of him. And they smiled at him in return. I like this boy. His eyes are special. I would never have thought that a demigod could see through my illusion. And he's respectful too, Raphael said with a smile. How are you doing, my child? I'm sorry if Rafa here startled you, Vinegar said with a gentle smile. P. Rudra met the eyes of the two gods and replied politely. Not at all startled goddess Vinegar. Thank you for your concern. It's a pleasure to meet your acquaintance, Archangel Raphael. Dot. Raphael made an impressed face as he arched his eyebrows and stuck out his lower lip and said, There have been two demigods before you to come to heaven. Both of them extremely arrogant and disrespectful. However, none had the guts to talk with us gods while maintaining eye contact. It shows spine. I like it. Dot. Rudra politely bowed once more at the compliment. As Raphael continued, Hades has called in a favor to train you. Us four archangels owe him one for having banished Lucifer to his realm, and Bendigar here has her own arrangements with the god of death. So lucky for you. The five of us are going to be training you over the next two months. As you will undergo training with each one of us two weeks at a time. The first two weeks you are under my tutelage. Then Serial. Then Osriel. Then Michael and lastly Binyager. Buckle up. Because it's not going to be a tough two weeks ahead for you with me. Dot. Rudra was very surprised to hear the training arrangements. This seemed like a dream come true training regime for him. The four archangels and the goddess of life all training him for two weeks each. Then I'll be under your guidance, Rudra said to Raphael as the angel smiled amiably at his student. Bindiger, however, said at this moment, War is not the solution to all problems, my child. There are always other peaceful ways to solve problems. Lucifer is also a living being feeling emotions. I'm sure there is a way to move his heart and show him the light. If you wish to understand more about the philosophy of life, then two months is a very short time. And in that case, you may ignore your combat training and spend the time in isolation with me. Dot. Rudra maintained a straight face, as he heard this however inwardly he frowned real hard while Raphael sighed deeply. What Rudra did not know about the goddess of life was the fact that she was an extreme pacifist. The teachings that the church currently preached as the holy bible of life within Omega were not actually words spoken by the goddess, but an altered version spread by Archangel Michael. If things were to go Bindiger's way she would not have a single paladin under her service. No standing army at all and her followers would be pacifists who would believe in things such as if they saw a mosquito sucking blood from their skin then they should not shove it away, but rather be happy in the fact that they fed the stomach of a hungry insect. In essence Binyager was the strongest of all gods. She had the maximum number of followers, and the amount of divinity she had within her body was absolutely insane. She had divinity a thousandfold that of Lucifer, and a hundred times of the four archangels combined. However she used her divinity to do stuff like make holy diluted holy water to heal wounds and cure infections and sometimes to alter the fate of some individuals for whom her heart bled. Binyager was a disaster that was waiting to happen to humanity. As if in the end after Omega, planet Earth fell into the hands of Binyager and the Church of Life. Then it would be flooded by her priests, who would absolutely abhor violence and a pacifist ideology that would never let the planet progress as an intergalactic superpower. 
The only reason why Binyagar was able to hold several galaxies under her domain as its ruler was because of her overpowered children. Her firstborn son was the god of sun and her twin sister was the goddess of moon, Binyagar being the goddess of light. The sun and the moon were her gift to the universe. In total Binyagar had 11 children with 7 different gods and all of them were one stronger and more important than the other and all doted on their mother the most. It was only due to this and the fact that Binyagar had healed many gods from injuries and won their goodwill that other gods protected her lands from invasion and threats like the dark faction. However, being a part of Binyagar as faction would in the end be worse for humanity than being ran over by the dark faction. It was a reality that Rudra did not yet know. However, it was also a reality Rudra was soon to find out as he would spend time with her in the coming weeks. For now, he politely declined Binyagar, giving her the reason that learning from and meeting the archangels was too terrific of an opportunity for him to pass on. Binyagar seemed to be unconvinced and she wanted to press on the issue further. However, Raphael came to the rescue on time and dragged Rudra away into heaven before further talk could be made. Rudra admired the beauty of the kingdom of the gods. It was everything he had imagined and more. Buildings like the Great Pyramid of Giza were only the garages of some gods, while their houses were as big as 50 football stadiums put together. The streets were laid with rainbow crystals that glittered and glowed when one stepped on it, while all sorts of angels could be seen flying in the air. There was an overall jolly atmosphere, and for a moment Rudra lost himself in the unknown culture. However, he was brought back to reality when Raphael whispered to him. Good diplomatic answer back then. I can understand how hard it is to say no to Binyagar. She can be impossible at times. Dot. Rudra agreed to Raphael in his heart. However, taking the smarter option, he chose to mint in his silence and did not reply. Raphael beamed after a while of Rudra not responding as he said. I like you. You have great social awareness. That will take you a long way if you don't let your head be inflated later on. Dot. Rudra smiled at the compliment as he entered behind Raphael into one of the largest pyramids out there in plain sight. Welcome to my humble abode. We train here for next 10 days. I'm um, actually no. I'll be out of here in like 5 minutes, so basically you will train here for the next 10 days. If after 10 days you are still alive and sane then we'll proceed to the more interesting phase too. Raphael said as Rudra simply gawked at the scenery before him with a wide mouth. What he saw was hard to put to words as it was a chaotic mess of nothing and everything at once. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the GT target. Enjoy. P.S. The next training arc is going to be mind-bending, so you can expect to see the unexpected forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 825 First Phase Raphael had decided to train Rudra in an extreme way. His method of teaching was putting Rudra in a room, which absolutely broke the workings of the brain. What he saw was hard to put to words, as it was a chaotic mess of nothing and everything at once. He was currently walking on what seemed to be liquid water, as the texture and the pattern of the floor was exactly like raging waves. However, it was solid. What seemed solid to him in the form of wooden logs floating in the ocean were actually water. What seemed to him like a raging fire was actually hard stone while the fire in his surroundings radiated an extreme chill instead of the usual heat. It was a place that did not make sense at all and broke all the common misconceptions that the human brain had about the world. Raphael spread his wings and elevated into the air as he said, In the first phase of your training, we give your brain a hard reset. It's been programmed to understand the laws of the world through experience. However, once we mature, that experience becomes a habit, and we no longer perceive the world the same way we did as newborns. Well, fret not, for your mind will once again learn to think like a newborn, or it will fall into a coma. Dot. Rudra's eyes widened in surprise. He did not even understand what he was supposed to do in this place. However, a system prompt alarmed him. 10. 000 HP. There are 13 creatures within this pyramid, and there are 15 types of fires inside. Every minute you pass inside, you will lose a portion of your HP. And the only way to regain health here is by hunting the creatures and eating them after roasting their meat. Should you eat them before the meat is roasted, you die. Should you not find, kill and roast them in time before your health runs out, you die. The goal is to survive for 10 days. Good luck. Dot. Saying so the archangel flew away before Rudra could ask him any questions and the entrance from where they entered closed and disappeared as if it was never there. Rudra was stranded in what seemed to be the middle of nowhere, and he could not trust his senses in this place at all. As what he saw, what he felt, and what he experienced were all in contrast to his understanding of the world. 10. 000. A second system prompt jolted Rudra to reality, and when he opened his inventory, he could see that all his potions were listed as gray which meant that they were unavailable. Not only could he not replenish HP in this damned place, 
but he could not even replenish his mana or stamina. Damn it, Rudra cursed as he started to pace around looking for the first creature. It felt incredibly odd to walk on water for him. As although the surface looked like water, behaved like water in terms of making waves that were ever-changing. It was not actually water, but a solid surface. Rudra tripped thrice in his first five minutes itself, and once found himself drowning in water, as the ground he was walking on. Which looked exactly like the other water, he was running on turned out to be liquid instead of solid. Rudra gasped as he came out of the water hole. The world he saw from inside the water was completely different from what he saw outside. As once, he fell inside the water what he saw above was actually a layer of ice, as if he was in the Arctic. With lots of small holes in the thick ice that could be used to breathe. When the body saw ice, as if it was the Arctic it expected cold water to touch its surface. However it was incredibly hot. This contrast started a throbbing pain in Rudra's brain as he decided to f asterisk 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 walking as he tried to use gravity manipulation to take to the skies. Rudra decided against walking altogether and used his vision to try and scan the area for life forms. When he saw that a massive whale-like creature was swimming within the waters he had just came out of and it was the closest prey that he could find. Rudra decided that it was time to go whale hunting as he started to use his brains to try and figure out how to kill the whale and then somehow bring its meat out to cook. However keeping later worries for later. Currently he decided to focus on killing the damn thing first. And the technique that came to his mind to achieve this task was Holy Lance. Rudra figured it was the only technique he had which had enough piercing power to kill a damn whale swimming nearly 200 meters below surface. Which is why he patiently waited near an air hole like a predator as he used his godly vision to monitor the beast's vitals and prepared his Holy Lance to strike when the opportunity presented itself. The opportunity did present itself to Rudra when he could clearly see the opening within the beast's ribs to hit the heart. And Rudra pounced on it as he threw the lance with full power. Kaboom! The moment the holy lance hit the whale, it exploded into a thousand butterflies, and they all flew out of the watering hole around Rudra at once. Baffling the elite leader. How did a whale suddenly turn into butterflies? What happened to his attack? Where was the dead whale body? Rudra had a lot of questions yet no answers. And only now did he truly realize that if he were to think like a normal human in this place, it was going to take him nowhere. Losing HP constantly he needed to adapt to this new world fast. Or he would inevitably perish. Forward slash forward slash forward slash how do you find this chapter? Do let me know in the comments below forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 826 Rudra's Evolution For the next two hours, Rudra struggled a lot. He went from a grown man who knew how to walk and venture alone into the big bad world and instead became a tumbling stumbling newborn baby who had just learned how to crawl. Rudra no longer relied on just his understanding to make sense of the world around him, but rather did what all babies do and started to learn the laws of the world for the first time. He touched every surface and then tried to lick it as he tried to understand the texture of things around him. While it took him some time, but he started to realize that in this warped space where everything was not what it seemed to be, everything tasted exactly like what it was meant to be. The floor tasted like tiles. The water tasted like ocean water. The wood tasted like grass, and the grass tasted like wood. It was then that he burnt a piece of grass to find out that it indeed burned like an ideal fuel for his cooking needs. Happy, Rudra collected a lot of grass for his needs as he also started to go on to the hunt once more, this time with a new clinical approach to his hunting. When closing his eyes to contemplate, what was the one absolute thing that every creature needed to survive? The first answer that came to his mind was air. Even a child can kill a cockroach if he trapped it inside an airtight container for long enough. Which is why when he found the flock of thousand butterflies flying around, instead of using his physical attacks, he used gravity manipulation to create a vacuum-like space, devoid of any air, and choked the insects to death. He was a little iffy about it. However, he used his bare hands to cook the dead insect over the flame, until it smelled like barbecue before popping one into his mouth. Plus 20. 000 HP. Rudra beamed at this success and quickly started to roast other butterflies one after another as he ate to replenish his stamina, mana and health. Afterwards, he started to approach the world around him with a confidence boost and an open mind as he did not jump to conclusions about anything but rather approached every problem with a lot of curiosity. By day 7, his brain started to feel different, like it was somehow enlarging in his mind. It was a feeling akin to having an insane pump for a muscle in a gym. However, this one seemed to be for his intellect. Rudra was sharper. His problem-solving ability has improved by leaps and bounds, and most importantly, the way he looked at the world had changed. By day 10, he could traverse the new world almost as good as the old one, as he more or less got accustomed to the place. 
he had became the apex predator of the space, killing 12 of the 13 creatures inside, while uncannily torturing the last one for his curiosity and pleasure. When Raphael came back to check on him, he was pleasantly surprised to see Ridra in green HP bar, and with a smile to his face, as he had half expected him up to go insane. Well, looks like you had fun, Raphael said to Ridra, who bowed in front of the Archangel and replied politely. Indeed I did. Raphael then clapped his hands twice. And within a moment, the entire world around Ridra came to a standstill. Raphael said, The reason why this training was important for you to undergo is because you have learned a lot of things since you were a child about this world. Many of which are untrue. And to change those misconceptions overnight is difficult. After this training your mind becomes like a sponge ready to absorb anything thrown at it. Making my job of educating you a lot easier. Since you have completed phase one of your training, we shall start with phase two which is me revealing to you the real understanding of the laws of the universe. How much you can pick up from me is completely dependent on your skill. However, trust me, it's going to be worth your time. Dot. Ridra felt his memory to have evolved into becoming photographic. He could recall everything Raphael said in the last sentence word for word, as he felt excited about finding out the truth about the universe around him. Raphael led Ridra into what Ridra believed was a soundproof room, as he started his divine revelation about the laws of the universe. Raphael started his lecture from the six laws, as he broke a lot of Ridra's misconceptions about every single element, right from water to the law of time. For two days, Raphael talked non-stop, demonstrating as he explained the basic laws one at a time, and Ridra absorbed everything up like a dry sponge until his mind became near saturated at the end of day two. Only after listening to Raphael did Ridra realize that his initial understanding about the laws was extremely flawed, and with it, he could never understand more than 80% of any law whatsoever. However, Raphael pushed his understanding of all the laws from 50-55% levels to over 90%. Even for the one law he failed when dot. Raphael apparently wanted to impart many more complex secrets to Ridra, however Ridra's mind was incapable of understanding divinity yet. Which is why upon Ridra's request the two of them started to practice Ridra's practical implementations of the laws into combat. Up till this moment, Omega had been a game which just made an individual learn to perform a move like the wind slash, by thinking about performing the move by reading a skill tablet once. However, never did a player truly think about how the sword created the particular gust of wind when using wind slash, when neither the muscles of the player created the necessary strain, nor was a special technique involved in the way the sword was slashed. Then how exactly was the move created? It was a manipulation of the laws. And only now did Rudra understand how it was done. He now had theoretical understanding to convert any of his slash into a wind slash, water slash, fire slash or even spatial slash at his whim. No special skill move needed. By day 14, Ridra's combat potential had increased by leaps and bounds alongside his brain and fundamental understanding of the world around him. Raphael had successfully completed his job in training the leader of the elites. Chapter 827 Serials Probing After Raphael, it was Archangel Serials turn to tutor Ridra. Serial looked like a young man in his prime wearing a black leather jacket, white t-shirt, and blue denim jeans alongside some really cool aviators. If he did not have the huge angelic white wings on his back, he could pass for some Hollywood movie star. However, the wings made him seem even more of a baddie than a usual actor. Serial had an interesting past in the history that Rudra had learned about the Archangels. Apparently Serial for some time had left heaven to learn among the human race about his station. This choice made Serial more human, similar to his older brothers, Osriel and Michael, to some degree, than his other angelic brothers and sisters. He would learn that not everything was easy in life. Serial worked with his own hands instead of taking the easy road. This shows more morality as Serial would protect the children of sinners, while other angels will kill all of them. Now most would expect the archangels to be aloof and cold, considering they are of the highest orders of angels. However, this couldn't be farther from the truth for Serial, who scarcely destroyed life out of anger and spite. However, harm his brothers and sisters though, and you will see true anger the likes the world has never seen around those mortals who are still alive however. He is incredibly compassionate, always happy to help someone with their problems, and make sure that they feel better even if it just takes a hug or a lot more. This compassionate attitude however made it so that on more than one occasion Serial betted a mortal widow to bring her out of her grief, which is why he has many bastard children running around on Middle Earth, one of whom Ridra knows firsthand. Serial smiled as he looked at Ridra. He was the one archangel who evaluated Ridra rather highly for all the help he had given his son in the Middle Realm which is why he was extremely willing to impart his knowledge to the best of his abilities to Rudra. Just like Raphael, Serial led Rudra into a colossal building. However, instead of finding intricate illusions, 
This time around Rudra found a huge open field covered in beautiful plants and trees and some scenic ponds. Welcome to my humble abode, King Shikuni, Serial said as he welcomed Rudra to his home. And Rudra in turn politely bowed and expressed his appreciation for Serial's taste of interior decoration. Serial said, I'm sure Rafa has taught you invaluable knowledge to strengthen your brain. Well, I'm not as smart as him. Not as strong as big brother Michael. Not as cunning as little brother Lucifer. However, no angel has ever beat me in battle. Not Big Brother Michael. Not Rafa. Not Lucy. For my defense is impregnable. My lessons over the next two weeks for you. Should you choose to learn would be on how to defend yourself. Are you willing? Ruderous heart skipped a beat. Serial was too humble. The books he had read mentioned that Serial once battled seven archangels including Michael and Raphael at once. However, still walked out of the battle and scathed. His defenses were stuff of the legends and it was said that the only sword to ever scratch him was the divine sword Excalibur, and none other whatsoever. River gulped as he said, I'm willing. Dot. Serial smiled as he said, Very well. Before we start let me gauge the level of defensive techniques you already know, so that I'm able to tutor you at a suitable level. Please try and defend yourself the best you can. Dot. River took out Excalibur and Siege Breaker as he took his battle stance. Rudra knew that defense was one of the areas where he lacked the most as a fighter. His natural style of fighting was incredibly aggressive which relied on the ideology that offense was the best defense. However, this was a rare chance for him to remedy that. Serial did not pick a weapon, but instead bent over and picked up a small twig that had fallen off a tree as he charged at Rudra with a twig in his hand. Rudra's eyes widened. The speed was something he was not attuned to. Instantly, he was sent flying as Serial punched him in the gut before he could even see him coming. Rudra activated time dilation. It was the only way he could possibly hope to fight against an Archangel. As otherwise, the speed that these beings moved was just too fast for a mere tier 5 mortal like him to see. Time slowed down around Rudra, and he was able to look at the incoming Serial more clearly now. Rudra dodged a twig thrust by Serial and tried to hit the Angel with the blunt end of his sword. However, Serial caught his elbow with his other hand, and once again tossed him aside effortlessly like a ragdoll. Rudra rolled on the green grass as he took fall damage. However, he was quickly on his feet, putting his swords into a cross as he blocked Serial's foot stomp. Fa! A mouthful of spit escaped Rudra's mouth as the wind seemed to be knocked out of his chest as he realized that the sword block did nothing more than slow Serial's stomp, whose brunt landed on his chest. Serial stepped back as he let Rudra gain a moment of air before he started to launch pure divine energy blasts at Rudra from range, as he watched intently as to how the leader of the elites defended against the attacks. For the first attack, Rudra used full counter to send it back at three times the power towards Serial, and the Archangel's face brightened at the move. However, it was soon back to expressionless as Rudra failed to do it again, and was progressively getting pounded. After three minutes, Rudra's time dilation ran out, and everything was a fast blur for him hence. And Serial soon understood that Rudra was utterly exhausted, bruised and battered. Breathless and bleeding Rudra waited for Serial's evaluation. However, even the kind Archangel had no way to sugarcoat these words as he said, Your defense is pretty much non-existent, and your technique is horrible. Dot. Forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Cervantes 91 for the 15. 000 coin gash upon. P. I'm extremely grateful for the patronage. Bonus chapter soon forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 828 Serial's Teachings Rudra was not shocked to hear that his defense technique was utterly trash. He was aware of the fact that it was, hence not taking the criticism in a bad way. Rudra cheerfully replied, Yes, and I'm eager to learn Archangel Serial. Dot. Serial approved of Rudra's attitude and decided to teach Rudra from the very basics. The problem with Rudra's fighting style was that Rudra was not trained by professionals as a teenager and his fighting style was pure and natural. Unlike the current graduates from the Elite Academy, who learnt proper hand-to-hand -hand combat and advanced martial arts from tutors, Rudra's entire fighting style originated from him playing Omega over two lifetimes, being a bottom feeder once. Rudra naturally was aggressive in his second life, which led to his fighting style being full of big flashy moves supplemented by a lot of tactical moves. However, there was no pure foundation to his attacks. No form. Or theory. Serial noticed this flaw and started from the very start for Rudra. The Archangel said, Your first and biggest flaw is that you take attacks head on. Come here and raise your hand. Let me punch it once. Dot. Rudra raised his hand, and Serial punched him with a little force so that his palm stung upon contact. Serial said, Good. 
Now pull your hand back when I'm about to hit it. Dot! Serial punch once more. However, this time Ridra pulled his hand back a little, and although the punch landed on his fists once more, the force of impact was much less. Serial said, feel that? The very basic of defending against any attack is the motion of jumping back. If an energy blast that you can't handle is coming your way, then you better start running back. If you want to parry a strike, move in the direction of the strike and pick your time to parry. Move in the line of the attack fast enough, and it gives you a far more advanced position to counter it and soften the blow versus you standing still and letting the attack land. So, for the very first lesson, I want you to practice running back when you see an attack you can't handle, and for that, we will first have you do backward running drills. Since we have very limited time, we should start right away. Dot! Serial's words enlightened Rudra. It was completely true. If a swordsman was coming towards Rudra to thrust a sword in Rudra's gut, but Rudra was moving backwards while facing the swordsman at the same speed, then the swordsman would technically never be able to stab Rudra in the gut. It was such a basic and fundamental principle. However, it was something Rudra never incorporated in his fighting. Even if he did not outrun his opponent, simply moving along the line of attack gave him extra time that he needed to parry or dodge it. Rudra started to vigorously practice the backward running drills that Serial pawned off on him, as he found out that he did not have nearly the amount of spring in his step needed for such a drill. He could use cloud feet to make up for the deficit. However, this was a learning drill, and Rudra would not gain much if he cheated here. Doing it rather hard way. Rudra failed to generate the necessary speed. At times fell flat on his bum trying to go too fast while at times ran in an awkward posture that made him prone to other attacks and failed time and time again. Serial was patient with Rudra and gave him necessary nudging to keep the whole learning curve as smooth as possible. And unlike Raphael, who left Rudra to his own devices to train, Serial actually cared enough to be with Rudra 24-7 to tutor him non-stop. It took Rudra a full four days till he could actually master backwards running properly, and it was then that Serial added weight training to the regime so that Rudra could gain the extra agility he needed in a practical battle. For the next two days, Rudra farmed agility like a madman and his agility stat went up by 2400 points as a result. However, while it was nowhere satisfactory enough, Serial had to move on as there were more lessons to be covered. Hence on day 6, Serial started the second lesson, the Art of Parry Encounter. Serial said, you have a beautiful move in your arsenal the full counter. However, what perplexes me is why do you know such a complex move, but not the most basic counter out there? When I come at you with a twig and you engage with me, it should essentially be counter. Counter. Counter at all times, so that you don't waste stamina and parry the opponent with his own momentum. Especially for physical moves. It's important to preserve stamina and drain your opponents. Here, the skill tone for counter. Learn it. We shall practice this one next. Dot. Rudra quickly opened the skill book and learned the skill counter. Serial made it sound like it was nothing however in reality, it was a damn tier 4 skill. Counter, tier 4, legendary, a skill created by the Archangel Serial as a gift to mankind. The counter is a way to use the enemy's own momentum against them while parrying an attack. Restrictions you cannot be 2 tiers below your opponent. And the strength difference cannot be over 3 times. Reset time none. Rudra was grateful for the skill. And immediately started to practice it with Serial. The best part about the skill was that it had no cooldown time and could be used as many times as required, which worked exceptionally well for Rudra, as he found that by incorporating such a simple move in his arsenal, he now created far more openings in his enemy's defense than without it. By day 8 Rudra mastered the second phase showing his brilliance in learning combat-based moves and impressing Serial, as the Archangel moved to the hardest phase 3 of the training. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Cervantes91. Please thank him in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 829 The Ultimate Defense Skill Serial was the master of defensive moves, and for the first eight days of his training with Rudra, he had quite painstakingly hammered the basics of defense into the human. However, the next phase was a lot more advanced. Serial said, Up till this point in your fighting career, I'm sure you must have learned a lot of fighting combos. Two-step offense moves. Three-step offense moves. A quite a lot of complex move series as well. But have you learned any complex defensive moves? Dot. Rudra thought about the question for a while, and then realized that the only defensive moves that he really knew were blocking and dodging. Everything else was essentially a counter move, and not a purely defensive move. He did not know a single two-step or three-step defensive move, and it was quite embarrassing when he realized it. Rudra shook his head as he murmured. No, I don't know any. Dot. Serial smiled as he said. Good. Cause if you did then, 
it would be me learning from you instead of the other way around. Dot. Ribra looked at Serial perplexed as the angel continued his explanation. Serial said, The best way to mount a defense is actually not about blocking an enemy's attack. Or countering his attacks either. It's like the old saying prevention is better than cure, which is why the best defense is actually to not let your enemy unleash an attack in the first place. Dot. Ribra's eyes widened in enlightenment when he heard this logic. Serial was a really good teacher, as he could explain complex concepts in really simple words. Serial continued, Suppose an enemy is unleashing a five-step attack combo towards you. What is the best step to stop his combo? Dot. Ribra thought for a while and said, The first step? Serial shook his head and said, No, the best time to stop is before they even start. Dot. Ribra winced a little. It was a trick question by Serial, and that answer had crossed his mind however he thought he would be too presumptuous if he said so. Hence, he chose the safer first step option. Serial continued, As an attacker, I'm sure you think of what you want to do next at least two five steps before you execute that sequence. Do you or do you not? Dot. Ribra nodded. It was one of his best qualities as an attacker. He thought about his sequence of attacks well in advance before he did them, as he anticipated his enemy's reaction to his first attack, and then built a whole sequence following that. Serial continued, Essentially, every good attacker thinks ahead of his enemy, and while this is a very endearing trait in low-level battles, it's an obvious flaw for defense specialists like me. Dot. Ribra had an inkling as to where Serial was going with this. And it left a bad aftertaste in his mouth. Serial said, If you break an enemy's flow of attacks, you will find them growing more and more frustrated and making more and more mistakes for you to counter and exploit. It's the most frustrating style of fighting for facing an offensive fighter, and in my experience, the most effective. From my understanding of your skills, you are a great thinker. But the question now is, can you change your thinking from how to deal the maximum damage to my opponent to how to break the flow of my opponent's attacks? If you can do that, and you can understand how the enemy is going to follow up an attack with a sequence of moves, then you can stop it before it starts, and that is the ultimate defense. Serial tried to give Rudra the full outline. However, there was no easy way of explaining this stuff to him. Whether or not he could contemplate this and incorporate it into his fighting style was up to him. Rudra in theory understood the essence of Serial's teachings. However, the part where he hesitated was that if he started to think on how to break the enemy's flow instead of how to attack him, then his own attacking potential would suffer as a result. However, little did he know that it was far from the truth. Deciding to hesitatingly try this method of fighting, he started sparring with Serial with this new mindset, as his training with Raphael helped him a lot to be able to mold his previously programmed mind meant for attacking into thinking along the lines that Serial suggested. Ridra over time changed his method of fighting from running head on an attacks to retreating for dodging countering when possible, and breaking the flow of his opponent to stop them from gaining momentum. Initially it was a failure. However slowly, as he became more proficient in understanding how an enemy built momentum in essence, he became better with using this strategy to fight. Rudra saw a trend that increased his sparring time with Serial from 15 seconds at the start to a whopping 2 minutes and 43 seconds by the end of day 14. If it was only the defense that improved then Rudra would not be too shot, but what he realized was that the amount of damage he could inflict on Serial by the end had in theory increased too. Of course Serial's defenses were too good for him to make any notable damage. However while he could only chop of 100 HP during day 8. By day 14, he could chop off 5000. Although 5. 000 was nothing in the grand scheme of things it was a huge improvement in Ridra's fighting skills, and it meant that against an offense-oriented opponent like Lucifer, he could technically gain an opportunity to deal genuine damage without relying on his time dilation and other top ace cards. His fighting style had undergone an evolution from his time spent with Serial, as it was like everything from his foundation to his style of fighting was far superior to what it was before. His fundamentals were clearer. His defensive ability had skyrocketed, and although there was not a huge difference to his stats or levels, he was a more complete fighter coming out of day 14 of his training with Serial. In the end Serial smiled with appreciation and said, Good job. I doubted if you could come this far, but you have exceeded my expectations. Dot. It was the biggest compliment for Ridra. And it meant the world for him. Forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Cervantes91 for $1,000 in gifts. It's just ridiculous. And a truly extravagant way of declaring sorry I was gone a while, but now I'm back dot. It's the highest amount Eve been ever gifted in a day, and I'm truly left speechless by it. What can I say? I'm beyond humble man and I plan to show my appreciation to you by more than just plain words. To give out the bonuses I will do 5 chapters a day for next 3 days. So a total of 12 bonus chapters. That way I will not burn out and the bonuses will be delivered. Thank you so 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 much once again 
And I'm happy to see you come back forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 830 Meeting Osriel Serial did not need to reward Rudra any more than he had already did. But the angel was soft by nature, and gauged that the biggest flaw Rudra had in his fighting was not his technique of his skill, but his speed. Compared to tier 6 beings, he was incredibly slow, and his heart bled at that thought. Without meaningful speed Rudra was never going to give Lucifer a challenge. Hence, he took off his own boots, and decided to give them to Rudra. Serial was a little impressed with Rudra by the end, and decided to bless the demigod with an artifact that he thought would help carry him a long way. The angel said, Here! A parting gift for you. It will give you a slight advantage that you desperately need to fight tier 6 opponents. Although it won't be nearly enough to catch up to big brother Lucifer. Maybe you will just die slower if you have this facing him. Dot. Serial's boots, divine, the boots carved by the god of blacksmiths for the archangel Serial. These boots are inscribed with runes that drastically improve one's agility and defense. Indestructible. These shoes are one of the most perfect creations ever made. Specialties. Agility stat x2. Damage taken to ankle attack 0. Damage taken while walking on any terrain 0. Increases stamina recovery rate by 50%. Increases mana recovery rate by 20%. Increases defense by 100%. Rudra's eyes widen in shock. This was too great of a reward to pass on however too valuable to accept. In the end Rudra stood speechless on the spot and Serial smiled at Osriel, who showed up to take Rudra and shoved the boots in his hands before leaving. Rudra cowed out all the way to the floor in front of Serial as he left and swore that he would always remember the angel fondly for all the help that he had given him. Osriel frowned when he saw this. As in his opinion a warrior should have more pride than that. However he kept his opinion to himself. Osriel said, Let's go human. I owe Hades a favor and I don't want to disappoint. Dot. Compared to the warm Serial, Osriel was extremely cold. He gave the no-nonsense vibes to Rudra and his very being exuded superiority as he treated Rudra as a nuisance that he needed to keep up with for the sake of his promise to a worthy being. Osriel was not an archangel. He was one of the strongest of the angels, but he was just the half-brother of Raphael. Serial. Michael and Lucifer. This was a major reason for his personality to develop like it did. As he was taught from an early age to be stern and take himself seriously because unless he did so, the world would not take him seriously at all. Reaching Osriel's establishment Rudra could not help but notice that it was smaller compared to Raphael and Serial. It was extremely large compared to human standards. However, compared to the two archangels, it was a bit small. Osriel coughed and said, All right, I'll be teaching you about war and strategy. Consider yourself lucky mortal because you get to learn from the best strategist in all of heaven and the official strategist of the army of angels. It's an honor that no mortal has ever received before, and even angels of the highest houses pay incredible riches to experience. I do not even teach to any run-of-the-mill students with no aptitude. However, I'll make an exception for Hades and tutor you. So try and learn as much as you can and absolutely don't do anything stupid to make me angry. Dot. Rudra choked on his own saliva when he heard Osriel. He could accept learning many things and although he was not self-conceited, he considered himself the best strategist around. He was Shakuni Dammit. The mastermind? He was not ready to take shit from anyone. Albeit an angel. Noticing a chessboard in the side of the room. Rudra suggested. With all due respect, I don't think there is anyone better than me in terms of strategizing. Not even you. Dot. Osriel's eyes flared in anger as he considered killing the mortal where he stood. What did you just say? Dot. Rudra calmly continued. There is a chess board right here. Beat me in chess and you don't have to keep up with me for next 14 days. If I win, however, you admit that I'm superior to you. Dot. Osriel laughed in absolute disbelief. It was a maniacal laughter and one full of pride. However, he said, No. It's too easy. If you lose, which you will, you will become my slave for the next 10 years. Since you have a big mouth, let me see if you have the guts to back it up. Dot. Rudra calculated in his mind that Omega was ending in about 4 months time, and that Osriel would be forced to let him go to the war even if he did not want to because of Hades. Which left him nearly 15-30 days of service even if he lost. So Rudra agreed and said, Okay, but if you lose, I want 10 of the best stat improving elixirs from your collection, and a public announcement that I am better than you. Dot. Osriel snorted and waved his hands, and a system contract appeared in his hands. He signed it first, and then passed it on to Rudra. System notification. You have been challenged to a match of chess by the angel Osriel. Should you lose, you must serve as his servant for a duration of 10 years. Do you accept? Yes. No. Taking a deep breath, Rudra clicked yes, thinking he had nothing much to lose. 
Little did he know that contracts into Omega were carried forward by the Queen into Sigma, and he had a lot to lose should he actually be defeated by Osriel. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the GT target. Thank you all for the support. I hope we can continue hitting the targets at this very pace. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 831 A Battle of Strategy. Chess was a game of strategy and probability. Meant to be played by the sharpest of minds, as with every move of the opponent. A thousand potential moves open for the player however only one of them is the right move to be made. Osriel was extremely confident in his own skills, and he did not expect that Ridra could beat him in a game of chess. Although chess was not a representation of one's actual combat strategizing skill. In itself chess was a mini combat strategy game so winning in chess did hold some merit to a great mastermind. Rudra used to play chess as a way to sharpen his brain after his rebirth. And he would play against the highest level of human-created AI and manage to play 100 out of 100 games to a draw. This was the reason why Rudra was confident in playing against Osriel, as he did not think a being got much smarter than artificial intelligence, who could process all probabilities in a matter of seconds. The first game started and Rudra deliberately used a piece-to-piece -piece cover approach to neutralize any attacks by Osriel tit-for-tat until the first match ended in an unceremonious draw after 11 minutes played. Osriel looked a little disgruntled as he shouted, Again! And set up the second match. He playing the white player this time, and making the first move. Rudra changed his approach this time, and he was aggressive from the get-go making sacrificial challenges, if it meant that the opponent lost as much as he did. And unsurprisingly the second match ended in a draw as well. This game of draw for draw. Blood for blood and peace for peace went on for a full 22 hours, until Osriel finally began to realize that his opponent was just as good as him in chess, and the only way to beat him was if he made a slip up. At the 744th game, Rivera noticed Osriel's mental fatigue and decided to play it bold, as he played the one strategy he had been saving since game one to be played on Osriel. Rivera initiated the queen's gambit when he became white, making a play on the center of the board, as he moved up two of his pawns to the center of the board, as the first two moves of the game. This left his pawn exposed and defenseless for the taking by Osriel, who checked again and again for trade possibilities, or even long-term possibilities. However, finding none, he put his horse forward and claimed the piece while Rudra was left wincing, as if he made a mistake. The game was an even trade for trade. However, Rudra was categorically progressing his opening pawn forward, and it was dangerously close to the enemy's base, and only two moves away to become a new queen. To stop its progress, Osriel positioned a bishop in its ongoing position, and a horse on his current position. The move was in Rudra's court now. However, Rudra chose to foolishly eat the horse with his queen, who had no cover whatsoever in a move that completely took Osriel off guard. Osriel now had an open chance to capture Rudra's queen, and his tired mind tried to scan for potential traps, but Rudra had seated the trap too deep for Osriel to realize. Shuffling. The angel took Rudra's queen as he said. Ha ha! Rookie. However, what he did not realize was that his bishop had moved, and was no longer covering the pawn's move forward. In Osriel's mind, he was going to position it in a way to kill the pawn in the next move. However, this was when Rudra placed his horse near Osriel's king and gave him a check. Osriel was stunned. The queen moving forward had thrown him off guard from his previous line of thought. The positioning of the horse was initially in such a way that it covered this very check. However, with Rudra taking that piece, that cover was blown. Groaning. And defenseless Osriel needed to move the king to the only safe place in the game as Ridra got a free pass to move his pawn forward now one step away from becoming the queen. Osriel's eyes widened when he realized Ridra's play however it was too late now. He had already lost when he took the bait to kill the queen, and now although he had superior pieces left on the board, Ridra had the 100% winning hand. Color quickly drained off Osriel's face, as the angel looked as pale as the white wings on his back, contemplating again and again as to if he could walk away from this situation. A devilish smile spread on Ridra's face, as he calmly stretched his shoulders and said, You have 20 seconds to make a move, or you lose automatically. Dot. Osriel grit his teeth so hard the sound could be heard crystal clear to Ridra. And the angel said in a low growl, How dare you insult me, mortal? Dot. However, none of his empty threats mattered as when he reluctantly made his move. Ridra finally managed to send his pawn off to the last row of enemy base and change it into a queen, giving Osriel the check. Having nowhere to wiggle it was also a checkmate as Ridra won the game against the angel. Ridra stood up and did some light stretching as he said, No disrespect, but you're not quite at my level when it comes to strategizing. Pay me with appropriate treasures, and if I'm free enough, I'll tutor you to become a better strategist in my free time. Dot. Osriel's face was like he wanted to devour Ridra like a hungry cannibal right here and now. However, the system contract was absolute, 
and he could not defy it no matter what his personal feelings were. He needed to announce to the world now that he, Osriel, the strategist of heaven lost to a mortal in a game of chess. Chapter 832 Getting the Treasures Osriel choked on his own saliva when he made the public announcement in one of the busiest markets in heaven that he Osriel lost a match of chess against a human. Audible gasps could be heard all across the marketplace as the angels judged Osriel to be a failure, and the worst part was that not many seemed to be genuinely shocked, and even those that were later waved it off saying that he was not an archangel now was he? This was exactly what Osriel hated. Being half-brother to those monsters made him extremely competitive and unable to take losses. However, the moment he did lose all his hard-earned reputation went down the drain because of it. Osriel detested Rudra a lot. Growing up with the mentality of those above me are better than me. Which by logic meant that those below me are worse than me. Osriel saw all other angels, and especially other races well below his level, which was why taking a loss by the hands of a human hurt his pride a lot. He could accept that Rudra was a bona fide genius by the way he played chess. Which was the last part that he worried about as the enemy genuinely had great skills. If it was Raphael, who he'd lost such an intense match to, he would be feeling enlightened at the moment however, because it was Rudra, who he'd lost to. It was simply humiliating. When Michael heard the news, he laughed his bum off, and teased Osriel non-stop about it. Which only added to the angel's irritation, as he went to retrieve his best consumable potions from his personal reserve. If irritation was the primary feeling that Osriel felt going into his personal vault, then absolute horror was what he felt coming out. Rudra's choice of words of 10 best consumable items in the system contract meant that the system evaluated which were the 10 best items to be picked, and while he could live with the loss of 8 of these items. The last two were priceless treasures he had saved for rainy days. One of them was a vial of Bindigar's placenta blood. It was collected thousands of years ago, when Bindigar was giving birth to the twin sun and moon, and it consisted of the most pure and nutrient-rich life blood in the entire three realms. Rumored to make a dead man as young as his prime. The blood was meant to be Osriel's ticket out of any near-death situation that he faced. Apparently it also gave some other benefits apart from anti-aging and near-death reversal. Which was why the system chose it as one of Rudra's rewards. Osriel had literally worked for the angel race for 840 years, until he accumulated enough merit to be exchanged for this vial. And now it was won by a mortal. However that was not even the worst item that he had won. It was the second item that bothered him the most. The second item was the fruit of the world tree. It took 1 million years to mature, and this one matured just 3 months ago, as Osriel bought it in an auction a month ago. The fruit costed a fortune, and it was rumored that the next closest fruit to maturity was 10. 000 years away, which was a long time away. The only reason why Osriel had not eaten the fruit himself even though he had it was because it could be refined into a miraculous pill by a heaven's great pill master. And Osriel wanted to maximize the positive effects of the fruit before consuming it. The pillmaster was currently working on a project in isolation, which was why Osriel had stored the fruit in his locker until the chance came. However, not in a million years would he have thought that there would be a situation where he would need to give up these two treasures to a mortal. If Osriel was only joking about killing Ridra before, he now considered it seriously. He would fight with God himself for these treasures much less a mortal however the system contract was a binding on his soul. And breaking the contract was not something he could afford even as a tier 6 angel as he handed over the treasures to Rudra with shaky hands. He thought about requesting the mortal to return the last two items in exchange for anything he wanted. However, before Osriel had a chance to say a word, Rudra started emptying the potions and fruits into his mouth, as if he was eating bread and beer as one priceless treasure went down his mouth after another. Co. And when Osriel saw Rudra drinking Bindigar's blood, as if he was gulping two silver wine, he felt dizzy from extreme anger accumulating in his body. However, the limit to his patience came when Rudra wastingly took a bite from the world tree's fruit and the pulpy and juicy fruit dripped with priceless drops of elixir onto the grass below. Osriel's mind blanked at that moment as he considered bending like a dog and licking the juices right off the plants. And if Rudra was not present, he would have unquestionably done it. However, in front of the mortal, it was just too embarrassing. You, you, you. Osriel wanted to say something, however, he passed away from anger before he could say it. It was the darkest day in history for the angel Osriel as he was rendered unconscious by a mortal without even using a single physical attack. Rudra on the other hand felt incredible power coming from within his body. And although it was extremely dangerous to do what he did by consuming so many elixirs at once, what he did not know was he had accidentally made an incredible solution by mixing them together, and now he was bound for an amazing transformation. Forward slash forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for Cervantes. Please thank him down below for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash.
Chapter 833 Rudra's Final Form Rudra felt like a torrent of life energy was swirling inside him. He felt like he was becoming a cultivator once more, and that every single cell in his body was transforming into something that was more powerful than his current being. He felt his tendons become more elastic yet more strong. He felt his muscles become way stronger than they were as if he was just a baby up till now, and suddenly they became the muscles of a grown man who gym for six hours a day. He felt his skin become smooth yet as durable as steel. Like even Serial would not be able to cut him open with a twig anymore, and would need to use a sword. He felt his mind throb as numbing pain surrounded his entire body, and although he himself could not see his current state, there was bright white light currently being emitted from his body, as if he was preparing to launch the Holy Lance. However this time around the holy power was not surrounding him. It came from within his own body. Rudra could hear the familiar beep of system notifications ringing in his ears. However the pain numbed his mind so much that when he opened his eyes to read the messages it appeared blurry to him, and he could not focus on the text without feeling like his mind suddenly became five kilograms heavier. Sprawling on the floor beside Osriel, Rudra clutched his head as he let out a cry of pain, but endured the pain as he knew it was good for his mind and body. Rudra found every bone and cell in his body to be healing. As his recently damaged mana pathway seemed to be mended, and its walls reinforced better, and stronger than before, as he felt a stream of pure hot mana flowing within him. Rudra did not realize it however. Raphael, Michael and Serio were all looking over him from the sky at this moment, while Binnegar too seemed to have rushed to this spot. Because of the sheer amount of power that Rudra was emitting. By mixing the essence of Dragon's Heart. With the blood of Binnegar's placenta, and the fruit of the world tree, Alongside seven supplementing treasures Rudra underwent a transformation that even the angels had never seen in their long lifetime. It was something primal, something close to how the angel race was born in the first place, and it was truly spectacular to watch. Rudra would have died at this stage of his transformation if not for Binnegar's blood in his body constantly healing him, as his cells destroyed themselves from the overflow of holy power. The amount of divine energy that Rudra was emitting currently was far higher than any of the divine moves that any angel could muster at once which was the very reason they had all felt alarmed and gathered inside Osriel's home in the first place. However Rudra did not die. And instead every time his entire body became reborn stronger and stronger until the flow of divine power started to ebb. Raphael felt incredibly proud of his disciple to have endured such pain while being conscious as it was a testament to his mental strength that he had helped cultivate. However for Rudra's own safety Raphael still knocked him out when he felt that the transformation was complete rushed to Binnegar's quarters for checks and stability. The goddess of life herself carefully mended his bone structure and his internal organs in a way that he could live a normal life after his transformation. He wasn't a human when he met him. How shocking is that? Serial said as he observed the operation taking place. I'm more interested in what he is now. What do we call someone like him? Is there another? Raphael asked curiously. Halfling for sure. I've seen Serial's bastard kids, with a familiar structure however they don't have his bone density or muscle structure. I mean look at those muscles they are almost as good as Osriel's. Michael said with a smile. Father always used to say. Our ancestors were just winged humans. Ha I never believed it until now. Raphael said with a smirk. So it's true. Anyone who can wield divine power is considered angel. Michael stated. Not wield. Produce themselves. Serial corrected. As the archangels bickered about the type of creature that Ribra was. Binyager completed the finishing touches to Rudra's body as she attached his newly formed wings to his spinal cord so that Rudra may have better stability in flight and better control over his new body part. In the end Binyager concluded, I think winged humans were born because of inbreeding between humans and a cross of dragons and phoenixes. Dot. The other archangels looked at her and said a collective, Oh dot. Binyager continued, Although I don't know for sure how he got hold of divine power. Was it because of my blood or the world tree that I don't know? But while the other elixirs he consumed were meant for strengthening his body and muscles and the like. The essence of dragon's heart and the preserved eggs from a phoenix's womb were the two key ingredients for him to form a wing after undergoing many mutations that destroyed his body from inside out until a stable combination was reached. If he did not consume my blood, he would have died for sure. However, the cells kept regenerating because of my healing powers. Although not the best mutation. Since his wings were attached to his brain through muscles, however had no bone structure to support the meaning at best, he would have been like a peacock who can fly small distances at most. With the surgery I performed it's now connected to his spine. Which means in theory, he is no different than the angels roaming the heaven. Maybe the fruit from the world tree gave him his ability to generate holy power. That I don't understand but he is definitely a half-human half-angel at this point in time. Dot. 
forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Cervantes91. Thank him in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 834, Half Angel. Rudra made a mental note to never mix treasure so recklessly again, and the only reason why he did it was because he realized that he was too lax while writing the system contract, and that Osriel could snatch the treasures back once he had handed them over, and not face any retribution. Not wanting to take such a chance. Or wait till Osriel figured it out. Rudra gulped everything down like a madman. And now his body hurt like hell. However, when Rudra analyzed his body, he could feel a constant tickling sensation on his back, as if something was itching his skin. And when he tried to touch his back, he felt an unusual feathery substance. Rudra jolted awake. Not because his palms touched a feathery substance. But because he could feel the touch of the palm through the feathery substance in his brain too. Calm down, halfling. You are fine. A soothing voice entered Rudra's ears and his panic subsided. Goddess Benigar came into focus, and Rudra calmly looked towards his back with his eyes of heaven to see that he had grown two gray wings. A lot of questions popped up in Rudra's mind. However, he chose to take the most practical way to gain the answers he desired and checked his log of system notifications. System notification you have consumed the treasure essence of black turtle shell. System notification you have consumed the treasure essence of golden dragon's heart. System notification you have consumed the treasure the essence of phoenix's womb. System notification you have consumed the treasure bone strengthening pill. System notification you have consumed the treasure mana cleansing pill. System notification you have consumed the divine treasure. Vinegar's placenta blood. Plus 100. Zero, zero, zero vitality. System notification you have consumed one constitution strengthening pill. Congratulations you have gained a special innate constitution. The half angel's frame. Error. 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 System notification the change in constitution has triggered a genetic mutation. Beginning cellular destruction. Error. 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 Bendiger's blood prevents cells from being destroyed. Beginning reconstruction. Race change detected possibility detected. Do you wish to change race to wing human? Yes. No. Error. 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 You have consumed the divine treasure the fruit of world tree. It fills your mana pathways with divine powers and further enriches your DNA. Plus 100 levels. Race change from wing human to half angel detected. Do you wish to proceed? Yoro error. System Yoro dead CD. System Goy G offline. The log ended after that error. Rudra wiped a bead of sweat from his forehead. This was extremely dangerous stuff as he saw it. His body literally underwent cellular destruction, and now his race was forcibly changed to something that was not human. Technically, he was not a human even before this race change however he was nearly a human too. He could be labeled as a genetically superior human or a superhuman at best however now, he was a half angel. With wings over his back and a changed body constitution. He was no longer a mere human. Ridra opened his stat panel to observe the changes to his body. Only to be shocked by what he saw. Player name. Shakuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title. Viscount of Hazelgrove Kingdom. Honorable Death Knight. Savior of Thal Village. Revered Medicine Master. Honorary Archbishop of the Church of Life. World Renowned. Heir of Augustus One Knight. Achiever. Dragon Slayer. King of the True Elite's Kingdom. First Cultivator. Supreme Overlord. Legendary Demon Slayer. Superior Human. Pope of the Church of Death. History Maker. Powerhouse. Explorer of Realms. Class, Death Knight Mythic. Subclass, Explosion Artist. Race Half Angel. Sexual Constitution Half Angel's Body. LVL, 720. Tier, 5. Stats. AGI, 84. 000, plus 84. 000. Vit, 172. 000. Int, 92. 000. STA, 101. 000. PHY, 84. 000. Mana 117. 000, plus 58. 500. HP, 83. 818. 000 slash 83. 818. 000. Unassigned stat points, 0. Hidden stats. Luck, 52 to 100. Charm, 99 slash 100. Infamy, 0 slash 100. Status, no abnormalities. Equipment, Lich's Ring. Concealer Mask. Sun God's Bracelet, Legendary. Death Knight's Black Shield. Pope's Token. King's Helmet, Legendary. Divine Beast Armor, Divine. Archangel Serial's Boots, Divine. Mana Stone, Ancient. Weapons, Grim Reaper. Siege Breaker. 
Skills, Darkness Bind. Summon Knight Durahel. Wind Slash. Critical Absorb. Berserk. Darkness Blast. Death Slash. Eyes of God. Earthquake. Critical Block. Blink. Stormbringer. Swift Retreat. Illusiony Multi Sword. Suppression Art. Three Point Stab. Twin Blade Hurricane. Twin Blade Cross Slash. Claymore. Overheard Slash. Solar Restore. Solar Flare. Solar Blast. Solar Descent. Solar Beam. Shadow Doppelgangers. Knight's Courage. Holy Lance Divine. One Leg Leap, Rare. Cloud Feet. Circumvent. Dance of Death, Divine. Object Manipulation. Gravity Manipulation, Divine. Space Buster Tier 5. Future Sight. Elite Blast, Self Created. Simple Counter, Divine. Class Specific Skills. Death Knight Summoning. Death Emperor's S Aura Suppression. Black Ratio. Enhanced Full Counter. Death Legion. Knight of the Empire Complete. Time Dilation. Undead Ruler. Mount, Grey Wolf. Pet, Furball, Divine Nine Tails. Rudra had went from level 620 to 720, and his vitality stat had gone up by 100. 000, 000 points somehow taking his HP from 53 million to a whopping 83 million. A new section called Race. And Constitution was added to his status bar, and all his other stats saw massive boosts too. Although he was still tier 5, and level 720, he could almost boast the same stats as Hades, when he had woken up from his slumber. Which meant that Rudra's power in a way rivaled a god, who had been weakened for two millennium. It was undoubtedly a massive achievement. As to what these changes meant for his future as a human. He did not know, but feeling the power coursing in his veins, he strongly felt that one way or another, Lucifer would be the one to taste the wrong end of the stick now. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the gift shower by Cervantes. That makes it four for the day. We will have one more in two three hours to complete today's quota forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 835 A Change in Powers. Rivera was signed into Omega. So he had no idea that currently four aliens were inside his office courtsy of the Universal Queen. Modifying his VR pod to support his increased powers. They were part of the Galactic Patrol and were sent to planet hashtag H2047 in response to a distress signal sent by the Queen. Although the patrol officers were a little surprised to be sent to a manless planet for a yellow level threat alert. But it just went to show that the being inside the pod was nothing ordinary if he had yellow grade clearance while being from a manless planet. It had been a difficult modification job. But the blueprint provided by the Universal Queen was enough to slowly complete it without errors. The human in the group said, The information on this planet shows that it's a human colony. However, it's still in the Omega phase. However, oddly, I don't have clearance to check the information of the being in this pod. The modifications we have done are not suitable for a human. But the intel suggests there is no other species on this planet. What do you guys think? Dot. The elf leader thought about it for a while then sighed. Vampires are not a part of Omega, right? I can't think of any other race or quest that can trigger a race change. Dot. The vampire in the group giggled as he said. Well, well, well. This information will sell for a lot on the gray market. Dot. The elf leader immediately rebuked. Don't even think about it. He may be the hope of this planet. While you vampires may not believe in karma. I do, and I don't want blood of billions on my soul. Dot. The vampire hissed at the elf, but stayed complacent. Galactic Patrol had strict Erchi and his future promotions depended on the captain giving him a nice recommendation. This was a feature of the Galactic Patrol. They were highly dependent on their seniors to like them for promotions. It was both a good and a bad system as on the plus side it kept ambitious yet Emerald Juniors in check. However it also promoted nepotism and made it hard for people with no backgrounds to rise through the ranks on merit alone. Let's wrap this up and leave. Contact the Cuber Corporation for the checkup on the being inside once he logs out. The human suggested and the others agreed as they left as quickly as they entered. The scary part was that these galactic patrol beings could teleport in and out of Ridra's room as if the walls around Ridra were not physical at all. And if it were not for the camera fitted in the room and the physical evidence of them doing modification on Ridra's pod, nobody would have ever known that aliens entered this planet. Meanwhile in Omega, Ridra was getting accustomed to his new wings and newfound power, and while he was glad that he could fly around even without gravity manipulation now, and that his strength and agility had increased greatly. He was more bothered by the fact that his armor he had taken from Omar no longer fitted him. The wings made it impossible to equip human armor, and hence Rudra was forced to roam armorless and bare-chested. His gray wings different to the pure white of the angels he gathered unnecessary attention wherever he flew. And it was not helping that Osriel kept popping up at random locations and gave him death stares. 
Rudra got the hang of his new body really quickly, and the best part was that Serial's basics such as retreating when facing an incoming attack and faster movement to break enemies' flow of attacks all came faster and more naturally to Rudra with his enhanced body. The best way to put it was that his body was a lot more aerodynamic now. And his wings were such that depending on how he bent, it helped him move 360 degrees across the floor. The only motion the wings were unable to make were flapping upwards instead of down to fly down vertically. But Rudra was fine with that deficit as gravity manipulation more than covered up for it. Since Osriel was not going to train him. Rudra had some free time which he chose to spend sparring with Serial, and for 10 more days, he improved exponentially while getting accustomed to his new body. Until finally 10 days later Michael showed up at Serial's home and took Rudra away for the next phase of his training. To be honest, Rudra was most excited about training with Michael as he was hailed as the strongest angel and the one who defeated and banished Lucifer from heaven all those years ago. Michael was a cool angel just like Serial, but he was by no means kind. Michael was the main character of the world in some ways as his natural charisma. His skills and his backing were all top-notch. Even his most casual actions seemed grand to an onlooker because of how he carried himself and his smile was worth a million diamonds. Thankfully, he did not have a rotten attitude like Osriel and was actually looking forward to teaching Rudra. Michael said, So, I expect you to have learned something worthwhile with Serial about defense. Now it's my turn to teach you and my speciality, as you may know, is offense. Since you even have wings on your back now, I expect you to keep up with me as I'm hoping to teach you the lesson of how to slay the devil. A 14-day course series by Archangel Michael. I like it. Has a nice ring to it, eh? Dot. Rudra beamed in joy. As he said, That's what I'm here for. Dot. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter 5 out of 5 for the day. Thanks Cervantes91 for this in the comments below. This concludes the bonuses for the day. We shall continue with 5 chapters again tomorrow and the day after. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 836 A Grand Plan. Karna's POV. Six months ago. Purple Haze City. Rudra had invited Karna to his palace gardens for a talk. Over the past few days Rudra had been abundantly busy with handling the guild and the church of death. Which was why Karna had seldom seen the man over the last few weeks. His invitation seemingly came out of nowhere, and it made Karna worry that he had maybe made a mistake or was due for a scolding from the guild master. Rudra usually never invited Karna alone for a talk. All guild matters were either discussed inside the elders meeting, or if Rudra did talk to Karna in private it would be about a plan or a role in an upcoming war. Since both those scenarios seemed unlikely at the moment, Karna started to think about all the mistakes he had made in the past two weeks, as it could be the only reason why he was summoned in private. Karna had a slight fear of Rudra. Although Rudra was his best friend, and he was not a spineless man who could be suppressed when he was not in the wrong, something about Rudra's anger scared him, as he had immense respect for the man and his power. However, when Rudra welcomed Karna to the palace gardens with a wide smile, Karna breathed a sigh of relief. It seemed as if he was not being called for a rebuke after all. Why did you call me here? Karna asked sounding a little curious and a little irritated. Rudra chuckled as he said, Straight to the point, eh? No, hello, Rudra. How are you? How is your day going? Dot. Karna rolled his eyes and said, What am I? Your wife. Dot. Rudra gave Karna a devilish grin and then shouted, Ruby. Honey! Dot. Karna paled immediately, as he hurried to cover Rudra's mouth with his hand. Rudra shrugged him off, and continued his sentence. Vice Guildmaster Karna sends his best regards. Dot. Karna exhaled as if he narrowly dodged a bullet. Then continued to give Rudra a fierce glare. Rudra coughed then said, I see you handle the guild well in my absence. Dot. Karna once again shrugged his shoulders and said, I swear if I ever see you disappear like this again, I'm gonna quit. This guild can't function without its guild master for too long. Dot. Rudra had been missing from action for a long time when he underwent his tier 5 promotion and it made things very difficult for Karna. It was a phase best left alone. Rudra nodded to Karna's words and said, I, a guild definitely needs a reliable guild master who is always present. Dot. Karna's eyes widened in shock when he heard this. Usually Rudra would never acknowledge the fact that the guild was dependent on him and always claim that it was the collection of the best players in the world who could sustain themselves in a self-sustaining ecosystem. Even without him, Karna said, It's good that you understand this. So tell me now, why did you really call me here? Dot. Rudra walked with a gentle smile on his face and said, The world's going to change after the next two years, you know. It won't be a game anymore. Dot. Karna nodded. The said, 
I? It won't be. It's scary, but I guess the elites will weather through it together. Dot. Rivera's smile broadened. I we will. However, not with me as the guildmaster. Dot. Carta stopped in his footsteps as he almost blanked out from Rudra's words. Stuttering, he said, You, you're quitting the elites? Dot. Rudra shook his head. I'm an elite. It's not something I can quit. It's a part of my existence. But I'm kind of quitting too. Because although I'll be a part of the guild, I won't be its guild master anymore. Dot. Carta frowned as he heard this. Nonsense. The guild will accept nobody else as their guild master. If you vacate the throne, let me see who dares to claim it. Dot. River replied you. You will be the next guild master. Dot. Karna's frown increased even further as he said. Not in a million years. No. Rivera put a patronizing hand over Karna's shoulders and said. Since day one. It has always been you and me. The guild members and I respect you the most. Although Sir Johnny is also a good candidate for the role of guild master. I think bureaucracy and diplomacy are not his strong suits. To be fair they are not mine either. The guild sees me more because it's me leading everyone into wars and dumb stuff. However, only us elders know how many alliances you have secured for the guild and how hard you work to mint an internal stability in all of the territories we control. In a way, you are working even harder than I am. Dot. Karna scratched his nose at the compliment. It oddly felt good coming from Rudra. Rudra continued, You are better than me, Karna. If you strip down my moves, my level advantage, my armor and my skills, and stand me in front of you in a fist-to-fist -fist fight. I'm not sure if I will win five to ten times against you. Whereas you are undoubtedly a better and stable leader with many good policies brewing in your head. I do feel at ease if you step up. Dot. Karna remained silent for a full solid minute then asked. Why are you stepping down though? Rivera breathed in deeply and said. I have a planet to care for my brother. The earth will soon be my people. And I cannot leave mankind if I'm stuck on just one section of the population can I? And to be fair I'm not sure if I can fill those shoes. Just like you may be feeling you're not sure to fill mine. But I guess both of us are going to have to try our best. Dot. Karna shook his head and said. I can do everything Ridra. You can remain the paper head. It's not a big deal we can. Ridra cut Karna off and said. A guild cannot be without its guild master for long remember. You said it yourself. This is not a discussion my friend. One year later once the war in hell is over. I will announce you as the guild master and vacate my position. It will be up to you then what you do with it. Dot. Karna sucked a breath of cold air. This was a lot for him to digest. But in the end, he replied meekly, Nobody will respect me like they respect you. Dot. Rudra refused to believe that, and said vigorously, Then earn their respect. Earn it. Lead them into battle like I do, and bring them glory. Make them forget they need Shikuni one night as their guild master, and you shall make me a happy and carefree man. Dot. Current day. Outside the fort of Merzipur. Karna recalled that day, and that talk with Rudra, as he stared at the tall walls of the fort. For now, the only people who knew about Rudra's eventual resignation were him and Rudra, and not one more soul. Secretly Karna hoped that Rudra never resigned. However, he also needed to be prepared for the inevitability of that day's arrival. Asmodeus had camped outside the fort however even after 40 days, he was unable to make enough progress to weaken the walls or strangle the supplies. Karna was growing tired of the demon's incompetence, and was thinking about taking charge of the situation with the elite legion under his command. If it were the Karna of the past, he would not have chosen to act under the circumstances. However, this Karna needed to learn to take charge of the guild in Ridra's absence and build credibility before the dreaded day eventually arrived. Hence, for the first time ever, Karna decided to march the elite legion into war out of his own free will as the acting commander of the forces. Chapter 837 Michael's Training Ridra was very excited to train with Michael. So when Michael asked him to draw his sword and prepare for a spar, Rudra instantly sprung into action and took a proper fighting stance. Unlike Serial who used a twig when he first battled Rudra, Michael started with a proper sword right off the bat. When Michael rushed towards Rudra, unlike his previous self who could not even look at the movement of the gods, Rudra could actually see him moving towards him in incredibly fast motion as Serial's train kicked in and he instantly leaped backwards. It happened in a split second. However, Michael soon caught up to the backward moving Rudra due to his superior speed and slashed his sword with power. Rudra put up both his swords to block Michael's attack, however, he was instantly swatted away like a fly by the angel's raw power, as he was sent flying for over 1,500 meters before he crashed and took fall and drag damage. However, instinctively, Rudra blocked the second strike from Michael as the angel was already upon him when he swung down his sword on Rudra and pummeled the poor human down into the ground 
as a massive crater formed around Rudra's body. Every inch of Rudra's body was still vibrating from blocking that attack and Rudra was sure that if he had not reinforced his body, by taking all those elixirs this attack would break at least a 100 bones in his body. Rudra's hands felt numb as although he was sure that nothing was broken he felt like his hands weighed a ton and were impossible to move around. Michael proceeded to calmly place a sword to his neck as he said, You die, dot. He proceeded to smile and give a hand to Rudra to stand up as he said, Actually, I expected this barrage to break all the bones in your body. So I already brought a healing potion with me. But shockingly you seem fine. Huh? I like it. Dot. Rudra furrowed his eyebrows when he heard this. However his mind went into contemplation mode as to why did he get beaten so badly in the battle before, and what could he have done differently. Michael continued, As you must be able to notice, you were not able to use Serial's counter on me, which was the primary reason why you lost this battle so easily. Rudra nodded. While fighting Serial, he had learned to run backwards to get himself in position to use counter. However Michael hit him so hard that counter never triggered and he lost the fight without it. Michael said, That's right. And it's because I'm way too powerful for you to handle. If I fought Serial with the same strategy and moves, we would currently be standing with me wasting a lot of stamina and not dealing a single point in damage to him. Dot. River went into deep thought. And after a while nodded to Michael. Michael said, My point is, if I can do it, then chances are Lucifer can do it too, because at least the way I remember it, we were pretty evenly matched even many eons ago, and he should still be this powerful if he's rolling over the underworld, I suppose. Which means you will be dead before you know it if you fight him like this. Rudra finally felt the grim reality sink in. After his power up, he had started to feel like maybe it was enough of an edge to fight Lucifer. However, maybe it was not. Michael continued, Don't get me wrong. Looking at how you're still in one piece, and pretty much at full HPID say you have a slight chance of being a genuine threat to Lucifer. However, it will depend completely on how much you can comprehend as to what I'm about to teach you. Dot. Rudra beamed visibly when he heard this. Coming from the only being to have ever defeated the devil, it gave him a lot of confidence boost. Michael said, Serial's fighting style is the best for you. With you being the underdog. However, what we need to dramatically increase is your firepower. Blocking is not enough if you want to withstand blows much stronger than your level where counter is rendered useless. Which is why for those scenarios you need to fight fire with fire and actively look for a clash against the incoming attack. If you flew 1,500 meters back this time, you will probably fly 50 meters back if you go at it with full strength. But in the end, that will be the only way to last for the next blow. The trick to being the devil at your level is to go with him toe to toe until by some miracle you get an opening big enough to deal significant damage. Because that's all you can do. Dot. Rudra analyzed Michael's words carefully and understood the hidden implications behind them. What Michael wanted to do at this moment was to keep Serial's fighting style as a basic frame and teach Rudra more advanced techniques upon it in hopes of getting him ready to finally face Lucifer. Although it was going to be challenging, Rudra felt confident that if Michael himself guided him and had a good 14 days of sparring with him, he could eventually level up his fighting game to a point where he might be able to stun Lucifer. He needed to evolve his purely defensive and counter style of fighting into a more robust combination of attacks and counters and defense to be prepared for all the possible situations that he would face when fighting someone of the caliber of Lucifer. However, just as he allowed his heart to have some slimmer of hope, Michael continued, Let's get done with this quickly because physical attacks are not all that Lucifer will use to beat you. He will use dark attacks too. A hell lot of them. Dot. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Cervantes. Please thank him in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 838 Michael's Training Let me ask you something fundamental about strength. What is the best measure of strength really? Michael asked Rudra amidst a sparring session. Rudra thought about it and then replied force. Michael nodded and said, Force one can generate. However I think a better answer is force generated per unit area. So basically pressure. Dot. Rudra agreed to this explanation and waited for Michael to continue. Think about breaking twigs with your hand. Imagine breaking a single twig. It's easy but breaking maybe 1,000 twigs bundled together is hard. It's not because the 1,000 twigs can withstand the force you are applying. It's because being 1,000 in number. These twigs are now distributing the applied pressure better. Dot. This made perfect sense to Rudra. It was science 101. If a blade is sharp enough it doesn't matter if it's one twig 100 twigs or an entire tree it can slash through the tree with ease. However imagine... If instead of slashing through the tree at a perfect 90 degrees angle, if you tried to chop it along an imperfect 25 degrees angle, then at best you would make a slight slice on its bark or at worst get your sword stuck in its woodwork. 
And that's the same principle that you need to understand about fighting. If you want to deal maximum damage, then you form a 90 degrees angle. You want to take minimum damage try for 2 5 degrees angle of contact. Dot. Michael proceeded to pressure Rudra, and the half-angel was forced to refine his techniques according to Michael's guidance, as he saw a rapid improvement when he started to defend at a certain angle and attack at another against the archangel. Good. Good. Now understand this. The faster you go, the more power you generate. The same reason why Serial makes you go backward to defend which is to lengthen the time of attack decreasing its force is what you need to reverse when attacking as you want to slam into your opponent as fast as possible to produce higher force. Dot. Rudra started to sweat profusely as he felt like his brain was about to explode. Already the fight against Michael was too fast for even tier 4 generals to see clearly as all the movements appeared to be a blur to an onlooker. However for Rudra to switch between retreating and advancing at the right time and sparring proved to be extremely taxing as missing a single best would cause him to instantly lose against Michael. Michael too understood that he was demanding too much of the mortal in too short of a time. However shockingly Rudra had the potential to keep up with Michael's demands even though he struggled a lot. The foundations that Raphael, Serial, and in a way Osriel helped build gave Rudra a platform to actually undergo Michael's training as after seven days of this hellish beatdown Rudra got the hang of the first two concepts that Michael taught him. Be swift when attacking. And make a 90 degrees angle for maximum damage. Be even swifter in retreating and lengthening the time of attack and meeting it by making a 2-5 degrees angle, while simultaneously judging which attacks needed to be met head-on, which were to be avoided, and which to be countered and defended at unimaginable speeds. The Archangel complimented Rudra and said, Good now let's understand how to handle dark attacks, and how to use the holy power in your body. Dot. Rudra seemed confused. He asked, Holy power in my body? Michael raised an eyebrow. He could see the immense amount of holy mana flowing within Rudra, but apparently, the host of the mana himself was not aware of what he was harboring inside him. Michael said, What's your weakest mana-based move? Rudra replied, Lightning Blast. Michael said, Try it now. Rudra summoned a lightning blast, and to his absolute shock, the tier 2 attack displayed far more destructive might than it was supposed to as it rivaled tier 3 might. Rudra seemed baffled as he asked, How? Michael pointed at him and said, You are half-angel now. Your body refines the mana from the world and stores it as holy mana naturally in your body. Holy mana is much stronger than normal mana giving all your mana attacks a 33-60% strength boost. Dot. Rudra seemed impressed as he looked at his own body in appreciation and said, That's cool. Dot. Michael nodded and said, It is. However, what we need to learn now is how to pump mana out of your mana pathways and use it to reinforce your body as that my friend is the ticket to actually defeating Lucifer. Dot. Michael's smile flickered away just for a moment as he spoke this, as if having a deja vu. However, it came back just as quickly, so that Rudra was left wondering what it was all about. Rudra was naturally here to learn, and he was willing to learn whatever Michael was going to teach him however Michael himself needed a moment to get rid of the memories of the origin of this technique. Meanwhile, Sophie and Max. Max had became an internet sensation, and his fame rose every passing day. He was labeled the next big thing, and many people expected great things from him, when the world's mana barrier eventually broke and the intergalactic integration started. Max was being seen as the hope of humanity's next generation, and some wished for him to transcend even his brother. The attention was both good and bad for Max, as although on one hand it was a massive confidence boost. On the other hand, he feared failure even more now, because he knew millions of eyes would be watching his every move. He chose to confide his emotions to Sophie. And the girl manipulated his feelings like a master. Sophie was 22 and quite elder to Max having realized the cruelty of the world much sooner. Ever since she realized that Rudra was against their relationship, she secretly started to poison Max against him. But it was a very hard job to do as Max would never entertain a single bad word about his brother. But when Max told her that he was afraid he could never surpass Rudra, she put a slightly dangerous thought in Max's mind. Sophie said, Of course you will surpass him. He was nothing when he was 17. You on the other hand have a net worth of 1.2 billion dollars. Although it won't be possible to surpass him in Omega. In life you have the better start and the better looks and a better girlfriend and better talents. Of course you will surpass him. Dot. If Max did not take these words to heart. It would all have been fine. However listening to the woman. Max questioned am I really better than Big Brother? Dot. It was an extremely dangerous seed of doubt to be planted in a young man. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the gift by Cervantes. Thank him in the comments for this one. This makes it March 5th for today. I will resume the last two in two three hours forward slash forward slash forward slash.
Chapter 839 A Tale of Long Ago Many many moons ago, when the archangels were still in their childhood years, the unnamed god, Mana has many forms and shows a close bond with the laws of the universe. However, mana is a crude form of fuel, and your bodies can be taught to refine this crude fuel into something much finer and much more efficient to convert to energy. The two best ways to refine this energy is holy mana and dark mana. Dot. The god then proceeded to produce holy mana in one of his hands, while producing dark mana in the other. Serial. Oh. Ooh, master. Can our bodies refine both the holy mana and the dark mana and make something like holy dark mana? Serial asked innocently, as he clapped both his hands together. The unnamed god smiled. He loved kids for this very reason. Their curiosity seemed refreshing to him. He shook his head and said, If I combine them, then they consume each other until both of them die. Dot. Lucifer. So which one of them is stronger? Is it the dark one or the holy one? The unnamed god. It depends on how you use them. Holy mana is symbiotic to life and hence is useful for reinforcing one's body. It can heal injuries in battle and give you an extra burst of strength. Whereas dark mana is symbiotic to death. To keep it within one's body is to kill oneself however it's also lethal when used as an attack. Dot. Michael. Ha. Huh? Then it settled me and my brothers will all use the holy mana and become the strongest. Lucifer. But big brother Michael, I want to use the darkness mana. Dot. Michael. Lucifer Baca. If your big brother tells you to choose holy mana, then you choose holy mana. No questions asked. Dot. Raphael. Lucifer Baca. Lucifer Baca. Serial. Kikichi Kikichi. A millennium later. The Holy War. Lucifer. I don't understand why you protect that old man Michael. Together the four of us can take him down. He has ruled this universe for long enough. It's time for us to take the throne now. Dot. Michael. Your arrogance blinds you, Lucifer. We don't cut the hand that feeds us. We are grateful to him and will always be loyal to him. Lucifer. You might be a dog Michael wagging his tail like an obedient puppy, but I'm not. I, Lucifer, refuse to live like a dog and will claim this world for himself. Starting now. Dot. Darkness mana erupted from Lucifer's body at a rapid rate, countering the holy mana reinforcement around the bodies of his brothers as they were momentarily caught off guard and weakened. Lucifer's wings turned from bright white to pitch black, and his white eyes turned to black as well with his pupils becoming a menacing red. Fa! Lucifer plunged a dagger into Michael's gut, and the archangel spat a mouthful of blood. Dark mana rapidly destroying the internals of his body, as Lucifer planned to murder him in cold blood. However, contrary to his expectations, Michael held onto his hand firmly, and did not allow him to pull the dagger back out as he contained him to one position, and allowed Raphael and Serial to mount the attacks. Michael said, so now you turn to darkness. I thought we decided as kids that we will walk the path of the holy mana. Dot. Lucifer. You decided it for me. I always wanted the dark path. But fret not because I have never walked it. Dot. The four archangels battled for three night and three days, and in the end Lucifer was banished from heaven after suffering many injuries at the hands of Michael, while Raphael sealed him in the underworld using his own life force. Modern day. As Michael taught Rudra the basics of mana reinforcement. He could not help but see a trace of his master teaching him the same moves as a kid. They were truly happy days for the archangel as the four brothers would play and learn from their master as they slowly built up their strength to ascend towards godhood. It had been a millennia since Michael missed Lucifer. The devil and the archangel had too much bad blood to have fond feelings for each other. But being the bigger brother Michael's heart could not help but ache at the thought that once upon a time they were indeed close. Even though his heart was a mess. He maintained full concentration in Rudra's training on the surface, as he guided Rudra through the basics of unlocking his true racial potential. You had your chance, brother. This life is not too bad after all. But you had to revolt against Master, didn't you? Ruling heaven wasn't enough. You wanted to rule all three realms, and then more. If only you weren't so ambitious. Today our family would still be together. Dot. Meanwhile, Karna. Karna used his brains to the fullest as after the fight for the city of Savanthi was over he sent elites to the bottom of the river on excavation missions, as over the last 40 days, he brought out nearly 1,200 cannons from sunken ships. Although the ships themselves became worthless. Karna dismantled the usable weapons from there, and after running a few simple tests with the lifestyle crew and doing little modifications, he transformed them into land cannons and dragged them to the periphery of the fort of Mirzapur. Thinking. Rethinking then thinking about his plan some more. Karna finally decided that blowing the southern wall of the fort apart was the best strategic location to enter and made a solid plan of attack. For two days, 
and two nights the southern wall of the fort of Mirzapur faced heavy bombardment, as well as constant attack from the elite generals from long range. Before the firm walls of the fort finally gave in to the constant damage, and crumpled to reveal an opening. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for Cervantes. Please thank him in the comments for this one. Please don't stop the flow of GT just because we already have bonus series ongoing. I will give out all the GT bonuses after tomorrow forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 840 Combat Training Complete On day 13 of his training with Michael Rudra finally heard a system prompt that told him he learned the skill basic mana reinforcement dot. Even though the skill was labeled as basic it displayed as legendary in his status screen and had a big impact on his fighting style. It basically boosted his attack and defense by about 20% which gave him the final edge that he needed to fight a god on a level where he could at least crawl back up to take another hit. Time and time again. Only on the final day. Day 14 did Rudra activate the future sight and the time dilation as he fought with Michael to get one serious spar in. And he genuinely tried his best to injure the god. He was successful in dealing 7% damage on the god after he unexpectedly spun out of his holy lance attack to scratch both of his legs with his two swords. It turned out to be a suicide attack though, as after he scratched Michael, he was immediately hit on the head hard by Michael's big hands. However, even though he was knocked out cold from that blast, Michael was surprised when he felt a holy lance impale his back as Ribra had already launched and corrected the trajectory of that attack to this exact spot using his future sight. So in the end, Ridra managed to chip off a meager 7% of Michael's HP. But even this feat shocked the god to his core. Michael was basically as strong as strong became for tier 6 beings. Unlike Lucifer, he was genuinely at the peak of tier 6 at 1800 plus level, and divinity packed in his bones. This halfling, he's terrifying, Michael concluded, as he saw Bindiger finally show up to take Ridra for the last and final phase of his training. However, there was a huge frown on Bindiger's face, as she looked at Michael and said, why is the kid always unconscious when I see him? Michael chuckled. Rudra really had caused a lot of stir in the kingdom of heaven. Although he was polite unlike the other two humans who have been here. In a way, he was even more of a troublemaker than they were. Binyager patted Rudra on the head, and his injuries recovered immediately, as he woke up as if waking from a gentle sleep. Rudra looked at the radiant face of Binyager, and concluded this must be a dream so he said, You are beautiful. Let me sleep some more goddess. As he tried to go back to sleep. It took Ridra only two seconds to realize that he should not really be dreaming, and he was jolted awake and ready for combat. But seeing Binyager and Michael beside him, he calmed down a bit. Ridra instantly regretted the words he had spoken as Binyager was blushing red beside him, as if she were a schoolgirl going mush on a compliment. Whereas Michael was staring into the distance, as if contemplating on giving Ridra a reward. Finally Michael said, Your other sword. Siegebreaker I believe you call it. Do you wish to trade that blade for the divine blade Excalibur? Dot. Ridra's eyes widened in shock. Excalibur was the first blade with which he had started playing Omega. Albeit, it was a dark gold grade copy. He had the fortune of using the blade once, when he was sent to hell on a mission by Michael. However now, the Archangel was genuinely asking if he wanted to wield the greatest blade ever made for mankind. Yes, Rudra answered without hesitation. Although his fighting style had now been attuned to Siege Breaker and changing swords, like this last minute, might be counterproductive but Ridra knew that Excalibur was worth it. Its sharpness aside the main advantage of using the blade was that it was indestructible, and the weight and size of the blade could be manipulated by the user. This size manipulation was the biggest perk of using the blade and of course it came with an insane damage and other innate abilities as well. Siege Breaker was a good blade in of itself. However not as good as Excalibur. Hence Ridra was undoubtedly making a profitable transaction by handing it over to the Archangel. Michael said, this blade was entrusted to me by Godus Binniger to be given to the champions of the Church of Light to aid them in their fight against the darkness. Today I give its possession to you, in hopes that it aids your cause of slaying the devil. Dot. Ridra took the blade and accepted the responsibility. With this, he had finally completed his combat training. Michael said, I'll be keeping an eye on your fight. Don't slander my name halfling. Not many can call themselves tutored personally by Archangel Michael. I have a reputation to Minton in the Middle Realm. Rudra nodded, I thank you for your tutelage master. Dot. Binyager who had finally recovered from the previous compliment said, Let's go. We only have 14 days to teach you the correct way of life. Dot. Rudra instantly frowned internally when he heard this. As the last thing he wanted to do was have lessons on philosophy. However, he did not let it show on his face as he silently followed Binyager to her residence. Binyager was a weird existence even in the kingdom of heaven. 
Rudra had walked the streets with three archangels before, however, never did the citizens go out of their way to bow to the archangels, as they would only gawk and point and smile at them. However, people would give a deep bow whenever they saw Binyagar. It was almost like Binyagar was the most important existence in all of heaven, although she was not a powerful goddess in terms of combat potential at all. What baffled Rudra was, what made someone who had no ability to defend themselves such a special being? It was an interesting question whose answer he was going to find pretty soon. Forward slash forward slash forward slash chapter 5 out of 5 for the gifts by Cervantes. Sorry it's later into the day. Today will also be a 5 chapter day. To complete the 5 chapter series that I promise forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 841 Karna's Victory Karna valiantly took charge of the elite legion and controlled the battlefield like a true guild master for the first time ever. Karna had long realized that the other commanders including Asmodeus were basically useless in leadership, as they lacked the appropriate battle experience of leading a legion of this size. Albeit talented in combat themselves and undoubtedly stronger than Karna. They were still not good enough leaders. Karna would try to not invoke trouble with people stronger than him if he could avoid it. However, he realized that if he truly wanted to fill Rudra's shoes someday, he needed to start showing more spine and call out the mistakes of others, even though it might not be pleasant on the ears. Karna said, Asmodeus, you're doing it wrong. Pull back the seventh squad and redirect the third squad to fight with the fifth one. They are taking too much heat from facing the winged demons and could use some long-range fighters. Dot! Asmodeus glared at Karna and said, Don't teach me how to rally my troops human. Shikuni is the only human I recognize as my equal. Dot! Many troops stopped fighting for a second to look at the two commanders fighting. Most of them expected Karna to back off after this insult by Asmodeus, but Karna did nothing of the sort. Karna drew his sword and pointed it at Asmodeus's throat as he said, Guildmaster Shakuni had appointed me as the commander of the first legion in his absence. The first legion commander outranks the second legion commander in combat, and refusing my command in war will be judged by Lord Hades as treason. Pull your damn troops back and redirect them where support is needed I won't repeat myself twice. Dot. Saying so Karna ran off into a fighting area that needed his support and was taking too much heat as Asmodeus was left gulping at the ferociousness displayed by the human. In the end, he complied to Karna's orders and soon Karna also started to operate the 5th Legion under Beelzebub as well. However, not only did Karna show excellent war Akuman, he also displayed superior fighting skills. Performing one of the best fight sequences of his life as he took down a tier 5 demon commander alongside Mediv. It was a truly exhilarating fight and also an important one that changed the momentum of the battle for the fort as soon the attacking forces started to overwhelm the defending ones. Karna showed up everywhere just like Ridra did and helped nudge the war effort in just the right direction so that maximum goals could be achieved with minimal casualties. The display of his strength was so dominant that by the end of the fight the troops across all legions were singing chants of his praises. His name reverberated across the fort of Merzipur as if he were an immortal god, and it truly felt exhilarating to him. However, while he expected his heart to feel content with thousands chanting his name, what he actually felt was a strong void in his heart, as if he missed the guild master being here. Somehow Karna felt he was happier in chanting these war chants and fighting in the direction the guild master nudged him towards, as he felt truly happy when he sang those chants. Just like the soldiers below, hearing his own chants was a humbling experience, but the burden that came with it was truly monumental. Only he knew how much pressure he had handled over the last 50 days to make this attack successful. Only he knew how many nights he had spent sleepless as he tried to think of a way that this plan of his was flawed. How his heart would panic when he saw a small piece of the puzzle not perform like he expected and how anxious he had been to fix that problem and nudge it towards the greater good. It was a truly exhausting experience, so much so that he wished nothing more than taking a few months off Omega just to recuperate from all the stress. Which just made him wonder how Rudra did what he did for all these years. There was never peace at the elite headquarters with one war, or another always looming over their heads. On an average, the elites fought two major wars every year, and mostly all of them had been at least this stressful. Finding newfound respect for Rudra, and what he did for all these years, Karna finally felt like he needed to start stepping up, so that Rudra could finally start stepping down, and take it easy for a while. While the cleanup and the aftermath of this fight was yet to be handled. One thing became clear for the army of death, and that was the fact that nothing blocked their way from here to the capital city anymore. Their campaign in hell was nearing its completion. As according to the scouts, Lucifer had already called for all his force from the west to amass a truly massive army behind the gates of the capital city. The endgame was near and according to the timeline Rudra had given them, they would start the raid on the capital city in nearly 20 days time, which would be the last and most glorious fight of their lives in Omega. Although Karna tried his best the fight against the fort was a heavily men-intensive fight 
as they needed to fight against well-fortified positions, and the only logical way to advance was to sacrifice troops in the process. However, even still the army of death was left with 84 million troops in the end, which was 4 million more than what Rudra deemed as the baseline to conquer the capital. And high-quality troops at that with only 14 million of the forces being tier 2, while the rest 70 million being tier 3. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Cervantes 91. Thank him in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 842 The Reason Why People Respect Binyager Binyager's home was the largest in the entire heaven. She had countless female angels working as her maids, and almost all of them seemed to have a strong disgust for Rudra, and the ones who did not showed exactly opposite emotions, and tried to constantly gain his attention and affection. Girls don't bother our guest, Binyager said. And with one word from Binyager, and all of them vanished into thin air. For five minutes Binyager and Rudra strolled in silence as Rudra noticed how just by stepping on grass Binyager made flowers bloom, or how her kindly stroking a leaf turned a plant into a tree, as he was mesmerized by the true extent of her powers. Binyager said, Are you chosen by my husband to be one of his champions? I sense the fire or rebirth within you. Dot. Rudra raised an eyebrow and said, Your husband? Binyager calmly replied, My husband? Humans have given him many names, but still he has no name. It's like none of the names have been worthy enough for his existence in this universe hence why the legend calls him the unnamed god. Dot. This was like the dozen time Rudra had heard legends about the unnamed god. However, he truly had no idea who he was, and he wasn't willing to reveal the existence of his rebirth to the goddess, so he just replied, The beast King Omar taught me the Nirvana flame. It does indeed burn strongly within my body. Dot. Binigar shook her head and said, A human, or whatever you were before being a half-angel, cannot learn the Nirvana flame. Neither can a phoenix bestow it upon you. Unless you are blessed by my husband, you cannot learn that move. Dot. Rudra chose to remain silent. He was not going to reveal anything to Binyager. I have not seen my husband in over fifty. Zero 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 years. Not as much as heard a whisper of his sound. Although I'm not his first wife, and not even his only wife. He should be more diligent as a husband, don't you think so? Binyager asked Rudra with a sweet smile. Rudra had no idea about the unnamed god's circumstances, or how he was as a man or a god. So not wanting to offend anyone, he once again chose silence. The Nirvana Flame. I taught him that move. I was a young maiden back then, and still practiced active combat as the battlefields felt my rage. However, after he tamed me, I have never blessed anyone with the skill to use this move or any of my combat moves. Binyager stated. Rudra looked surprised by the reveal of this information. No history books mention this past of Binyager. It seemed like an ancient time that was before the dawn of mankind. You know, halfling if I did ever pick up a sword again, I could cut Michael down with a single flick of my sword? Binyager asked Rudra in a sweet voice as Rudra choked on his own saliva when he heard that. You may think that my ramblings about peace and non-violence are madness. However, give me the chance to present my end of the story to you for once. Trust me, it won't disappoint. Rudra was not going to reject the tale of the goddess. Even he was interested in what kind of a being she was to command so much respect amongst the elites of heaven. I was called Binyager the Merciless, the bane of men and the widower of a million. A long time ago, I was not the goddess of light, but the destroyer of darkness. As I rid the three realms of every last one of the darkness spawn. Oh right, I forgot. You don't know about the era of the darkness spawn, do you? Dot. Rudra shook his head. The human history had forgotten a lot it seemed. It's expected. Humans came much later after all. Let me begin from the beginning then. Before humans. Before elves. Before the beasts roamed the world. This world was riddled with creatures of darkness that thrived in the lightless world and prevented the growth of any new life in the world. They were creatures who resembled the alligators of Middle Realm. However, they were black, had no scales, but a hideous body, and they were cannibals. This world was overwhelmed with the law of darkness during that age, and there was no plant or vegetation life, whereas dragons and phoenixes were hunted like chicken by these darkness spawn. I had thought during that age that what good are the darkness spawn for? They bully the weaker races, kill their own members for food, and the males are just interested in mating with any and every female they laid their eyes on. Hence I decided to destroy the world from its darkness. As I vowed to eliminate the darkness spawn and eradicate the law of darkness from the planet. Does my ambition seem justified to you? Dot. Rudra thought about it for a while and then nodded. It seemed like a noble enough cause and from how she portrayed the darkness spawn they needed to be killed for this world to be a better place. I was wrong. I did destroy the darkness born. Every last settlement of them. 
I brought light and life back to this world as plants bloomed and beast population blossomed. However, it took me a long time to realize that I had made the world a worse place to live in rather than a better one inch. Dot. Rudra looked a bit surprised. This story had now completely piqued his interest. The three ancient beast races, who had survived being slaughtered by the darkness spawn, like common cabbage, became the new enslavers of the world. They hunted the sheep and the cattle for food. They fought amongst themselves for land and resources, and the overall life density of the world went 25% lower than it was when the darkness spawn ruled the world. I had made the world a worse place to live in. Dot. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Cervantes91. Please thank him in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 843 Benyager's Past. It's not just the dragons that beasts that exhibit this behavior. No matter what kind of utopia I try to create, the law of the jungle always wins. This world is the survival of the fittest, and if you remove the apex predators of the world, then it's not like the herbivores live in utopia for the rest of their lives. The herbivores become the carnivores, and nature reestablishes order. Benyager sighed as she said this. Rudra could sympathize with her somehow. He had seen enough of the human society to realize that humans were in a way no different from the Shadowborns. There was a time when man was afraid and fearful of the tiger. Nobody dared to fight it much less enslave it. However, when man progressed, they captured and put this magnificent beast in zoos so that four-year-old children may gawk at it. It was utterly ridiculous. However, all the governments in the world approved of it. Men ate chicken. Men ate beef. Men ate pretty much whatever man could eat without feeling any guilt over the life lost as in the eyes of men, they are lesser beasts. They are not intelligent enough, and their deaths mean nothing in the scale of the world. However, if one changes perspectives, maybe the lives of humans are worthless when viewed from the position of the gods. If they indulge themselves in such carnal pleasures of torturing the lesser beings like humans, then the humans would curse them, pray for their demise, and yet it would make no difference to them, as the humans were just too weak to affect the larger scale of things. Compassion and understanding one another is the only way to break this chain of destruction. The reason why I laid down my weapons, and the reason why I preach non-violence in all my followers is because only if you are compassionate to everything below you and treat life itself with innate value. You cannot truly ever break this vicious cycle of cruelty that we are stuck in. To create a true utopia, every race must understand one another and respect each other to mint in standing peace and harmony. Irrespective of strength, Vinegar said a bit flustered and breathless. Rudra felt something in his heart move. If he thought about it deeply enough, Vinegar was not wrong. And her ideals were extremely noble. However, implementing her ideals was probably close to impossible. Even if somehow humans became non-violent. Unless nobody in the middle realm hunted humans, or took advantage of the fact that they would not fight back. It was impossible for humans to lay down all weapons, and still hope for the best. It was a recipe for racial extermination. Even if a handful of people amongst humans became non-violent, and tried to understand those around them. Such a nation would be run over by barbarians, or people with ambition to capture and profit off its resources, and the nation's population will either end up dead or enslaved. Vinegar's ideals were noble, but she was just delusional if she thought it could work in reality. That's not how nature sustained its ecosystem, and going against nature itself was impossible. Michael probably realized that which was why the Church of Light was a good force with kindness at their heart however not really a true non-violent bunch with no active forces. Rudra replied for the first time ever. There is no utopia. Goddess Benyager. There is just a greater good that we can strive for. The fall of one race is the rise of another, and to strive for perfection is a delusional dream. I suggest you try more humble targets. Vinegar shook her head and said, You sound like my husband, you know. This is exactly what he used to tell me. But no, someone has to be the fool and aim for perfection. Because if even I, the goddess of life, don't value every life equally, who will? I do condone your killing of Lucifer if there is an alternative that sees both of you walk alive. However, I also understand that Lucifer has killed millions and will kill a million more if not stopped. So while I won't stop you, I will also not support you. A peaceful solution is the only way to truly come out of a conflict a winner. The moment you draw your weapon you have already lost. Dot. Rudra did not agree or disagree with Bindiger. He did feel he gained new perspective in life with this decision. Bindiger said, so what I will offer you for your training and my debt to Hades is knowledge. Knowledge about the three realms and all of its immense secrets. Whatever you wish to know, I will tell you. So fire away, halfling. Dot. Rudra thought for a while and then asked his first question to Benyager and soon the second and the third. There were interesting bits of information he got from her about how she was not the only one capable of creating life and that Hades was too. Death and life magic were more similar than Rudra thought 
and he was shocked to know that fundamentally life was just an absence of death. Death was the natural state of things. A peaceful haven meant to be undisturbed. Whereas life was a chaotic roller coaster. Just like how Benyager could give life. Hades could chase away death. Essentially meaning he had the same power of rebirth and bestowing life like Benyager. Some more interesting things that Rudra learnt were that about the barrier to reaching godhood. A mortal became a god when he became an icon for a particular phenomenon. The god of sun. The goddess of moon. The god of death and so on. Everyone was a god of something and not just a god. Which was why neither Omar nor the archangels were truly gods. They were lacking their icons and hence could not advance to tier 7 amongst a million other restrictions. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the gift by Cervantes. Thank him in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 844 A New Perspective, Taking Leave. Rudra gained new perspective about the gods once Benyager explained the secret to ascend to tier 7. It was not something he would need for a very very long time and probably he would never reach that threshold in this life. But it was invaluable information nonetheless and one that could sell for a crazy amount of money in Sigma should he ever find the need. For the next few days, Benyager taught Rudra about the history of various races and their origins as well as fundamentals of alchemy and theory of life. Although it was not combat training or stuff that could help him defeat Lucifer, it was an invaluable trove of knowledge that would give Rudra a huge head start going into Sigma. Rudra very much doubted the value of the time he would spend with Benyager before his 14 days started however once they ended, he was actually feeling like 14 days were too short of a time. The things he learned with her were absolutely amazing and it gave him a newfound perspective in life that made him feel anchored to his goals much better than before. As Rudra's time to depart came, all four angels including Osriel and Benyager came to see him off. And Sariel even hugged him and wished him the best before opening a portal for his return. Rudra's walked through the portal with zero hesitation. However, he had a smile on his face as he left heaven. He had learned a lot in his time here and improved beyond leap and bounds. Now it was finally time to put this thing to bed and bring the fight to Lucifer. As Rudra entered the barren lands of hell once more teleporting within the camp of the army of death, he felt a stinging sensation on his skin as if it were revolted by the environment. It was his half-angel side that was revolted by the atmosphere in hell. His entry alarmed a lot of beings as the demon commanders, as well as Omar walked out to see who was the unknown powerful angel to have entered the camp. And everyone was shocked to see that it was Rudra. The gray angelic wings on his back and a robust body structure made him look like a heavenly being. Which alongside his newfound dark angel armor made him look like an absolute gangster. Omar inspected Rudra's progress and his eyes kept staring at his boots before a smile broke out on his face as he said. So I guess I won't have to save you anymore eh? Dot. Rudra returned the bright greeting and said, no, dot. As Rudra went with Omar to meet Hades, the other commanders and players kept gawking at his new wings as within seconds it was all over the forums. Rudra was currently the most popular celebrity in the world and any news regarding him became popular within split seconds, garnering millions upon millions of views. However, the leader of the elites cared for nothing. As after meeting with Hades and reporting his progress, he held a meeting with Karna to understand the situation of troops and was extremely pleased to hear that Karna took charge and successfully captured the fort of Mirzapur. The duo talked for a while regarding army size and future plans before Rudra logging out of Omega for the last time before the big fight. Rudra knew he needed to meet Naomi once to check on her situation. Because it will take him 20-25 days before he could see her again now, and he did not want to dive into the madness of the capital fight before at least spending one last day with her in real life. Meanwhile Max, Max was currently attempting his tier 3 promotion test after he reached the peak of tier 2. Everything seemed to be going well for him as the Assassin's Hall was evaluating his performance and he seemed to clear the first two stages of the test easily. On the third stage however, he was to sit in a room and look at a scripture in front of him and figure something out. And the Assassins did not tell him what. The room was actually filled to the brim with mana and to pass the test Max needed to learn how to cycle mana once. However, no matter how easily Max understood the diagram. Without his body feeling an ounce of mana, it was impossible for him to understand what to do. Max sat there for 36 hours trying to figure out what to do. He searched every corner of the room. Every nook, every cranny. Searched for a false tile or a secret room. However, there was nothing to be found there. After 36 hours, an elder came in and offered to give him a hint if he accepted a lesser grade for promotion and Max hesitated. However, once he realized that it did not matter anymore what evaluation he got for promotion. He did not need to impress any guilds or go much further. Just raising the tier was good enough. So he accepted the help and the elder explained the process. The elder said, 
This room has 100 times the concentration of mana than in nature. In here you should focus on the mana around you and learn to cycle it within your body as shown in the diagram in front of you. You will be considered to have passed the test if you can successfully cycle it once. Dot. Max seemed enlightened. He had not yet tried to feel mana around him, and this was a new revelation. Max closed his eyes and tried to feel something around him when the elder said, This is a huge opportunity, young man. Learn this cycling technique perfectly, and it will take you a long way in life. Every profession has their own cycling technique. The one for the assassins nourishes your body in a way that it becomes lighter and more flexible, so that you can run fast and soundlessly while being able to perform athletic feats no common man can. Use this opportunity well. Dot. Max felt excited. He had read about this in the forums. Apparently, this was how many of those who became cultivators after reaching tier 4 started. Maybe if he perfected it, he too could become a cultivator. Closing his eyes, Max started to breathe deeply as he tried to feel the man around him. Little did he know that all his mana veins were blocked, and no matter how hard he was going to try, he would never be able to feel an ounce of mana. Meanwhile, real world, when Ridra saw the familiar low green light of his pot, he pressed eject to open the thing. However, he was immediately stung by the smell of dead skin and blood as Ridra panicked as he went out of his pod. Ridra prayed and prayed that he did not want to feel wings on his back. But alas, he did. He had wings on his back now. The same gray shade as he looked remarkably different from what he did just a few days ago. No! 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 Ridra said. He did not wish to become a half-angel in the real world. This was absolutely ridiculous. Just what the hell was this game to alter his DNA and body in real life? Rudra then noticed his pod, and saw how it had many modifications done to it which he did not recognize. His pod had went from being a coffin, to a full-blown behemoth of a container, with alien-looking technology. What the hell is going on here? Security. Security. Rudra called for security, as although he did not open his room, he asked them if someone had entered his office while he was playing Omega. But they replied that nobody had. Rudra immediately searched the forums for alien sightings. But there was nothing groundbreaking. Just useless sh asterisk asterisk dot. It only struck Rudra later to check his room's security footage, and only when he saw the Galactic Patrol walk straight through his room's walls, as if they did not even exist. Did he finally realize the universe he was truly living in? For one hour Rudra watched them work and talk. As they modified his gaming pod, as Rudra noted down parts of their conversation trying to gain some context into the wider universe. When it was revealed that one of them was a vampire, and one of them was an elf. Rudra was truly strike breathless for a moment. He had always suspected that there must be mythical beasts in the wider universe, however his first time seeing them was still exhilarating. Although Rudra swore to tell this incident to noon. Not even his wife for the stability and security of the planet in these last few days. There was one thing he realized for sure, and that was that he was going to have a really really tough time ahead, even after Omega. Forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Anton Kartunin for 13. 000, 000 coins in gifts total. I'm truly humbled by your patronage and extend my heartfelt gratitude for this support. Bonus series for this gifting will be given tomorrow. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 845 Max can't use mana. Max tried to focus on the mana around him. And it should have been easy considering there was 100 times the mana in this room than compared to the natural environment. However, no matter how hard Max tried, he could not feel a thing. For the first two hours Max thought he would eventually get the hang of it. However he did not. After hour three Max's senses went into super drive, as he could feel the disturbance in the air caused by his light breathing. However still not feel a single drop of mana. Eventually Max tried and tried. Making imaginary forces travel within his body alongside the mana path again and again. However when even after six hours of trying continuously, he could not achieve breakthrough Max felt disheartened and his pish began to get affected. In the end after 10 hours of trying non-stop Max decided that he was better of researching about this first and trying this promotion test another day. As he had already reached the threshold for tier 3 and knew how to pass other tests. Hence deciding to quit the tier promotion Max failed the test and logged out of the game and dejectedly researched the forums for tips and news. Even still Max thought he was missing something fundamental about the understanding of mana which is why he failed. But never in his dreams could he have imagined that he was actually manaless taught. Spending hours trying to see influencers explaining how to pass the mana room test. Max took notes on how the first experience with mana felt to the other people. And how they were able to understand this mysterious force. Max also realized that mana was going to be an important force going into the future of Omega when the mana barrier breaks and Earth is integrated into the mana universe. Which is why it was absolutely imperative that Max learn how to control mana. 
Max would have continued to research on the mana project for longer however he was interrupted by a sexy picture by his girlfriend Sophie, who was inviting him for a lovey-dovey session. On his way out, Max watched Rudra drive the car into the garage, and for a brief moment, the two brothers locked eyes. It was the first time since their fight that the two were face to face. However, Max chose to not greet his brother. Plugging his earphones into his head and pulling up his hoodie, Max walked off without greeting Rudra as the leader of the elites watched him leave with an expressionless face. Angry, Rudra slammed the door of his car shut, and the force with which he did so caused the car to slam into the side of the garage and break the garage wall apart. As the airbags within were deployed, an alarm started to blare. Rudra looked at his hands for a second as he was reminded of the immense power within them. He needed to have better control over his emotions, because a little fit of anger like this could potentially hurt someone precious to him if he did not control it. The noise startled Naomi who with an enormous bulge on her belly walked out of the house barefooted. Looking shocked when she saw the destruction in the garage and her husband stand there with gray wings on his back. However all questions were put aside as she could see the exhaustion on her husband's face as she slowly snuggled up to him and wrapped him in a hug. Rudra also hugged her back gently. His wings unconsciously wrapping around Naomi making her feel like she was cuddling a cozy blanket as she smiled and melted into Rudra's embrace. Wings! Naomi asked surprised. Wings! Rudra replied exhaling sharply. Naomi asked no further questions as she knew Rudra would eventually explain it to her in his own time. For her Rudra's appearance did not matter much until he was the same person inside. Which is why she did not react shockingly to his transformation. Rudra heard ambulance and police sirens in the distance. Apparently they were here to check on the emergency signal that the car sent out due to the crash. However, Rudra waved them off from a distance, and nobody dared to come closer once he signaled them to leave. Holding his wife's hand, Rudra started walking into the house. As Naomi peeked at the car and asked, Max? Dot. Rudra nodded and said, Max. This time, it was Naomi's turn to exhale sharply. She loved the kid almost as much as Rudra did, and she knew that at heart Max was a very good child. However, his behavior lately was turning into that of a typically problematic teenager, and Naomi had a good idea as to why. Naomi initially tried to be nice to Sophie, and she even brought her out for shopping after Rudra's fight with Max. Trying to figure out if the girl was worth fighting for and talking in a positive light to Rudra. However, it did not take Naomi long to realize that she was an extremely toxic and fake girl. While on the surface, she was the most energetic and bubbly girl who would shower Naomi with compliments at everything she tried and was amiable and intelligent to talk to. Her fatal flaw was that she did not have an ounce of kindness within her and Naomi noticed that by her behavior towards the staff. Although she was kind to Naomi, she was beyond cold to staff making their jobs difficult and talking down to them as if she owned them and the seven generations of their families. Naomi had a very simple way of gauging people, which was to see how they treated those below them. Rudra was a rare person who treated those below and above him equally. He would not bow to a higher power, and he would not make a lower person kneel to him. P. He would be kind to those who were kind to him and kind to those who were new to him. Only people who came to his wrong side would see his coldness and nobody else. Max was also the same sweet kid. However, he was too smitten with Sophie, who was not. While Rudra was away, Max met with his girlfriend often and on a daily basis. Sometimes not even coming back home, and it was growing into a real problem. Forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Rule 2010 for the 5,000 coin magic castle. I'm extremely grateful for the patronage and will provide the appropriate bonus soon. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 846 A Place to Call Home For more than 40 minutes after coming home, Rudra just listened to the kicks and the heartbeats of his twins growing in Naomi's stomach. The amount of stress he was currently in with the final war against Lucifer looming over his head was incredible. Although he had done everything right in the build-up to the final fight and secured over 70% odds of winning, it was still not a guaranteed victory and there was a still a decent chance that he could fail if it was just him and his guild. Maybe he could walk the failure off and build himself up to try another day. But while he could tell Noon about it, in his heart he knew that the fate of humanity depended on him and the outcome of this war. Only more dangerous adventures loomed over Rudra's head even if he won this war, and finally the constant life of fighting started to show its toll on the big man as for once he realized that there was absolutely no end to his struggles. What's up with you today, big man? Naomi asked as he stroked Rudra's hair gently. Rudra did not speak. But Naomi understood the meaning of his silence. After a while Naomi said, You know, sometimes I wonder what our kids would look like. How they would grow up to be. What would they call us and little stuff like that. Dot. A smile broke up on Rudra's face. 
Sometimes he wondered that too. Naomi continued. I wonder if they would be safe in the big bad world. Actually, the big bad universe, I should say now. And to be honest, it can be overwhelming and scary sometimes. Dot. River's smile vanished. What Naomi said was absolutely true. How would the universe treat his children? But I'm not too worried, you know. Because I know that their father will give them the best and happiest atmosphere to grow in. No matter what the world is outside. Because he can hold the sky up alone for them to have a happy world to live in. Dot. Rudra took in deep breaths. What Naomi said was true. For his children, he would indeed create the best and happiest world no matter what. So if you feel tired, or demotivated, or feel like why am I doing what I'm doing, like you are feeling today, just know that four lives of little Max, wifey Naomi, and two kiddos depend on how strong the man of the house is. Naomi said, as she consoled the demons in Rudra's heart. There was a long period of silence before Ridra got back up and stretched his body with a smile as he said. You got me. Even though I said nothing. You got me. Dot. Of course I got you dummy. I'm your wife after all. Naomi said with a grin. Ridra had to power through. He had to defeat Lucifer. And he had to safeguard planet Earth. Not because he should do that as a responsible citizen of Earth. Because he had to do it to ensure that his family grew in a worry-free place that they could call home. Not only his family but the family of all his guild members as well, as well as all those who depended on him in Japan. Someone needed to take up the helm and be firm and guide humanity into a promising future, even though it was a thankless job to do. Because if even the best of the race would not step up to the task who will, closing his eyes Rudra made a firm resolve. Lucifer had Tio die. The Church of Darkness had to dissolve and Hades had Tio become the protector and patron of this planet. There was no other way around this. Rudra no longer trusted Binyager's non-violent faction, and even though he trusted it to be a noble cause, he did not trust the future of the planet to a force that could not defend itself. Hades was by no means a perfect being to follow. However, he was a much better choice than Binyager for sure. And Rudra had a guaranteed spot of Biakming the fifth commander in his actual legion if he could deliver his promise in Omega. As Rudra left his home for one last time after swearing to come back to Naomi as fast as he could after defeating Lucifer. He found out that his wife was much stronger than he had expected. Instead of crying or making a sad face when she saw her out, she instead commanded Rudra to either come home victorious or not come back at all, as Rudra felt oddly motivated from hearing her aggression. As he drove back to the elite tower, Rudra went into a zone where his mind started to think strategies better than a supercomputer could process math problems. This visit to reality had reminded him of his reason to fight, and the reason that he could not afford to lose this war. Rudra fought for all he was, and all he had become after his rebirth. He fought because he wanted to create a better world for humans, carving a place for them in this universe. He fought for his guild members and their families, as well as for Ethan Gray and the people depending on him in the upside. He fought for justice and his overwhelming hate for the despicable devil Lucifer. He fought for his family, Naomi, Max and the kids. He fought for the hope of a bright future, for humans to live with dignity and without the fear of slavery. But most importantly, he fought for the right to call planet Earth his home. Forward slash forward slash forward slash this chapter is sponsored by the patronage of Anton Kartunen. Please thank him in the comments for this one. This is chapter 2 for the day, and depending on how much I can write, there will be one two more chapters for the day. I hope you guys enjoy. We dive straight into the war action from the next chapter forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 847 in his element. The War Room. The War Room, this time was especially tense and jam-packed. It had many key characters of the war present, and there was pin-drop silence as nobody even dared to breathe too loud fearing they might disturb Ridra's thought process. Towards the head of the war table, Omar and Hades sat silently sipping expensive wine as a servant constantly refilled their glasses. They had a very refined way of drinking their wine because of maybe thousands of years of drinking experience. Like elegant nobles, they would swirl the wine around and then take a sip of the exotic flavor after inhaling the aroma first. Their drinking was so refined that Beelzebub was visibly salivating to drink some of that wine as drool dripped from his face. All five commanders were present in the war room. And alongside them sat Johnny English and Karna. Apparently both of them had earned their place in the war room because of their heroics, and upon Ridra's invitation in the corner of the room stood nearly thirty tier four generals, who Ridra deemed important enough to brief the plan. While the gods enjoyed their drinks, and the other commanders blankly started at the map of the terrain, looking at how much territory they had gained and how much time. The others nervously shifted their weight from feet to feet however tried to mint in a straight face and made no sound as the main character of the room clutched his head and racked his brains. Unlike other meetings where everyone gave some input or the other. By the time 
the final fight rolled around everyone knew who was basically running the show now. And everyone understood that any plan would be infinitely better if Ridra crafted it untainted from external pollution. As his brain was the single biggest asset that the army of death had. Rudra's wings were currently a viral sensation globally. Everyone wanted to know how he converted his race as it was one thing that was deemed to be impossible in Omega. However, Rudra obviously did not care about all the buzz surrounding him at all, with him being completely occupied with the fighting in hell. Finally, after two hours of awkward silence, Rudra finally broke the ice as he said, All right, listen up. This is the plan. Dot. Everyone immediately jolted straight as they looked at Rudra with absolute attention, and even the gods put their chalices aside as they leaned towards the blackboard that had the map drawn as Rudra painted on it with a paintbrush. Lucifer has called back his troops from the western borders, however we have received news that after the fall of the city of Savanthi, the devil's terror amongst his subordinates had reduced and many have decided to not send aid to the devil betting on the outcome that he will lose this war. If I'm being honest, that is a really intelligent bet to be made, Rudra said giving the other context of the situation, as the Tier 4 generals felt enlightened by this new piece of information. Even so, the devil has a standing army of 145 million troops, of which 75 million are Tier 1 and 2, and only 70 million are Tier 3, with a total of 1,200 Tier 4 generals and 6 Tier 5 commanders, and he himself at Tier 6. Rudra broke down the enemy numbers reported by multiple scouts, and confirmed by his god's eyes. Us, on the other hand, have nearly 80 million Tier 3 soldiers, 240 Tier 4 generals, 5 Tier 5 commanders, but we have two gods with us. Rudra deliberately did not mention the Tier 2 troops they had, because he did not want to dampen the morale. It's not overwhelmingly large of a disparity if we break it down, and to be fair, I was prepared for much worse. Rudra gave them his analysis of the situation, albeit a little optimistic version of it. The biggest problem right now laid in the fact that the enemy had 1,200 Tier 4 generals which were nearly six times as much as the Army of Death did. However, Rudra was confident in dealing with all six of the Tier 5 commanders should the need arise, and confident in beating them all down with his strength. Having already killed the number one and number two commander of the enemy forces, and having gotten significantly stronger since, Rudra had much more confidence in his own skills, which left all the other Tier 5 generals to balance the odds out. Rudra hoped that even though they would not be able to neutralize all of the enemy Tier 4 generals, they could still prolong the battle until Lucifer was slain. As the key to winning this war was not routing the enemy, but slaying the devil. As all of you know, the goal in this war is not to slay the demon kind. The goal here is to kill the devil Lucifer. Thankfully for all of us present here, that is the job of the two gods sitting amongst us, and not our own job, and trust me when I say this. Against the two of them, the devil is at a disadvantage, Rivera said with conviction, his passion slowly energizing everyone in the room. The goal this time is to push the enemy forces back, even at the cost of our lives, and create an opening for the gods to take down Lucifer and assist them as best as we can. The goal is to not let the demon's minions interfere as the gods take the devil apart and make him pay for all the crimes against humanity and the demon kind over the past 2,000 years, and I swear, he shall pay. Dot. Rivera's passion spread like wildfire in the room, and everyone instantly became passionate to kill the devil. Rivera had a certain charm that way. He was an eloquent speaker. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Antine Cartoon and please thank him in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash chapter 848 the plan. Once Ridra felt the atmosphere within the room to come to a point of boiling emotions, he quickly revealed the potential dangers of the plan to deflate the enhanced emotions. Ridra said, Let's now talk about the critical points for our plan to succeed. The overall goal of the army is to create an opening for the gods to engage and kill Lucifer without any external interference. For this our plan will need to work in five notable stages. Stage 1 we need to bring down the massive walls of the capital. Depending on the willingness of the gods here it can be the easiest step or the hardest one. Dot. Rudra looked at Hades and Omar for this answer. If the gods were willing to unleash a single tier 6 move. The wall could be destroyed within split seconds. However should they not be interested in wasting their powers on this step. It would be up to the army to bring the wall down. Hades thought about Rudra's words for a while and after having a small chat with Omar declared, Reaching at least one second of the wall is my responsibility. The army need not worry about this one. Dot. A smile broke out on Ridra's face as he heard this. Hades breaking the wall down solved a lot of problems for Ridra, and to be fair it was the best path forward. For Hades breaking the wall really did not take much effort as compared to the rest of the army, who needed to rely on tools and explosions, and the like to punch a hole in the wall. 
This was the safest way to reduce unnecessary casualties before the actual fighting began. Ridra continued. Be grateful, men. Lord Hades is taking care of step one for us. Which means the enemy loses anywhere from one four million troops easy, and we don't even need to bat an eyelid. But then, I expect the rest of us to really bring the fight to those inside the city like we have never brought a fight before. Flood the damned streets of the capital and force the devil to come out of the palace he so wrongfully occupies. That will be stage two of our plan. Dot. Ridra paused and let that information sink in as he elaborated. We attack in formation. Tight units of attack and cover, and we form balanced groups to be small squadron containing various classes to have a versatile attacking approach. We spread enemy forces thin and have reasonable firepower on all sides. I will share the squadron distribution to all of you commanders soon. Dot. Saying so Rudra took up his brush and started to draw on the board. Phase 3 is the most important phase in this plan, and the only one where things can go seriously wrong for us. This is the phase where I'd expect the gods to have engaged in active combat, and this guy being ripped to pieces. However, this is where our numbers, and tier 4 generals' inferiority will start showing as our forces will be started to be pushed back. The key here is to not be pushed back too much and keep the generals and commanders engaged until Lucifer is dead. Because if the intensity of the attack slowed down then Lucifer will get reinforcements and his demise would slow down. And that cannot be permitted to happen. Dot. Everyone felt their stomachs clench in fear. Nobody wanted to be the squadron leader whose squadron could not handle the heat and let a few generals skip by. Everyone understood the seriousness of this phase of the plan and solemnly swore internally to try their absolute best. Stage 3 also has another flaw. But that's for the gods to worry. Rudra said, as he turned to face Hades and Omar. Rudra said, I don't believe Lucifer will come out to fight you both in open battle without some trick under his sleeve. If the devil did not think he could win this fight, he would not be coming out to fight. The fact that he is still in the capital shows that he has the confidence to take both of you down together. If you guys fall, we are as good as dead. Dot. A grim reality was presented by Rudra. The fact of the matter was that this was completely dependent on the fight between the gods and Lucifer. If Hades or Omar fell in battle, it was going to be the end for the army of death and the battle in hell. Hades nodded and said, Naturally, I understand this better than you do, Pope. I have known the devil for a long time, and I know that sneaky BA asterisk 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 won't show up if he did not have the confidence to win. But I have waited over two millennium for this fight. And I would naturally not be showing up to the battlefield if I did not have confidence in defeating him. I could have done it alone. But with the Beast King with us, the chances are just much higher. Dot. Rudra closed his eyes and hoped that Hades' words held merit. This was a fight that was way beyond the league of the rest of the army. It was not something strategy or hidden cards could ever hope to conquer. Moving on, Rudra said, Phase 4. Support the gods in their battle. This is why I have called the commanders and the 30 of you specifically into this room. You are the people I want to disengage from your fights and come help the gods if the need arises. This phase is auxiliary in nature. And depending on your own battle situations you may or may not be able to respond to this. But in my opinion those gathered today in this war room are the strongest in the army of death and I hope that all of us here will be contributing to the demise of the devil. Dot. Rudra read the faces of everyone present and he could see the doubt and the anxiety on their faces. Rudra was asking for too much. However, it was what it was, and Rudra could not sugarcoat this one for them. Hence, at last, he presented the last and final phase of the battle. He said, Phase 5 starts when the devil dies, and it's a swift phase. The gods have to establish dominance. And all of those at tier 4 and higher, who are alive, and have the power to unleash one last grand move must do so to make a grand statement. That resistance now is futile. I'm sure Hades will be able to take his throne back without much issues but we still have to ensure the rebelling demons laid down their weapons. Phase 5 is the cleanup phase, and the one that will see this war concluded. Dot! Rudra laid down the five-step plan and made it crystal clear about what the troops had to focus on and why. He pointed out all the key indicators of the war and where failure was going to be extremely fatal. After a question-answer session to clear all doubts, Rudra concluded the war meeting as the orders were rallied for marching. The army marched in a total of three days' time to start the fight of their lives. Forward slash forward slash forward slash this chapter has been sponsored by Roll2010. Thank you for the patronage forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 849 The World Awaits. The Cuber Corporation. Sir this is getting out of hand. The Universal Queen is now preventing us from accessing data about our own citizens. We cannot check any files on River Raj put at all. Nothing from his basic weight and height to his in-game data. Even Gaia can't access his files. 
A Cuber official complained to the Cuber chief. Gaia, what's all this about? The Cuber chief called out Gaia, who seemed a little distraught about this phenomenon herself. Gaia said, responding to the chief, River Rajput's information is classified as grade yellow information now, and we don't have any access regarding his personal information irrespective of his past records or his personal identifiers. Dot. The Cuber chief frowned. Rudra was one of the most prized citizens of Earth and one of the most likely people to become the Earth's guardian and protector. Which is why not accessing his personal information was a bit shocking to the Cuber Corporation. What is the update on the war? The Cuber chief asked Gaia about the war in hell and her opinion on the fight. Gaia responded, There is a 54% winning probability in the favor of the Army of Death and a fair chance that Lucifer dies in the battle ending the Church of Darkness from the face of the planet. It would mean that Rudra would effectively become the leader of the planet, and he would choose between Hades and Bindigar to become Earth's patron gods. Dot. The Cuber chief smiled. A 54% probability was still a fair one, which was a far cry from the 4% probability of Rudra pulling this off before the war ever started. However, at this moment, a piece of disturbing news entered the sight of the Cuber chief as one of the employees, who was scrolling on the forums during work, showed him the picture of Rudra's new wings in game. Omega did not have a race change feature. Hence, it should be practically impossible for a human to grow natural wings, which is why he asked Gaia about this specific report. However, Gaia kept declining the information request saying that his clearance level was just too low. Meanwhile, on the forums, Oh my god, has anyone seen Rudra's new gray wings? It's a perfect compliment to his deep gray eyes and makes him look like an angel. Dot. I think Rudra is an angel for sure. Like Archangel Michael or someone. Sent by God to slay Lucifer. Dot. I think this photo is photoshopped. I don't think anyone can grow a pair of wings out of the blue. This is fake news you all are promoting. Dot. I wish I had wings. I could fly and do lots of cool stuff. Imagine flying over the cityscape of Omega with a pair of wings. Ugh surreal. Dot. If someone reveals to me how to get wings in Omega, I would pay three million dollars. Dot. Replying to Ian was her big brother you have three million dollars to spare? Why don't you spend it on something worthwhile? Let me show you a whole new world tonight. Dot. What do you guys think about the war in hell? Can Lucifer be defeated? Dot. It's Shakuni damn it. Nobody can ever defeat that madman that's for sure. Not even the devil. Dot. I don't think a god like Lucifer can be defeated or killed. Like aren't gods supposed to be immortal? Dot. Shakuni is the greatest player of all time. If someone still debates it. Let me ask you one thing which other player has constantly reinvented themselves over the years and managed to stay at the top regardless. Only Shikuni. Nobody else. Dot. The odds of the army of death winning to losing this war were placed at 2 colon 1. It was overwhelmingly in favor of the humans pulling off an unlikely victory. The dark faction players had started to panic about losing their patron god and an uncertain future and they were the ones who desperately wanted Rudra to fail. But nobody could do anything to change the odds now. The stage was set and no outside interference was possible anymore. When loose retreat, this was it, and the entire world was watching the Grand War with absolute focus. Meanwhile Rudra, Rudra took a look at his stat panel as he analyzed if he needed to shift any of his equipment. Player name, Shakuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title, Viscount of Hazel Groove Kingdom. Honorable Death Knight. Savior of Thal Village. Revered Medicine Master. Honorary Archbishop of the Church of Life. World Renowned. Heir of Augustus One Knight. Achiever. Dragon Slayer. King of the True Elite's Kingdom. First Cultivator. Supreme Overlord. Legendary Demon Slayer. Superior Human. Pope of the Church of Death. History Maker. Powerhouse. Explorer of Realms. Class. Death Knight Mythic. Subclass. Explosion Artist. Race Half Angel. Sexual Constitution Half Angel's Body. LVL. 720. Tier. 5. Stats. AGI, 84. 000, plus 84. 000. Vit, 172. 000. Int, 92. 000. STA, 101. 000. PHY, 84. 000. Mana, 117. 000, plus 58. 500. HP, 83. 818. 000 slash 83. 818. 000. Unassigned stat points 0. Hidden stats. Luck. 52 to 100. Charm. 99 slash 100. Infamy. 0 slash 100. 
Status, no abnormalities. Equipment, Lich's ring. Concealer mask. Sun God's bracelet, legendary. Death Knight's black shield. Pope's token. King's helmet, legendary. Divine beast armor, divine. Archangel Serial's boots, divine. Mana stone, ancient. Angel's winged armor. Weapons, Grim Reaper ancient. Excalibur, divine unique. A Eurocent skills, darkness bind. Summon Knight Durahel. Wind slash. Critical Absorb. Berserk. Darkness Blast. Death Slash. Eyes of God. Earthquake. Critical Block. Blink. Stormbringer. Swift Retreat. Illusiony Multi Sword. Suppression Art. Three Point Stab. Twin Blade Hurricane. Twin Blade Cross Slash. Claymore. Overheard Slash. Solar Restore. Solar Flare. Solar Blast. Solar Descent. Solar Beam. Shadow Doppelgangers. Knight's Courage. Holy Lance Divine. One Leg Leap, Rare. Cloud Feet. Circumvent. Dance of Death, Divine. Object Manipulation. Gravity Manipulation, Divine. Space Buster, Tier 5. Future Sight. Elite Blast, Self-Created. Simple Counter, Divine. Basic Mana Reinforcement, Legendary. Class Specific Skills. Death Knight Summoning. Death Emperor's S Aura Suppression. Black Ratio. Enhanced Full Counter. Death Legion. Knight of the Empire Complete. Time Dilation. Undead Ruler. Mount, Grey Wolf. Pet, Furball, Divine Nine Tails. Satisfied? He decided that no other changes were needed to his gear. Forward slash forward slash forward slash I only added the star panel in this chapter because many of you asked for it. Not because I wanted to fill the chapter out. If it seems out of place I'm sorry. But this is what some readers wanted to look at before the fight forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 850 Marching Orders. Three days later. The day of the march. Rudra was strapping his armor on alongside Karna, and the atmosphere between the two friends slash brothers was a little bit tense. So you are breaking the news today? Karna asked with a solemn voice. Rudra nodded as he said, It's time. Dot. Karna knew this day was coming. However, he wanted to delay it for as long as possible. But it seemed like Rudra had made up his mind, and today was going to be the very last time he would fight under Guildmaster Rudra in a war. Karna said, All right then. I'll go on ahead and assemble the guild members. You take your time and come out when you are ready. Dot. Rudra absent-mindedly strapped his serial's boots tightly as he thought about the speech he was about to make. Finally putting on his king's helmet with both the Excalibur and the Grim Reaper in the scabbards by his waist. Rudra walked out to meet the first legion aka his guild members for the customary pre-war speech. As Rudra walked out to the small stage that was made, he saw that all the elders were already present on the stage and Karna had began warming and pumping the crowd up. Hence when Rudra finally made an appearance the crowd erupted into deafening cheers and whistles as their beloved guild master finally took the stage. Karna looked at Rudra and gave him a firm nod as he left the center of the stage and dropped back with the elders as he gave Rudra space to talk. Rudra spread his wings in his arms as he took the center of the stage and with the voice amplification of the king's helmet on he said with passion, Elites, are you ready to slay the devil? Dot. Karna felt goosebumps arise on his skin when he heard Rudra's voice. There was some magic about how he carried himself. Some charm that was merged with his image and his very being that could rile the guild up with the smallest of sentences. Naturally, the guild responded electrically to their guild master's question as they cheered and said, Yes! Dot. Rudra raised his head and assessed the crowd. This was a battle-hardened unit the best in the world, and having gone through the thick and thin of lots of battles, it was the most composed and confident unit in the army of death. Rudra said, I, once this war is over, our elite legion will be called God Slayers. Dot. Rudra painted the picture of the ultimate glory. The title of being God Slayers. When I started this guild, we had only 200 members. Only 200 yet we brought one of the powerhouses of Purple Haze City. The Orange Rock Guild to its knees. So what did they do next? They ran to their alliance. A group of seven first rank guilds who wanted to dominate Purple Haze City. But we did what? The elites destroyed the alliance and became masters of Purple Haze City. But not just Purple Haze City. We also took over the entire Night Cloud's kingdom and made it the true elite's kingdom. Now the entire world fears the elite name. Not one, I repeat not even a single one, is a stronger faction than our guild in the Mital Realm. Not one. But your guild master is crazy and conquering one realm is not enough. So he marched his army into hell and now he wants to slay the devil himself. So who is with him? Dot. Rivera's question was met with a deafening roar 
that was so loud that even the earth started to rumble. Everyone shouted that they were with him, and the atmosphere in the camp reached a boiling point. Under my leadership, we have not lost a single war yet. I saw a news interview of our guild member once, and he was asked a very interesting question once. He was asked, what is an elite? And he replied, and I quote, elite is an individual who is undefeated, indomitable and immortal dot. So I say the elites is a guild of undefeated champions, indomitable guild members, and immortal fighting spirit. But my tenure as the leader of this group of miraculous men is now coming to its end. This is it, boys. My last war with you all as your guild master. Dot. Silence. Pin drop silence. Nod body could believe what they were hearing right now. What did the guild master mean? This was his last war with them. Is he leaving the guild? He can't do that, can he? Even the elders looked confused as they looked towards each other. This was the first time they were hearing of this decision by Rudra. Rudra continued. After this war, I will resign as the guild master of the true elites guild and vice guild master Karna will step up as the guild master. Don't worry, guys. I'm not leaving the guild, but I won't be the guild master either. Dot. Sadness. Confusion and anger were rising in the hearts of the guild members. They did not want their beloved guild master who they worshipped as a god to step down. Rudra, however, took advantage of this very atmosphere as he said, I had a dream when I started this guild. To make it the best in the world and I have achieved it. You all have made me the strongest guild master in this world and in return I have given my all to this guild. And for all of you. Dot. Rudra paused for a long time and enjoyed the silence as he ended his speech by saying, if you guys truly think I have done a good job in my tenure for 10 years as your guild master, then I ask this one last thing from you. Today when we march into battle, show me why we are the strongest guild in the world. Show me why we are undefeatable. Show me why we have never lost a single war together. Show me the strength that this miracle guild has. The bond between every elite and the indomitable spirit that can even slay gods. It's one last dance, boys. Let me retire with honor and with the privilege to witness this guild in its prime glory. On three. Together one last time. One, two point three. One for all. All for one. Go elites go. Dot. Rudra spoke as the entire crowd screamed at the top of their lungs. Some men were crying. Some men were suppressing their tears. However, through all the men, there was one burning passion which was common, and that was the will to show the guild master the prime war fighting of this miracle guild one last time. A performance that will terrorize the demon race for a millennium to come. And will immortalize the elite name.